You're not a quiet crowd. I'm not used to that. Hi, Michal. Shia Batzlacha. Good luck today. Looking forward. Hi, Michal. Rocheli Avramzon. Shalom lechulam. Thank you. Batzlacha. Good luck to all of us. Thank you. Hi, Rocheli. Hi, Val. Hello, team from Scotland. It's Gavin Neat here in Scotland. It's great. Oh, Gavin. Being here. I love you people. You people are awesome. I yeah, so and happy Klaus, to be here. Klaus is from Tel Aviv, as we see from his background. Yeah. Hi, Shalom. Hi, Michal. Hi, Yuval. How are you? Hi to the others. Emmanuel from Rwanda. From Rwanda. Hi, Emmanuel. Hope all is well. And Anna Garcia is, Gracia is here. Great to have yeah. you on board. Thank you. Amazing. Hello from New Jersey. Hello from Kosovo. From Kosovo, New Jersey. Now I see Gavin on the uh, on board. Great, great. <laughs> Sounds like Eurovision. Ah, totally. This is the idea. And I must tell everybody who's, who's on, Klaus is the one to thank for having this format. Last time we couldn't have it. And he said, what is this? We have to have it like this. So this is totally, I feel a Eurovision contest. I see the chats, it's amazing. Brussels, Armenia, Kosovo, Chile, Brazil. We have a lot from Brazil, Philippines, London, Washington DC, Canada. Amazing, amazing, amazing guys. So is Klaus going to sing? Is Klaus, no, he's the entertainment <laughs> for the end. And if not, okay. Ricardo, we will join them. Ricardo, you're up for also. You, 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 you don't want to hear me sing. <laughs> <laughs> the girls from Thailand. Amazing. Last, last time you came with wine. <laughs> I'm in the office. No wine in the office. <laughs> Only coffee. Mm -hmm. um, uh, did Namibia uh, log on? Perfect. And sign language interpreters. If you are the sign language interpreters, we can't really recognize your uh, name. So if you can just speak and we'll be able to pin you and know that you are here. Uh, I'll appreciate that. And we are going to start in one more minute. And let us go in for Alert, Rob. Yossi Tzuria, shalom lecha. Shalom, Yuval. Robin Stink. Well, Prota Soka from Tanzania. Oh, amazing. Yeah. Hello, everyone. It's Robin here from Edinburgh in Scotland. It's good to be here. Hi, Sean. Hi, Robin. You're not the first one from Scotland, but, but uh, ha happy to have you. <laughs> good to be here. Hello, everyone. Odi from Thailand. Mm -hmm. Hello from Ukraine! Yay! Ukraine, welcome! Good morning, Hello. Lisa Hello, from the United States. Uh, Lisa, hi! Hold on a second. Lisa, hi! Um, uh, the, the guys from uh, the interpreters, are, uh, we can't recognize them. If you can just ask them to wave or something and then we can start. Mm -hmm. I'm going to uh, call them and, and uh, see where they are. Thank you very much. You're welcome. <laughs> this is Richard Streitz. Hello from Richmond, Virginia. Hello. Hi, Richard. <laughs> Ricardo from Madrid. Hi, T. Hey, Ricardo. Hey, Ricardo. Hey. Ricardo. Hey. Friends here. It's great to see a lot of familiar faces and names here. It's wonderful. <laughs> but you know what's even greater? A lot of new ones. We have so many registered and so many joining in. Uh, so it doesn't take mm -hmm. one, uh, one push of a button and everybody's in. So it takes a couple of more minutes. But we are going to begin as soon as I have the sign language interpreter uh, on board. Oh dear, I hope uh, Richard, the beach. Richard Fendrick is one of our sign language interpreters, Michal. And, he's and on. you may have, he should be on. Okay, Richard Sanders. Richard, if you're on, he's calling me now. Perfect. I got to go into me. Salian. 
Good to have you. Perfect. Okay, this is the, the Facebook Live is the beginning. It's yep. already on. Perfect. So, hello to everybody um, both here in the Zoom room and uh, on Facebook Live. We are very, very, very happy to have you here with us. Um, are we on? We can uh, begin. We have the sign language on. Uh, we have you located it. I guess that's one of the challenges of having 500 registered, more than 500 registered. Oh, I love it. Yeah, yeah, we have, uh, as of about 45 minutes ago, we had more than 550. <laughs> yeah, yeah, totally amazing, guys. Yeah, I get it. Hands up for you guys. Okay. I just want to know that we have sign language to start with. Uh... Okay, Richard, sign language, if you're here, please talk. Or message in the chat so we can see you. I just messaged you, Michal. Okay, great. Thank you. Perfect. Lisa, I see. Justin Seal has joined the meeting. Okay. Great. So uh, we will begin and there is a closed captioning and we will add on um, uh, uh, the sign language interpreter uh, ASAP. Uh, but I do want to uh, start. So uh, guys, good morning. Is everybody on mute? Great. So good morning to you all. Good afternoon and good evening. Isn't it amazing that all these greetings are relevant to some part of the 500 participants in our Access Israel's fourth international webinar? And I'm not even counting those that are in uh, Facebook Live. Uh, and my apologies if you will not be able to join the Zoom room because there is a limit for 500 people. Uh, we are very excited to host our fourth webinar in this case, guys, size does matter. And we are so proud that hundreds of people, professionals, experts, policymakers, educators from all over the world took the time to join us today. Size does matter because of the importance we see in the subject of inclusive education. You know, Whitney Houston saying, I believe that children are our future. We are true believers in that. And for, for us, it was crucial to make sure that inclusive education applies also to remote learning, which in these crazy Corona days has become relevant all over the world. We therefore extended our webinar for uh, five and a half hours to make sure you don't only get headlines or short presentations, but rather you will hear from 23 amazing, inspiring professional speakers from all over the world. Size does matter, and the size of the list of countries represented here, 72 countries, this definitely sends a great message out. We are all in this together, and only by sharing, consulting, spreading the word, successful solutions, we will make it easier to overcome, to reach our goal of leaving no one behind, and here too, size does matter, and we should keep in mind the borderless statistics of the larger in the world. It is great to see our global ecosystem of accessibility and inclusion experts grow from webinar to webinar. And now, uh, if you are new to the group, welcome aboard and go ahead and use us. Ask, share, learn, teach, help us make a global statement. One plus one in our case is a perfect 10. To increase the global sharing of knowledge, we created our global accessibility uh, website where you can all publish successful initiatives and practices relating to uh, during and post COVID-19 uh, times and uh, share it in the network. As I'm speaking, you will receive in the chat a link to this website. I urge you to copy the link, sign in and start being part of the ripple effect. You can also ask questions there, participate in discussions on the website. It's a great tool to continue sharing even after the webinar finishes. 
The first time we held such a webinar at the beginning of COVID-19 crisis, uh, we didn't think that almost six months later, we will meet in this format again, and that the pandemic will still be far from over. But unfortunately, it seems that we're going to have to deal with this issue for quite a while now. And the idea is not to just sit, but really continue and do stuff. One of the first things that countries around the world did when the pandemic began was to close schools, which had a strong effect on students everywhere, but especially students with disabilities. Schools had to adjust and began teaching classes remotely. They didn't necessarily take into account uh, added challenges for students with disabilities, nor were they aware of solutions that are already out there. This is why we decided to focus this webinar on accessible and inclusive remote learning for students with disabilities during and post COVID-19. Now, a little technical information. First of all, closed captioning is provided here uh, by Verbit, and you can uh, uh, address it and get it uh, by pressing the CC button on the bottom of your screen, of the Zoom screen. Um, uh, if anybody has any problem, just write in the chat and we will assist you. Sign language interpretation is provided by language people. We're really thankful for that. And um, in order to see the interpreters, you need to pin uh, uh, the, the interpreters. The names are Pam and Richard. And I suggest, Sean, that uh, they will um, write uh, in the chat and that way people will see whoever needs it. And if you need the sign language and you can't find it, please contact Sean. Uh, Sharon Kessler, she will assist you in, any, uh, uh, in anything during this uh, um, uh, webinar. The webinar, as I said, is recorded and is on Facebook Live. Uh, so in case you want to share it and ask and urge other people to join us and there's no room anymore, well, they can do so on the Facebook. Now, before we start, I want to begin with what we usually end with, and that is thanks. Uh, and you will bear with me because uh, uh, creating a five and a half hour of content with really the top notch speakers uh, is not really something easy and we couldn't have done it without amazing support of partners and friends and amazing staff. So I would like to uh, thank our partners. Um, to mention you, Zero Project, I have to begin with you guys. You are the guys who taught me personally to dream internationally and leverage on great friendships to make this world a more inclusive one. Our amazing friends at Google who are sponsoring our webinar, but also assisting, advising, and inspiring in so many ways. Our dear friends at Valuable 500. Caroline couldn't make it today, but she, I'm sure she's gonna watch the video. Uh, and uh, Caroline, we are continuing doing the work, so you are here with us. Microsoft, ONSIT, IAAP, Phaser, Friends of Access Israel, New, uh, USA, Enable, G3 ICT, Austrian Association Supporting the Blind and Visually Impaired, Christopher Reeve Foundation, Commissioner's Office for People with Disabilities in New York City. Victor, I could not not mention you and much, many, many more. Thank you to our newest friend and sponsor, AbleDocs, who are already a perfect fit to fulfilling a, our collaborative goal. And our additional sponsors, Language People, A to Z from Israel, Hadesk from Israel, and of course, the American Embassy in Israel, who are supporting us for many years on uh, this international activity. Finally, and it's very important for me again to thank at this point, I want to thank you, Deborah Rue, uh, who really went out of uh, her way to assist you, our true partner to today's webinar. And this success is definitely yours. We appreciate your help. And finally, finally, Yuval Wagner, the man who got me drafted to all this, uh, uh, these things and my amazing staff, Sharon, Michal, Boaz, and everybody else here who helped in the efforts. That's it. Opening has uh, uh, concluded. And again, there are people who ask, do we have to stay the whole five and a half hours? You can go in, go out. The only thing is you have to remember because there were overbooking of people who registered, if you leave the Zoom, 
I cannot promise you can come back in because it's a limit uh, capacity of 500. So you can, you might want to keep your uh, Zoom on. Um, and again, thank you very, very much for everybody for joining us. And thank you, Klaus, for insisting on this format of meetings and not uh, a regular panel, because uh, this makes it everything uh, so much uh, better. Um, I will like to invite the American Embassy in Israel, as I said, has supported us for years and we are really appreciative and thankful for them. And uh, we are proud of a very nice lineup of uh, American speakers. Uh, I would like to invite Alison Brown, the Deputy Cultural Attaché at the US Embassy in Jerusalem to give a few introduction words. Alison is responsible for public diplomacy programs and they, as I said, support us for years. Alison, please. Thank you, Michal. And good afternoon, friends and colleagues. My name is Alison Brown, Deputy Cultural Attaché at the US Embassy in Israel. It is my pleasure and honor to join Michal in opening this webinar. The Embassy has had a long and fruitful relationship with Access Israel, which is one of the most influential organizations in Israel that promotes accessibility and disability rights for all. The Embassy has been partnering with Access Israel for years in organizing their international convention, bringing prominent US speakers and sending Access Israel staff on an exchange program to the United States, thereby exposing local and international audiences to the extensive American experience in this field. This year was supposed to be no different. In fact, for us, it was supposed to be more significant than ever because in the United States, we are celebrating the 30th anniversary of the ADA the Americans with Disabilities Act, the historic law that changed the way our country treats people with disabilities. The ADA provided them with a legal guarantee of equal rights and opportunities, integrating them into the American workplace and workforce and into the public sphere. This law did not only change the situation in the United States, it has changed the way people look at these issues in many countries around the world, including in Israel. Unfortunately, the COVID-19 crisis changed everything. But after the initial shock, I think we all understand that however difficult and profound this crisis may be for all of us all over the world, it also provides new perspectives on our lives and on our shared future. So we were very happy to hear that our partners at Access Israel have not given up quite the opposite. Within the virtual format, they have actually been able to recruit more amazing speakers and a larger international audience therefore increasing the impact of this day of sharing knowledge and expertise and looking for creative solutions for the issues people with disabilities face. The topic of this webinar is particularly important and timely, as Michal said, because the beginning of the school year is challenging for every child and parent, more so during the pandemic and even more so for people with disabilities. Finding creative solutions in the short run and developing a strategy for the long run is crucial for this new world of digital education, both during and after we come out of this pandemic. Therefore, I would like to congratulate our partners at Access Israel, as well as the nine American speakers joining us today, and all of the international experts and viewers who are also joining this webinar. Thank you for caring deeply about this topic, for thinking creatively and strategically about ways to move forward. The US Embassy, as always, is proud to be a sponsor of this important event. And I wish you all a meaningful session today, which will create a real impact on your communities and open doors of opportunity for all. Great, thank you very much, Allison. And uh, this is, uh, we still have three more or four more till the end of the year. So again, thank you very much for your ongoing uh, support. Uh, now to our first uh, panel, uh, the first part of the webinar. Um, is going to have uh, representatives from ministries of education from around the world. And I'll introduce everybody. And then, uh, Michael, you will uh, uh, take the first uh, question. Um, Michael Fembeck will co-moderate uh, with me. Uh, he is the amazing uh, Zero Project director and a true friend and partner to this amazing journey. Uh, Racheli Abramson, the Special Needs Education Division Manager in the Israeli Ministry of Education. Uh, and uh, I must say that from the minute we raised this issue to the Ministry of Education, they have been committed to do whatever it takes to do it right. Uh, Christina Foti uh, serves as the Deputy Chief Academic Officer overseeing the Division of Specialized Instructions and Student Support 
at the New York City Department of Education and reaches over 300,000 preschool and school age students and their families in various schools within the district through her work. Regina Kusiku uh, is an inclusive education specialist and a senior education officer for inclusion edu inclusive education in Namibia and works specifically with students with intellectual impairment. She trains teachers and other stakeholders on identifying learning disabilities and ways on how children with intellectual impairments could be supported. Rupert Kuraza uh, is the head of Department for Inclusion and Diversity in Vienna Board of Education. Alongside him, we have Dr. Marie, and Marie, I'm going to try, Gitschlaher, uh, and I really apologize uh, for not uh, pronouncing it uh, right. Uh, she is a diversity manager and educational researcher uh, at the Specialist Department for Inclusion Board of Education for Vienna. And we have Andrea Rieger, who is the head teacher of the inclusive Caritas Shul Am Himmel. They did an amazing pro project, which I'm sure we'll be very happy to hear. Michael, please. Yeah, um, uh, thanks Michael for um, giving me this opportunity to, uh, to co-host this uh, first panel. Um, let me start with saying a few words, how grateful we are and how proud we are to be a partner of, of Access Israel, proud that we can support mainly by sharing the call for this nomina, but also bringing in inspiring innovators and change makers to this community and to this webinar. And I see a, a, a long list of familiar names uh, that are uh, long-standing partners of the Zero Project. That is what we basically do with the Zero Project, which we need partners like you. We work towards a world without barriers, and we do that mainly by promoting innovations, promoting innovators, change makers, and that we achieve mainly by telling their story to and connect them with people who are willing to learn, listen, connect and contribute to themselves and create a self-sustaining and ever-growing worldwide community who want to be part of that. That is the vision that we share just to, to name that and that's why I'm so, so grateful uh, and proud that we can do this together. Um, but uh, now let's, uh, uh, after this intro, and um, uh, let, let me start. Uh, by, by asking I'm a just, first uh, question. Just stopping one thing, Pam, the sign language interpreter is um, uh, logging in right uh, uh, in the next minute or so. So whoever needs sign language, you see it in the ca closed captioning, whoever needs sign language, please look for Pam and pin her. Thank you. Okay, so um, my first, first question and my first uh, talking point would be um, to get everyone a kind of sense of what we're talking about, getting some facts and, and numbers um, of, of the models that we are going to, uh, to have a closer look at, of how many people are, are we talking here, of how many schools, how is the special school system working, is it still a special school, school system, and how many schools are integrated, um, how are they connected technologi technologically. This, this would be the questions that, um, that I would like to to start with, I hope this is in line with uh, what you uh, what you uh, have in mind, Michael. How to get this started? No? Totally. So we're going to start with uh, uh, Rachel. One second. Yes, I'm here. Let's begin. Hi, hi to you all. Thank you. I have to admit that I'm very excited and honored to attend such an important webinar today. And thank you, Michal and Yuval, for inviting me. Um, so I start at my beginning. I would like to present a brief, a short brief of uh, our special education system in Israel uh, by giving you some uh, data. First of all, the special education, education services in Israel are provided to students from three years old till 21 years old. And we have in our a, a, a educational system approximately 2,200,000 students that are learning in our a, um, education system, but 209,000 students are learning in the, in the uh, special education 
a system. And if I, I can say that uh, they are approximately 12% of the, all the students in Israel. 53,800 are students are studying in the kindergartens, special kindergartens and special educational school. It's about 18% uh, of the uh, special education students. And we're talking about 170,000 integrated in standard regular classes and schools from the kindergarten and a, a, our a, a primary schools and high schools. 67,500 students are in special a, a, in special education classes. They are learning in standard and regular a, schools, but they have their own classes and they are integrating in a, our a, a educational system. So if you have another a, details that you want to hear, I will be glad to inform you. But I think that a, a, from from now, I'm moving to the other question. Uh, one I second. Hope. Let's uh, let's uh, continue with other. Uh, um, okay. Uh, okay. Um, um, Christina. Hello there, Christina from New York. Hi, everybody. Thank you for having us, and we're so happy to be here today. We work in close partnership with Commissioner Felice for the Office of People with Disabilities that you mentioned before, Michal. So this is a, this is our. Uh, he is our introduction to you all, and we are very grateful. Um, New the New York City Department of Education is uh, the largest school system in the United States. We serve 1.1 million students in over 1,800 schools and over 300,000 students with disabilities. Of those 300,000, about 25,000 of them are um, in what we call District 75, which is the district serving our highest need students across the that's a, a brief overview and, and in my role yeah thank you perfect um, and now uh, Regina are you uh, here with us unmute yourself yeah yes I can hear you hello there we can't see you can you put video or okay here you are how are you I'm good, and how are you? Can you hear me clearly? Yes, we hear you perfectly, and we'd love to hear your response to Michael's question. Some data, just so we'll understand what we're talking about. Um, in Namibia, I'm Regina Osiku from Namibia. In Namibia, uh, we are a population of 2 million people, so we are not that many, uh, which means uh, the, going, the learners that goes to school, we have about 8,000, 800 and something, 50,000. And then we have, among that number, we have about 300, not 300, but 3,000 learners with disability that goes to school, of which we have special schools, which are only 11 fully fledged special schools. And then we have special units, which are about 67 in, uh, in, in Namibia. So in our special schools, we have, uh, like I mentioned, we only have about 300, uh, 3,000 learners in the, in, the, in the schools. So we, like I mentioned, we are just a small population, so you can't expect big numbers. Yeah. Perfect. And uh, now, uh, Rupert, some uh, numbers from Austria. Yeah, hello, uh, everybody. My name is Mara Gitschdaler. Um, thank you for the invitation. We are really happy to be here. Uh, Rupert Corazza had an incident because uh, today is the second day of school start in Austria and a lot of things are going on and um, I will speak in, in behalf of him. And uh, yes, I will give my best. Um, I prepared some data. So in total, we have 1.1 uh, million students in Austria of which 3,000 uh, have special educational needs. Uh, that's a rate of about uh, 3%. Um, and um, we managed in the last years to um, 
have integrative classes for about 50% uh, of students with special educational needs. And uh, the other 50% are still uh, at special schools. But uh, I have to say that students nowadays who attend special schools in Austria are students who have uh, severe impairments. And for these students, uh, Austria still has not found uh, the solutions, but but uh, there are also schools. And next to me, I'm very happy to um, introduce Andrea Riga. She's the headmaster of the school, uh, we, we would say in English, at the sky or in the heaven. In German, is uh, the Schule am Himmel. And uh, she and her team uh, they did a wonderful job how to um, uh, make inclusive education for all students with yes, impairments. And we, will, and we will hear Andrea uh, soon. Thank you very much. Um, uh, so, so what we see here is different countries, different sizes, different statistics. Many of the statistics is also a matter of uh, a definition. Who do you define or you do, who do you include in that? But let's face it, as I said before, we are talking about a global um, uh, issue that is relevant to everybody. Doesn't matter where you're from, which time zone, which uh, um, uh, hour of day, the day it is now, we are dealing with this. Um, and uh, uh, to our next question, we would like to hear now from you um, uh, about your reaction, your response to uh, the lockdown situation. I please want, I know a lot of amazing things have been done, but I, I do want to focus you um, uh, now only on uh, really remote studying. What has been done in remote studying? Because we know everybody had to uh, uh, do it in one way or another. How is that uh, resolved in your uh, countries? Um, uh, and of course, any other information about other amazing things you did, we will be able to share in the website. Uh, Racheli, we'll start with you, please. You have to unmute yourself, Racheli. Excuse me. Thank you, Michal. I have to admit that uh, at the beginning, it was very complex because we were facing dynamic and unexpected um, um, a reality that we didn't meet and we didn't know before. Uh, I can say that the state of Israel deals with security emergencies, but dealing with such an epidemic was something different and it was very challenging. Therefore, we have decided to adopt for our students four number of principles that was very, very, very uh, important for us. One was maintaining the educational continuum for all our students and to take care also for our students who are sick at home and the, our students who are at the hospitals that are staying in hospitals uh, uh, in, uh, during the year. Uh, the other principle, the second principle was to keep as we can, the special education institution open every day and to hold face-to-face -face meeting with our students as we can also but uh, to maintain it, it was uh, to maintain the familiar study routine that they are uh, uh, in, uh, in usual. The third uh, principle was at the time when it was not possible and we couldn't uh, receive our students at school, we tried to find other solutions and create some other answers, unique answers, but I'll talk and I'll speak and I'll tell you uh, uh, after it. And uh, the, the fourth uh, principle was to ongoing contact with our, uh, of the educational staff, with all the students and their parents, uh, with our psychologist services staff and opening a line to answering um, to answer all the questions and all the um, uh, things that the children and their uh, parents had to uh, know or ask for. So this was the, the four uh, 
uh, principles that we um, kept all over and all the time. And if I can say that uh, if I want to uh, get to the apply level, so we have a teacher training, advanced training in remote teaching systems, such as using the Zoom and the Google uh, classrooms. We have also collaborations all the way with our various uh, age divisions tutorial for the teacher and the integrate students who was integrate in, a, in the a special education services and a, to know how to deal with the distance learning and teaching methods that weren't before. A, so this was for, the, a, for our a, teachers. Uh, then, I'm sorry that I'm so excited, okay? So, uh, the other things was tutorials for students, individual and groups also by professional knowledge organization that uh, accompanies all the, the teams and the students. We also adapt the individual program to each student and thinking about ways how we can communicate them during learning from e-learning or learning from a, a home. So we adapt daily professional staff learning and therapy online and face-to-face -face session with our student. We had also learning materials kits to those who can't reach uh, the, uh, the internet or they don't have the uh, equipment in, at home. Daily professional staff online and uh, academic emotional support, support for every children and every uh, student. Teachers e-learning on, and on learning online uh, application like Zoom and training, teachers, materials and methods in the uh, universe uh, designing by using the UDLs programs, and uh, a teacher virtual and physical teaching environment adopt, adoptions and accessions. I can say that we also tried and permit the teachers and our uh, uh, therapists to go to the, to the houses and reach at home to improve and provide home services also to those who couldn't come to a school or to meet with their uh, uh, teachers. Okay, great. Uh, you're already answering this, the next questions, which is great. Okay, but okay. Thank you for that uh, overview. And, and I think that what is important to, to remember here, um, uh, it is, you know, as, as we see, and we will see in, in the next speakers, uh, there are things done. There are a lot of, uh, a lot of thought is done because it was a shift between frontal, regular face-to-face -face teaching and um, uh, remote teaching, which is a whole new ball game for teachers in general. But here we have to take really into account also the special needs and the p kids with disabilities and focus on that. Um, uh, I would like uh, 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 to invite um, uh, Regina, if you can please share with us, and again, focus not on the teacher training, but on um, um, what you did for kids, how you made uh, the adaptation uh, uh, for the COVID-19 uh, era. Thank you. Great. All right, thank you. Um, just it was, like it was mentioned by the previous speaker, uh, the pandemic caught us offside, not knowing what to do, because we were not prepared. We didn't know this is how things are going to be. We'll have a lockdown and all that. But then I am based at, I work at the national office, national education office. And then Namibia, the way our education system works is that we have um, region, regions. They are divided into 14, like provinces, but then we call them regions. So each region has a regional office that manages the schools in, the, in that specific area. So what we did is 
the national office had to carry out a survey to find out where the learners were, to find out which learners would be able to access technology, who had access to, 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 to technical services or, or technology. Then at the end of the day, when we carried out that study, we realized that most of the kids could not access um, could not access the internet because they were in the remote. Mostly, most of the children are staying in the remote areas. So the first step, what we did was to to, de to design a, a prevention and management COVID uh, guideline, which was distributed to all the regions, and it was translated in Braille for the learners with visual impairment. And then also it was broadcasted all the time. It's, we speak about it, and then whatever communication that we do, sign language is also catered for. So we found out that when we did a study, we realized that most of our learners, they had access to radio platform. So we have the community, the, the Ministry of Education have to license with the one institution of open learning in order for them to recruit teachers that had to do with the recordings for the lessons in order to broadcast these lessons for learners who had uh, who could have access to the radio platform. And then there, were also, there was also a channel where they can broadcast uh, the, the lessons which were recorded for just 15 to 20 minutes. Okay, and then uh, what we did also is for learners that could not access other platforms, the teachers had to design worksheets or so like booklets in order for them, for the parents, it was strictly that parents had to pick them up at the school. So they, they, did, they developed those booklets and then those booklets are picked by the, the, the parents at the school. When they are done, they had to bring it uh, back in order for the teachers to look at it and all that. But it was not quite easy in order for you to monitor the progress of the learners because some of the kids will not give the, 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 the scripts back. So which was also quite challenging. So lessons, like I mentioned, lessons were recorded booklets were distributed to the learners and then some of the booklets were even put in the we put them in the national um, uh, newspaper for some of the kids to access and also uh, the the creating of awareness on COVID it was very important as well to, to simplify it in a way that even children with intellectual impairment have access to information in order for them to have that information so for some um, um, uh, WhatsApp platforms were also utilized for teachers in order for them to share ideas on how they go about developing these materials. So it was a, actually a good thing that teachers could collaborate and work together in order for them to share information on what they should put in the booklet and all that. And then um, well, some no, of them... Thank you. It, amazing. Uh, amazing. Uh, yes. Okay. <laughs> you, you have anything else to add on that because it was fascinating? Oh, I, so I, like, like I've mentioned, mostly it's just working on the worksheets. Worksheets have to be couriered for those learners that cannot uh, access, have access to come to the school because some of the area, the lockdown found them in areas, some, some areas like at the farm and it was very far from the school. Yeah. So at the end of the day, you have to courier it and all that. So some of the school were impressed with one of the school because we have a feeding program for primary schools and some special schools. We have a feeding program when the schools are in, in school. So some of the schools, when they send those booklets with Korea, they put in a snack in order for them, because it's not about just educating children, but they also need to be fed because these children are also disadvantaged in a way. They don't have three times, uh, three, they don't have a meal three times a day. So at least when they're at school, they have that meal, they have two times, they can eat two times, but when they're at home, we're even worried either these kids are eating or not. So some of the schools took that initiative to send a snack in order for them to at least, you know, to make their children happy and at least they can get something to eat for that specific week, which is really very amazing. Amazing. Regina, yeah. thank you very much. First of all, when we spoke our, uh, before uh, this webinar, I told you this fascinated me, uh, especially the, the, the thought of not only the education, but also the holistic, the, the snack, the, the, the giving the, the kids the, the information. And you presented here both uh, using uh, um, uh, technologies, but also low tech when we don't have technologies and we don't have access to technologies. And that was fascinating. Thank you very much. Uh, Christina, how about you? What, what happened in your neck of the world? 
So in, in our neck of the world, um, when we launched remote learning back in March, we asked every school to take an inventory of devices that they would be able to deploy to teachers and students. And for many, this was great, but given the scale of, of New York City, uh, there were still many students that not only needed a device, but also needed internet connectivity. And for that reason, we partnered uh, with Apple and one of the internet providers to deploy over 300,000 iPads with data plans built in. And as part of the distribution plan, um, we, uh, sorry, I'm just having a technical difficulty here. As part of the dis distribution plan, any student that needed an internet enabled device could apply and we prioritize our students in temporary housing um, as such as shelters, um, as well as students with disabilities across the board. We also partnered with our local internet companies to um, ask that they provide free internet for a few months while we launched remote learning, and that was an incredible help to so many of our students and families. Thank you very much, amazing. And um, uh, our Austrian delegation, um, uh, please, uh, Dr. Marie, are you going to present it or? Yes, yes. Um, it was really interesting uh, what has been said uh, so far and um, what Austria did. We didn't have a problem in Austria with the, the internet connection of the families, but we had a lot of families who couldn't afford a, a notebook or a tablet or something like that. And our Ministry of Education provided for these children uh, a lot, as a lot of, of notebooks. Andrea, you told me the, the sum which was spent, the money for notebooks. Yeah, it was approximately 12 million euro uh, in a very very short time yes so mm. um, that was good Impressive. Impressive. and um, uh, I think we um, went through all our countries Michael please take it from here mm. yes thank you so I would like to follow up on, on what has currently been said already um, uh, being a former journalist, I'm quite good in asking uh, simple questions that are required tough answers, so um, be prepared. Um, so um, I think what, what this uh, would be really interesting if you share uh, with us uh, some of your learnings uh, with especially how you supported schools and how you supported teachers. Uh, something had already been mentioned by, by Regina, so she mentioned the the guidelines that have been distributed and, and the broadcast of, of lessons and booklets and also an IT platform where teachers share the experiences. So that, that that's really great. And, and I think that this is uh, what uh, I would like to uh, to ask the, uh, the other um, panelists uh, more, about the, more about. And I would like to, uh, to start uh, with, with Christina. You're serving, uh, as far as I know, some, some, you mentioned 1 million students and 800 schools. So what what has been done to support schools and teachers, and what were your learnings that you would like to share uh, with us? Sure. Um, so, yes, it's been a scale of, of New York is saying is just, uh, part of um, certainly part of the, the challenge. Um, but I'm really proud to say that almost overnight, our team mobilized to ensure that students with disabilities would continue to receive their services to the greatest extent possible. And in a matter of days, we provided resources for teachers and families to prepare for remote learning. Uh, we launched teletherapy services so that students could receive their occupational therapy, their speech therapy, their physical therapy even um, at home um, and, and do so with their same provider. You know, so much has changed for our students during COVID. And one of the things that we felt really strongly about was keeping continuity of um, the providers and teachers that children know and feel connected to, um, keeping that continuity during remote learning. And so we were very happy when we were able to get teletherapy up and running so that students can log on and see the faces of, of those teachers and, and related service providers that they feel so connected to, and that, quite frankly, who know them well. Um, we updated our, our special education student information system to support the uh, critical work. One of the things that we felt incredibly strongly about was making sure that we knew what services students were receiving throughout the pandemic. And um, that, again, that those services uh, 
continued with fidelity and continuity throughout. Um, and then we, we doubled down on our family empowerment and communication um, to make sure that families were going to be well supported with learn at home resources. And we built in time during teachers at, for teachers and related service providers to simply check in with each family to call them and to say or, or to do a video conference and say how are things going what is working well what is not working what can we change and how can we support you um, knowing how difficult this time has been on everyone we thought that that was a critical part of um, remote learning and uh, of learning this 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 new way Michael, you're on mute. One, more, one brief question in, in addition. Would you say uh, that it was more on a kind of uh, mandatory base that creates minimum standards for each school and each teacher? Or was this more a kind of optional base that you offered opportunities to schools and teachers? Was it possible sure. to create some minimum standards or was it more that each school tried as hard as they could? Yeah, that's a great question. So, I, I mean, I think that that's a two part question because, because the First part is, are there expectations across the board for teaching and learning? Um, and I think the second part is really, then what does it look for, like for situation with those expectations? And um, our expectations you have- What you said because the connection is for some reason not so clear. Oh, I'm sorry, Michal, is this better? Okay, so I, I heard that question as a two part question. And the first being, what are the general expectations for teaching and learning? And then what are the, the expectations for disabilities? Um, and the truth of the matter is that our expectations on uh, remote learning have increased during every phase of this. So during March, June, school year, um, the requirements for teaching and learning, uh, we, we realized that we needed more uh, basic minimum requirements for live instruction. Um, that's across the board. Uh, and, and the requirements for special education during that time were number one, that every child receive a remote learning plan that outlined the services and programs that we're going to receive from remote learning. And number two, that um, when services were delivered, that they were delivered in a way that was going to work for the Family and family. And so for kindergartners learning at home who might have otherwise received each times a week, for example, we've heard from parents across the city saying, it's going to work to have my child down in front of the computer five for three times a week um, for 30 minute sessions. So I want to modify that. And that's something that the remote learning plan would modify. And so across the board, we ask that schools you know, create a plan that works for every child, document that plan and ensure receipt of services. As we are now going into uh, our school year, we have increased the amount overall of expect ex expected time that students spend in remote learning and receiving live instruction. Um, and our requirements on the special education end remain the same. We want to document what everybody, what the plan is. We want to check in with the family and make sure that that plan is working for them, adjust when it's not working, and um, certainly uh, keep track of services received so that we're able to um, minimize any potential learning loss gaps. I hope that answers your question, Michael. Yeah, thanks a lot, Christina. Uh, Michal, may, may I ask as a final uh... Uh, question that round uh, the same questions to uh, to Maria and Andrea for from uh, the colleagues from Austria what yes. they did to support uh, schools and teachers what was more on a mandatory base and what was more on a on a you can use that base absolutely you're on mute mm -hmm. okay uh, what did we do in in Austria first we provided extensive uh, support uh, for parents and then uh, we have to say that, like I think in, in all other countries, the corona epidemic, um, they hit us completely unprepared, to be honest. Um, but what we did from, from, from the side of the school boards, um, 
we provided an online platform, e-education, where a special team uh, provided uh, teaching material, because this was one big problem that the teachers uh, didn't have uh, sufficient um, online teaching material. And also um, there was a lack of the communication software like Zoom and also the competence how to how to use it. So we also provided uh, software um, for, for our schools. And um, what what we uh, managed was uh, that we also we, we managed to to um, to include the majority of students with disability in online teaching, but uh, for students with severe disabilities, um, the, the offer wasn't uh, sufficient. I think basically at the beginning, every single school tried to survive the new situation and we all tried to handle things uh, in our very personal school way. So uh, I think all the teams in the Austrian schools just sat together via Zoom and uh, discussed uh, what could they provide very, very quickly, what could they do. And at the beginning, everything was probably all very, very individualized um, school based. And then um, the government and, and the authorities started setting up like the EduTech and things and things just got a little more smooth running for everybody. Thank you, Michael. I think you can take over again. Well, thank you very much, Michael. Um, uh, I would like uh, to, to uh, end this panel with, again, each one of you um, sharing with us, and, and I think this is the importance of, of, of this session. We are not here to uh, you know, tap on our shoulders and say, oh, everything is great and everything is good and we, we prepared. I love the fact, that, Andrea, that you said it caught us off guard. We, 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 we did not know, we, 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 and still you found the way to cope with it. What I would like to hear from you is two things, and very, keep it short, and again, you have more questions, you want to elaborate on it, ask them in the chat uh, uh, or in the website. One thing, share with us something you are proud of. What is, it can be a small anecdote, it can be something uh, big, and of course, the Austrian delegation, Andrea, I want to see uh, what you guys are preparing. And the second thing, if you can um, uh, pin one challenge, even if it's a challenge that you have not solved yet, you, it's still a problem. And this is something that you're still coping and looking for solutions. Um, so we will start with uh, Austria, please. Um, okay, we, we have prepared a little something and we would like you to um, play the video for us if possible, because this is something which needs no words and we are exceedingly proud of. We are putting it on right now. Wonderful, thank you very much. I love the excited faces in the back of you. <laughs> <laughs>
I think that just spoke for itself. Um, we did a lot. We tried a lot. And um, yes, we are prepared, but hope it won't come again, the situation that we were all in. Thank you. First of all, I must say that uh, when, when we were uh, speaking for the first time, you know, Michael said uh, such superlatives about uh, your school that is known for, for the successful uh, implementation. So, so um, if Michael recommends, I'm, uh, I'm all for it. Um, can you share with us a, a challenge? What, what, what is a challenge that you feel that with the amazing things that you have achieved, you are still, you know, not there yet. You need help. You need... Uh, Yes, um, absolutely. Um, I think where the, the biggest point where we need help uh, for is um, the psychological impact which um, just occurred and, and everything um, during, during uh, the lockdown. We still don't know how uh, the children will come back. We have the second day of school today. Some of them came back very, very excited. Some of them came back very quietly. Some of them don't want to play football because they might catch uh, the virus. So uh, I think this is something which will now be one, now that we're all together, back together here, uh, will be one of the things that we will have to look very, very close at and see what we can do and where we will not need, uh, and all Austria, all students in Austria will probably need a lot of uh, help there. Uh, I think this is something that we should in the future and in the next few months look very, very carefully at. Thank you. Thank you very much. Racheli, uh, can you share with us very shortly uh, one um, thing that you are proud of and maybe a challenge that you're still up for it? Yes. Okay, so I would be, uh, say that uh, we are very proud uh, of uh, providing uh, also, also emotional support and all the therapy uh, at home. Uh, and, um, and we look forward to see uh, if uh, we can do it more and, um, and, um, and give all our children and all our students uh, uh, the opportunity to get our uh, uh, home uh, services uh, if they cannot uh, come to school or to the kindergartens. Uh, one of the challenges that I think that we have uh, uh, to deal with is uh, how to provide or how to reach the population that doesn't have or the, or the students that don't have their uh, um, equipment in their houses and uh, not computers and they cannot reach the internet. Uh, uh, so this I think will be our most uh, challenge uh, step that uh, we have to deal with. Thank you very much. And I must tell you, this day is built in this way because I want to hear the challenges. And I can tell you already that now when you're thinking about how to choose the computers and send it, some of the lectures later will give you great tips yes. on how to do it. So yes. thank you very much. I'm glad to. Thank uh, you. Christina, please. Yeah, I think one of our, our biggest challenges has been um, getting services to students uh, that really truly need in-person services. Um, and we were able to do some of that this summer, uh, which was wonderful at, at, um, at centers throughout the city. But for our students that really still uh, are, are, are struggling with remote learning, those in-person services. And so we're, we're delighted that we're going to be offering blended services this fall. But um, certainly have, we have students with health concerns and otherwise that may not be able to benefit yet from those services. And so that's certainly something that keeps us up at night. Um, regarding ch um, perhaps a child. What's that? What's you proud of? Yeah. What, is so what we're proud of is actually uh, a bir was birth out of uh, a challenge. And, um, and so the challenge of needing to be socially distant uh, and not being able to include students in the way that uh, we typically do, um, we worked around that to make sure that students still felt that con connectivity and that family still felt that connectivity. Um, later today, you're gonna hear from my team, uh, they're gonna tell you about our inclusion expo 
and which was an event that we typically make happen in person. And much like this event, we typically uh, in person don't have enough uh, seats. Um, however, going virtually expanded our capacity to do that. And we had over 18 students present on inclusion um, and uh, families, students, uh, community members, everybody was able to join to, to hear the impact of this, which was really incredible. Thank and the you. same, yeah. Thank you very, very much. And last but not least, Regina, very shortly, what are you proud of? And one big challenge, please. Um, uh, something that we are proud of is the collaboration that we had. We never had it before between teachers, parents, the ministry and the community. You can see that the community are coming, they are coming forth to donate food, clothing, uh, tablets to the children. This is something that we have not really seen in the past years, but I think that is something, the collaboration between different stakeholders is really working, making things better for us. And then the challenge is knowing that we are social human beings who used to enjoy hugging and shaking hands. Children are now in fear. They cannot do this anymore. They cannot shake the hands of the other children. Now that they're coming back to school, they cannot hug, they cannot do all that. And then with the stigma attached to COVID, I think we still have a lot of, to, a lot of things to do. We need to do counseling and give emotional support to the children that we take out that fear that they have for now. Amazing, thank you guys. I, I, could, I could sit with, with each one of you, uh, you know, for a whole hour and, and learn, but I think that you really brought it together and showed us different countries, different challenges, but everything is, is basically, we're facing the same thing with different solutions. Again, the challenges that you raised here, I really think that later on uh, today, you will receive uh, tools and I would like, I'm already receiving WhatsApps and, uh, and, 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 and in the chat, I urge you all, uh, all four participants here, please go on our website, upload your um, uh, materials, your statistics, your solutions people want to hear. Uh, and uh, we will be able to create amazing ripple effects with that. Guys, thank you very much. And Michael, thank you as usual and as always um, uh, for your helps and uh, help and support. Um, uh, and I still have that journalist uh, uh, expertise to learn from you. Um, um, and uh, I would uh, love to go into our second part. Uh, the second part is the more uh, global technologies coming together. And for that, I'm going to pass on uh, the mic to Yuval Wagner, uh, the founder and um, uh, chairperson of Access Israel, and Deborah Rue, the CEO of Rue Global Impact. Again, as I mentioned before, a great partner of ours and uh, partnering in the success of this webinar. Uh, please take the lead, guys. Thank you. Okay. Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, I'm happy to start talking. <laughs> And we are excited about this technology, uh, second part of the webinar. And, and as you already know, Deborah Wu is a secret uh, power of having uh, some amazing uh, speakers today. And we are going to just jump through uh, directly. Deborah, please say hi before we uh, present uh, Morgan. Um, hello, everyone. Good morning. Good day. And um, I'm just so impressed with that, what Access Israel did in just a few weeks, bringing all of us together during this really critical time. So I'm always, always impressed. And they just made me even more impressed and really thrilled to have the corporations that are here supporting us, showing us what they're doing to make sure that we're all included. So thank you, Yuval and Mikhail. Okay, so the way it's going to work and we're going to have some a few speakers from major global companies and i'm going to present them they're going to do their presentations and then they have these tough questions that uh, deba will give them and if it's not tough enough i would add a question so i'm challenging deba uh, so uh, we're going to start with our friends from uh, google uh, so we're going to ask uh, morgan weissman that um, the project marketing manager with Google for education. And she was gonna talk about the power of building for all, supporting all learners with Google for education. So uh, Morgan, I'm not, not gonna take your time. Please start. Okay, great. Can everyone hear me and see me and my screen? 
Yes, it's good. Okay, perfect. Um, thank you so much for that intro. I am really excited to be here and I'm loving learning um, and hearing from all of you with all of the ups and downs and challenges. Um, I spend a lot of time talking to teachers and administrators from around the globe, and we literally couldn't be building all of this without your feedback. So thank you, um, one. Um, so I'm Morgan, I'm a product marketing manager with Google for Education. So I sit across Chrome and G Suite and Google Classroom and spend a lot of time with our storytelling of accessibility, working on our family's narrative, um, security. Uh, so I'm really excited to be here with you talking all about accessibility. Um, so before we dive in, I just wanted to share a little bit about me and my past life. I taught kindergarten in Texas, um, and I had a classroom of 25 students with all different abilities. And you can see a few photos of some of my students here. So Omar, Jeremiah, um, who both had autism. And I will confess that I can't imagine what it would have been like to still be in the classroom today um, with distance learning and supporting students of all abilities without being able to spend that really critical one-on-one -on -one time with them in person. Um, but when I was teaching, I had two very old computers in my classroom and we used those to the best of our ability. And I watched Jeremiah and Omar come alive with learning how to use magnification tools to help them see better, engage with games and learning on the computer in a way that they weren't able to with some of their peers. Um, and I really carried that power of inclusion and the importance of accessibility and technology with me since I left teaching to come to Google five years ago. Um, so I think we all agree and know this to be true, that not only should educational solutions be designed for all types of learners, but that everyone really benefits when doing so. And we see this in classrooms all the time. So last year we heard from a teacher who had a student in their class with autism who required the help of a teaching aide to sit by them to answer their questions throughout the lesson rather than disrupting the class. And with the introduction of Chromebooks, which are devices, and G Suite for Education, which is our free suite of productivity tools and the collaboration tools, the teacher created a Google Doc for the student to write their questions in. And so rather than the aides sitting right by the students, singling them out, they could sit at the back of the class and answer the students' questions in real time in the document. And the great thing was um, every single student in the class benefited because um, the entire class could access that and ask questions um, and engage in that way as well. We've definitely seen this to be true for those who are teaching and learning in remote settings as a result of COVID-19. Um, so the tools themselves are built to be kind of collaborative right, and connect people even when they're not able to be there in person. Um, and teachers who've used tools like the closed captions in Google Meet or Slides for online lessons or enabled automatic alt text in Chrome have experienced um, some of those ways that it's easier to include um, accessibility features for every single student and teacher and parent who has become a teacher. Um, so I want to take you through an example of just one school that experienced this firsthand. So when Portage Public Schools transitioned to distance learning, this is in Michigan, they showed um, an incredible commitment to ensuring that every single student had what they needed to make sure learning could continue from home. So they sent Chromebooks home, they set up G Suite for Education, um, but what they found in setting it up is that the benefits of actually building in all of those inclusive practices um, were greater. Um, so like many others, um, they used Google Meet to conduct their virtual lesson, so our video conferencing solution. Um, and they also used the captioning feature in Meet to provide live captions for those students who are deaf or hard of hearing. So if you're in Google Meet, there's a little closed caption button at the bottom of the screen, um, really easy to enable. And often they would pre-record the lessons and send them out to students. So they downloaded a Chrome extension on their Chromebook and used that to record the Meet lessons so the captions would be recorded. And this then helped not only the students that needed the captions, but also in, in some cases their parents and guardians who are supporting from home. Um, and one unexpected outtake of that was was the fact that many other students benefited from that too. Whether they are more visual learners, I myself am one of those, and benefited from reading at the same time as listening, 
or for those who are learning from home in really noisy environments, right? So if there are multiple students in the same room, if their parents were working from home. Um, we also find that oftentimes students want to go back to the lessons that their teacher taught. There's nothing like learning it the way that your teacher um, shared in class. Um, so that's kind of one of those silver linings that's come out of it. And a lot of teachers are now thinking about when they're back in school or they're doing hybrid lessons, um, they want to make sure that they're recorded so they can send them home so students can access and refer back to them. Um, we, we also now are going to have access to temporary recordings in Google Meet, so I'll share a little bit more about that um, later on. Um, so within Google for Education, right, it's our mission to ensure that every single student or individual has access to the education that they deserve. Um, so that means not just every student who uses our products, but every teacher, IT administrator, education leader, every parent and guardian or community member supports their child. Um, and across Google, we design our technology solutions with inclusion in mind. Um, one of the biggest ways that we strive to deliver on that is by ensuring that our accessibility features are actually built into our solutions from the get-go. So they should be easy to use and they don't require a lot of additional work and lift. Um, so you should be able to just click a button and have closed captions on to be able to include every single person um, who's, who's watching or engaging. Um, and that also means that every single student or teacher, all types and abilities and learning styles have that opportunity to set up their learning environment in a way that works for them. Right? And we're seeing that the earlier students know how to set up accessibility settings or how to customize their learning experience, that actually sets them up for success in the long run. Um, so they'll be able to know exactly how to learn in a way that works for them. Um, and can use that technology to their advantage. So this includes features built in for those who are blind or low vision, like magnifiers or voice typing, one of my personal favorites, um, or braille support, and includes features for students who are deaf or hard of hearing, like screen readers. So we actually have two different screen readers that are built into Chromebooks, um, all free and included. Um, so I also know that many people are not aware of the many features that are built in. So I actually wanted to spend some time today sharing what those are and how to use them. Um, I think everyone knows this to be true as well, but there are three core ways in which it's really beneficial having all of this built in. So students with specific learning needs get to use the same tools as the rest of the class, and that promotes an inclusive and collaborative learning environment. They're just able to use them in a different way. Um, every teacher and student can create their own customized environment. And then students, of course, can learn with confidence and foster that independent learning with individualized tools, especially when you can't have a teacher sitting right next to a student um, as we do with remote learning. Um, so let's chat a little bit more about the technology. Um, so Chromebooks, we've seen millions of students using Chromebooks and taking them home for distance learning. Um, we also know that, of course, access and equity um, are really big issues that are affecting us globally. Um, so if, even if you don't have Wi-Fi access or have spotty service, um, they do work offline as well. Um, so you're able to access a lot of the tools um, that you would need. G Suite for Education also works offline. So um, if you're offline and you happen to get a little bit of service, you can access, download um, any of your documents, work, and then when you're back online, they'll sync back up. Um, so Chromebooks are kind of very secure, simple, powerful devices that have everything from visual aids to screen readers built in right out of the box. Um, and within accessibility settings, you can customize um, your settings. And then once you sign in, um, then those settings will actually follow you no matter what device you're using if you're signed in with that same username um, and login. Um, so since the settings are synced to each account, Chromebooks are very easy to share. So among students or members of the family, um, Chromebooks also have a ton of different apps and extensions. So from companies like Don Johnson and Texthelp, um, augmentative and alternative communication apps like Cricksoft, um, and, and a lot of those are all kind of built in or easily accessible as well. Um, we'll dive into some of the specific features in just a little bit. Um, and then G Suite for Education is that set of tools um, that many students and teachers are using to collaborate in real time. You've probably heard of Google Classroom, um, which is the hub of communication and where teachers can create assignments and grade, um, have conversations in the stream. 
Um, and then you can also now access Google Meet directly from Google Classroom. So students don't have to go tons of different places looking for links. They can go directly to their class and join a Google Meet, um, which also has live captions built in along with Google Slides. You can use voice typing in Google Docs and screen readers across all the G Suite products. Um, we're also seeing you know, Google Forms being used for IEPs or one-on-one -on -one Google Meets for conferences. Um, the, the possibilities are really endless. Um, so let's chat a little bit about some of the, the specific features that are built in. Um, so to help students see screens more easily, you're able to increase the size of the cursor or increase text size or better visibility on Chromebooks. You can add a highlighted circle around the cursor when moving the mouse or a text carrot when typing um, or a keyboard focused item when tapping. Um, colorful rings appear when the items are in motion to draw greater visual focus and then fade away. Um, up here, you can see um, for students with light sensitivity or eye strain, you can turn on high contrast mode to invert colors across the Chromebook. Um, you can also increase the size of the browser or app content um, and make everything on the screen, including app icons and Chrome tabs, larger for greater visibility. Um, for higher levels of Zoom, you can try full screen or docked magnifiers in Chromebooks. Um, and you can also add automatic alt text um, when using a screen reader in Chrome. So Google can automatically provide descriptions of unlabeled images. Um, for example, many images that don't have alt text. So we're working on ways to use um, technology to, to, um, to have better access um, across the web as well. Um, there are many other features too that can read text out loud. So those can be useful for students with visual impairments, um, learning and processing challenges, or even students learning a new language or using English as their, um, that's not their first language. Um, so select to speak, um, let students hear the text they choose on screen spoken out loud with word by word visual highlighting for better audio and visual connection. Um, we also have Chromevox, so that's a built-in screen reader for Chromebooks. Um, and you can, students can navigate around the Chromebook interface using audio spoken feedback or Braille. Um, and there are also many extensions like those from TextHelp, like Read and Write, that can be used for spelling and grammar checks, talking in picture dictionaries, text-to-speech, text um, additional reading and writing support as well. Um, and then uh, we've talked about this a little bit, but the live captions in Google Slides and Google Meet will display the speaker's words in real time at the bottom of the screen. This is a personal favorite. Um, and for any users who have limited hearing in one ear, you can also use mono audio to play the same, the same sound through both speakers. Um, and Chromebooks also support the latest standards for video closed captions. Um, and for those students or teachers or family members that have a motor impairment, um, you can use all of the following. So dictation um, allows you to speak into your Chromebook to enter text in many places where you might otherwise type. Um, you can also use voice typing to enter, edit, and format text in Google Docs and Slides, all without a keyboard. Um, dictating writing assignments can, can also be really helpful for students who get a little stuck um, and want to get thoughts flowing by speaking instead of typing. Um, and students with mobility impairments can use features like an on-screen keyboard to type using a mouse or a pointer device or automatic clicks, which actually hover, which hover over items to click or scroll. Um, and you can set the time um, on those. Um, then we also have sticky keys, which allow shortcut keys to be typed in sequence without pressing, pressing modifier keys at the same time. Um, and there are also other Chrome extensions like CoWriter um, for word prediction and completion, as well as grammar help. Um, and in Google Docs, we also have, um, we have grammar support as well. Um, so Google, you know, globally has a lot of products um, that aren't necessarily included in our education suite. So if any of you are also using an Android device or your students or families have access to one of those at home, um, there are many, many accessibility features built into those as well. So TalkBack um, is a feature that lets you interact with what's on your screen through sound and touch. Um, and you can hear everything from notifications, to app names, how much battery life you have left. Um, live transcribe, which came out last year, um, you can get real-time captions right away as you're having a conversation. So incredibly helpful. Um, there's also live caption for calls. So with a single tap, live caption automatically captions videos, podcasts, and audio messages, even stuff that you record yourself without ever needing Wi-Fi or mobile data. Um, and there are many more. So Lookout allows you to use your camera to help identify what's nearby. 
Um, and action blocks allows users to make routine actions easier with customizable buttons on the Android home screen. So that's a lot. Um, and I, I really did want to spend a little bit of time kind of talking through those features. Um, and I'll share in just a little bit where you can find access to tons of training, um, videos, and, and um, workbooks on how to share those with, with your schools. Um, we, I would be remiss um, if I didn't mention that we read literally every piece of feedback. So please, after this, if you have thoughts or ways you've used Google's tools or ways you want them to be better, um, please share them with us because um, we couldn't do it without you. Um, we, we are constantly improving upon our, our products and solutions based on your feedback. Um, one example of that, as I mentioned earlier, with Portage Public Schools, they loved the closed captions um, that were great for students and families that were hard of hearing, but they have a really big contingent of users who don't use English as their first language. Um, and right now, captions are only available um, in English. So they requested the captions could come in more languages. So I'm really excited to share that um, captions are going to be coming in additional languages, um, and you'll also now be able to translate them um, into another language. So if I'm speaking English, you could translate those into Hebrew. Um, we also have many other products and features like Google Translate, um, which you can use, or you can use the Translate feature in Google Docs, and you can actually translate an entire document. Um, so really, really helpful for those, um, those schools who have many nationalities. Um, so yes, so addition, so soon, um, closed captions will be available in a host of additional languages. So we're really excited about that. Um, but what else is on the horizon? There is a ton coming up. Um, and in October, we'll celebrate Disability Awareness Month, um, and we'll spend time talking about all of the new features that we're building from across um, across Google. Some of those um, Chromebooks are used for standardized testing with um, kiosk mode. Um, so now all of the Chromebook accessibility features I just talked about are now readily available. Um, you can also now have better access to Braille support and Google Docs, um, switch access, so being able to interact with devices through a, a connected controller, um, and live captions on a Chrome browser. Almost finished. Um, and then I mentioned earlier, too, that um, you'll now have access to free temporary recordings in Google Meet, so those looks, will expire after 30 days. Um, so where can you find all of this? Because I just talked really fast. Um, so during COVID, um, we started working on our response in like January, February, and um, we realized that families needed a ton of support um, as they were home um, and supporting their students. So we launched um, Teach From Anywhere to support teachers and IT administrators and education leaders. Um, so that's at g.co slash teach from anywhere. It has all of our products. It has a ton of guides and resources from a lot of parts partners um, across the world. Um, and we also created a lot of guardians guides too. So you'll find this one, um, uh, a guide on all of our tools that has a ton of the features that I just talked about in there. Um, there are also education on air webinars. We've hosted a lot, um, almost 100, I think, over the past eight months, um, where you can learn about our accessibility features and tools built in. Um, you'll also see up here, if you want to stay, uh, stay in touch and follow along, we have a blog. The Chromebook App Hub has a ton of accessibility apps and features included. We have our teacher center where you can find training on all of our accessibility features, and then help centers as well, um, which have all of, all of our um, tools as well. Um, so we are looking to you um, and learning from you and here with you. Um, and we are hopeful that this will all kind of accelerate that more inclusive education, um, which will benefit everyone today and the students of tomorrow. So thank, thank you. you. Thank you for having me. Morgan, are you ready for the question of Deborah? Oh, sure. <laughs> okay, Deborah. <laughs> Well, excellent presentation, and I continue to be so impressed with what Google and other global corporations are doing to listen to our community and really um, help us be included. And I love the points that you were making, that as you made um, things more accessible for some students, it actually supported all students and all the different learning 
types. Also, special kudos to Google for knowing to hire teachers. Teachers and special education teachers, they bring so many, so much to these conversations. So my question for you is, and I'm actually going to um, do a question that someone asked because um, I know that Haggad had asked about uh, captions in Hebrew when you answered that, um, that that is coming. But also I thought uh, Lisa Nielsen made a question and somebody else also agreed that accessibility checkers built into Google would be very helpful for us. And so I was just wondering if that is something that is planned. And also I want to thank you for the captions that are built into Google Chat and that now that you're holding on to it because we have found that to be very, very valuable tying it with Google, Google Translate. Awesome. Yeah, it's so great to hear. Um, and thank you for all of these messages. I'm really excited. Um, so keep them coming. Um, that is something we are looking into. Um, I am not sure exactly where it is on the product roadmap right now. I think we've like pivoted everything to spending so much time and energy on Google Meet, of course, which, you know, never was really needed in schools and education before. Um, so the accessibility checker, I know, is something that's it's incredibly important, especially in higher ed, right, um, in higher education, um, and then within kind of the K-12 education space, too. So I know it's something we are actively looking into, um, but I don't know the time frame right now. And one other real quick question. You asked for us to give you feedback, and I know that Google was really supporting our community across the world, but how would the community give you feedback? Would we go to those links that you sent at the, that you had in the presentation? Yeah, so any of those links, um, I will share my own email um, address as well. Um, but if you comment on our Twitter account, um, our Facebook page, um, or you can also submit feedback in product too. So there's, um, there's an option to also submit feedback there. We also have our help centers where there are community forums. So tons of educators um, and administrators around the world are manning those and answering questions in real time. So submit those there. Um, our teams are, are reading a lot of feedback um, and it is great. So um, please continue sharing in any of those ways. Thank you, Morgan. Good job. You're welcome. Awesome. Uh, thank you very much. Just last, last small question. All your training materials, are they being planned to be translated to many, many languages? Because many countries around the world are asking for that. Yes. So Teach From Anywhere, I think is available in over 40 languages now, um, and it's available all over the world. Um, everything in our teacher center and help center are also available um, globally. Um, and then we are actively working to translate all of our like one pagers and, and guides and everything too. So they should, most of it should be available um, in many, many languages. But if you don't see it, um, please reach out and I'm sure I have it somewhere in my Google Drive. Thank you um, very much. Yes, and I see some questions about the recordings. Um, Google Meet recording is still working um, and you can access it in your Google Meet or maybe that's about this. <laughs> great. So I want to thank you very much for all your help and all your friends from Google. You're a great friend of us and looking forward for the new things that will make uh, school inclusiveness and the accessibility better next year. So thank you very much. Okay, okay. guys, uh, uh, we will go directly to our uh, next uh, speaker. This time uh, we are gonna talk with Mike Thorfinn from Microsoft. Mike, are you uh, ready? I am, can you hear me? I'm gonna make it very, direct and fast because I want to give you the time. Microsoft are doing some great stuff globally and also great friends both globally and in Israel. Uh, so we're really looking forward to hear what you are going to update us on on this uh, issue of education. So please go on and again be ready for the last questions that we are preparing for you at the end. Okay, and can you see my screen okay? Yes, everything is good. Great. So my name is Mike Thalfson. I work on the Microsoft Education team, and I focus a lot of my time on inclusive classrooms and accessibility. And so today we'll talk and show some of those things. Now, Microsoft's mission 
for those that aren't aware, is to empower every person on the planet to achieve more. And our education mission is to empower every student on the planet to achieve more. So our, our mission has inclusion embedded inside of it. I like to say we're not trying to empower 86% of the people. We're not trying to empower 94.3% of the people. We want to empower 100% of students to achieve more. And the way we think about this at a global scale is we're trying to help students grow their potential and gain independence. We also want to make sure educators can reach every learner, which is really critical, especially during remote and distance learning. And then we want to make sure schools can build their reputations and at a system level, hit those goals around equity and inclusion. Those are key parts of many, many schools of their core mission is around equity and inclusion. And so we really want to make sure that we can help you with that. Now at a company level, and we're not going to cover all these today, this is how we think about accessibility across the board. For people who maybe haven't been hanging around with Microsoft more recently, and you're not aware, we have a wide range of tools that are built in mainstream non-stigmatizing, and they're just part of the platform. And so how we think about these across the board is on this one slide. And I won't be covering all of these today, but we do have all sorts of tools that are built into Windows and Office around visual, around hearing, mobility, you know, things like accessibility checkers that we're talking about, those are built into the Office apps. We have all sorts of tools built for blind and low vision. I'll spend a little more of my time today on learning around dyslexia, dysgraphia, dyscalculia, uh, some neurodiversity tools as well. But if you want to get the entire suite and set of things documented in a very, very beautiful site, right at the bottom here is this accessibility sway link. And this deck is also available that has all the links. And you can explore because the thing that I run into most is people say, I had no idea Microsoft had all of these capabilities that are free and built in already. Uh, you're gonna see some things today. And when I talk about the inclusive classroom, you're gonna see a lot of things. And if you're thinking about Microsoft from the year 2011, you're probably thinking these things only work on Windows and they're really expensive. And so, uh, newsflash, it is the year 2020 and there's a new Microsoft. So everything you're going to see today is free. Everything you're going to see today works on multiple platforms. So one of the challenges we have is people think of us from a decade ago. So hopefully today we'll open up uh, your eyes on, hey, there's a whole new set of tools that Microsoft has and they're all free and available to schools around the world. But this is how we think about the inclusive classroom. And I'm going to talk about reading, writing, math, and communication. I'm going to show quite a few things. And first off, the way we think about any of these tools is inclusive design. And so we really want to make sure that we're really focusing on some core areas specifically. And if we do the right design techniques, that will help all students. For example, with the immersive reader, which I'm going to show here in a minute, we really focused on dyslexia as our core persona type but use inclusive design to really help make sure it works for all students with reading, non-native speakers, early readers, people with vision impairments. And all the things you're gonna to see today are captured in these interactive guides. I put this up front because you might be sitting there in like five minutes thinking, hey, Mike just clicked a button or hey, he showed me something that I can't remember, I, he went too fast. Don't worry, it's all in these interactive guides, everything I'm showing and more and these are free, so they can be shared with parents, with students, with educators, with school leaders. And we have them for reading, writing, math, and communication. So we're going to go right into reading. And I'm going to switch my screen here. And we're going to go into something that's called the Immersive Reader. Now, what is the Immersive Reader? Well, we took the latest science and research around reading, and we said, let's focus inclusively on dyslexia, and let's take some of these techniques and build them into something that we call now the Immersive Reader. And I'm here in Word for the Web, and this is the free version of Word. And I, I keep saying free again because a lot of people think we cost money. That's okay. This is the free version of Word that you now students, teachers, parents all have access to. And I'm on the View tab in Word, and I'm gonna hit this button called the Immersive Reader. And it's gonna do some things that I'll talk through. Now, first off, what you're gonna see is we've reduced distractions on the page. We call this focus mode and helps reduce all the distractions. 
At the bottom, there's a play button, and I'm going to hit this. You'll hear text-to-speech and see it. The study of Earth's landforms is called physical geography. Landforms can be mountains and valleys. So that's text-to-speech, which is not revolutionary, but now this is built in, mainstream, non-stigmatizing, and free. It's just part of Word. I can change the voice speed faster or slower. I can choose male or female voices. I can also change the way the page looks. So up here, if I click this, I'm going to maybe change uh, spacing. We know from research there's something called visual crowding, and if you increase spacing, that can reduce visual crowding for some people. I can choose a couple different fonts. Turns out a lot of younger readers like Comic Sans. A lot of people make fun of Comic Sans, but it turns out it was designed for younger readers. I can choose the background colors. So some people don't really like to uh, use a white or a black background, and it's very easy for me to find maybe a background color that works better for me when I'm reading. And I can make the fonts much bigger in the upper right. I can scroll, make this a lot bigger, maybe just have a couple of words per line, short line mode, could be practicing sight words, someone with vision impairments, making a little bit bigger. Now I'm gonna to go to the middle here, which is grammar options. Now using our cloud services and natural language processing, we're gonna be able to do a few things. For example, when you teach students breaking words into syllables, you clap, you go syllables. And many students with dyslexia work on syllable breaks, many early readers. Well, if I click on syllables, we can break those words into syllables with a single click. I can highlight the nouns on the page for parts of speech. I can highlight the verbs, the adjectives or the adverbs, and these are customizable. Maybe I can't detect any red, maybe I wanna use blue, maybe I can't detect any colors at all, and I wanna show labels. So I can put a visual distinguishing mark. But as you can see, it's very easy to personalize this in a way that works best for you. And we have kindergartners using this, we have eight-year-olds, 10-year-olds, college students, we have corporate lawyers using the immersive reader. Now I'm gonna go and change the background color again. I'm gonna get blue and I'm gonna to go to reading preferences. And I'm gonna do something called line focus. So thinking about focusing the eyes right here, a reading ruler. This could be for students with dyslexia, students with autism, students with cerebral palsy. I can scroll this myself. I can hit play. Believers. Landforms are sometimes called physical features. It automatically will scroll the line for me. And I can choose three lines or five lines. It's very customizable. I'm gonna turn this off. Last couple things I'll show, I can click on a word and get a picture. So this is the Boardmaker's images. If you're familiar with Toby Boardmaker, Earths. and I can read Earths. it out loud, click on another image. Mountains, mountains. And I can go the entire document here. And now if I wanna translate, we talked about translating a little bit earlier. We have over 70 languages I can translate this document into in real time. So if I scroll down, I'll just choose Mexico here and we'll leave it on by word. Now when I click on a word, I hear mountains or montañas, mountains, montañas. And it translates that in real time. I go back and if I want to translate the entire document, now it's Spanish and we'll read it out loud. El estudio de las formas terrestres de la tierra se llama geografía física. Now if that's too fast, that's a little too fast. I can slow it down. Física. Las formas de tierra pueden ser montañas. And you can see the syllables are still broken. I can highlight the nouns and the verbs and adjectives in Spanish. So this works in many languages. And I can go back to the original document right here or to Spanish. So everything I just showed right there is part of that immersive reader. And this is something that is not only in Word. This is part of our Teams for Education Classroom solution. This is built into the Edge browser. This is built into OneNote, it's in Flipgrid, it's in Forms, it's in many, many places. So we spend a lot of time bringing this immersive reader to many of our platforms. And it's being used in many special education classes, it's being used with students with dyslexia, dysgraphia, ADHD, visual impairments, English language learners, all sorts of students. And it's being used with older students and it's being used with very young students. Here's a student practicing sight words. And this is a quote, and I think the impact, especially during distance learning, we've seen a 6x increase in immersive reader usage because all these students at home uh, are now able to use the immersive reader and parents can help them with it. And they don't have the same supports that they maybe had in. Reader can be really helpful, especially during remote learning. 
We've also made this uh, available to other companies. So we've rolled this out as what's called a cognitive service. So here's Mike, for some reason we can't hear you. Mike, for some reason you are stuck. Deborah? Yes. Um, she I would yeah. like to say, uh, until Mike uh, gets back for some reason, uh, he, he disconnected, uh, please uh, check, with, check him uh, out. I, I, just want to, I just want to say in the meantime that... Looks like Zoom booted me. Sorry yeah. oh, yeah, <laughs> about that. He's, he's back. We're welcome glad back. you're back. back. Go ahead. <laughs> Go ahead. Um, yeah. I, how long was it? Like 30 seconds? I, I saw the connecting like booted me right back and it just restarted as I was in the middle you're of it. So. You're finished about the immersive reader and you're after that. Okay. Can you, let me reshare my screen really quick then. Sorry about that. Um, but I guess at this point the world is used to these types of things, right? Okay. My screen coming through again? Yeah, everything is good, go ahead. Okay, so this is just to show all of these ed tech apps have integrated the immersive reader. Everything from Canvas to ThingLink, Code.org is integrating the immersive reader, Nearpod, Pear Deck. So if in your country, you have apps that you work with that are popular in schools, it's really easy to integrate that immersive reader. And we've had educators and students and parents requesting that these different companies integrate it. And it's quite easy to do. Many companies can do it in just a couple of days. So that's something to just keep in mind. Uh, if you saw the immersive reader and you say, wow, that's great, but you know, we don't use anything from Microsoft right now, that's not a problem. Uh, we have many other apps that use the immersive reader, so there's benefits there too. Uh, as I mentioned, it's also in our Edge browser. Uh, the new Edge browser is based off the open source Chromium project, so it's just like Google Chrome. Uh, it does have a built-in immersive reader that does all the things that you just saw. This is one that's really powerful. Uh, if you have any homework of today, your homework would be to download uh, the Office Lens app. This app is free on iOS or Android, and it lets you take a picture of a book. So I'm taking a picture of a book, and we run OCR, and there's an immersive reader button right there. And I can send the photo of that book to the immersive reader and immediately send it out. So it's out. It would not take the garbage out. And so all of those things that let me do with the immersive reader, I can do with the picture that I took from a book. And so right here, you're seeing all sorts of nouns and syllables. You can translate this to Spanish. I can use the picture dictionary. And so this is a free app that allows you to access the content universally. And there's a read aloud. Camole. Y aunque su papá gritaba y gritaba, ella simplemente... So there's some homework for people is uh, get the Office Lens app and try this out. Again, a lot of students at home, this is an easy way to access content. And we have lots of training on the immersive reader and our PD. As I mentioned, we have interactive guides. I won't go through those right now, but just to be aware. The next topic is writing. We talked about reading. Writing is another important area, especially during remote learning. And I'm going to go back to my demo briefly and just show that this is one, again, where people might not be aware. In Word, I'm in the free version of Word for the web, we have full grade speech to text and we have it in many different languages. We have dictation in over 20 languages and it's full top of the line, uh, state of the art, whatever you might want to call it, but it is very high quality dictation that is built right into Word but it's also built into PowerPoint. And so if I have a new PowerPoint presentation here that I'm in, let me switch over here. We have speech to text that is built into PowerPoint. And so it's on the home tab as well. Uh, there's a dictate button right here. So we have dictation built into Word. It's built into PowerPoint. It's built into OneNote. It's in Outlook. We're building speech to text across the board. It's also built into Windows. And again, that's one that a lot of people just might not be aware of that you have 
speech to text across all of your office apps, including the free web apps right now. And as we know, that's really, really helpful for students, especially students with mobility impairments, students with dysgraphia. And we've also been improving our old spell checker. I'm not gonna have time to go through the demo today, but we have a brand new tool called Editor in Word that I like to call your next gen spell checker. A lot of people haven't thought about their spell checkers in 20 years. And we are using next generation natural language processing and a lot of new techniques to go well beyond your old spelling and grammar checking. Clarity and conciseness, inclusive language. There's all sorts of new techniques that really help students who struggle with writing, but they also help mainstream people. We have all people all across Microsoft, including myself, use editor to help improve our writing. So that's another one where we used inclusive design to help improve the outcomes for everyone. And we also have word prediction and text suggestions built right into Windows 10. So those three things, we have dictation, editor, which is kind of next generation spelling and grammar checking, and word prediction are all built in and part of our products and available. Now the next one I'm gonna show is math. Math doesn't get a lot of play in the world of inclusion and accessibility, partially because it's pretty difficult to do and also a lot of companies charge a lot of money. And so I'm gonna go into OneNote here and show some math. Now OneNote is our free digital binder. And this is something that works in the web. It also works in our Windows 10 app and it's coming to iPad soon. So what does inclusive math mean? Well, here's an example of an equation I've selected. And this can be, I can type my equations into OneNote or I can write them. So you don't need to have a digital pen or stylus. This works with typed math just as well as with written math like you see here. And so if I go to the insert menu in OneNote and I click math, we'll convert that equation automatically over here on the right. And I can select an action. So think about a student at home trying to get independent math help here. Maybe the parents can't help. Maybe the parents don't speak the native language. There's various reasons why the student might not be able to get any help. So I can solve for X in this case. I can also graph. So I could say graph both sides in 2D and it gives me a graph. I can insert that on the page. I can explore this graph. But it also lets me do things like solve the equation. So I can say solve for x. Now I can show the steps. Let's say I need to understand how was that equation actually solved. I can sort of steps for completing the square. And it works out all the steps. So I can actually start to independently figure some of these things out. Now, if I experience visual crowding, or maybe I'm having challenges with the story problems and the words and the letters and the numbers getting jumbled, well, there's an immersive reader button here. And right here, I can click the immersive reader and I can take that entire math equation and all the steps and all the pieces and everything is in the full immersive reader, just like we saw earlier. And I can read that equation out loud and I can do all those different things that we were talking about all as part of the immersive reader. And so I can have all sorts of more complex equations in here and it will read all of these equations out loud. I can still click on words and get my picture dictionary just like before. I can translate this story problem into a different language and read out the equation in over you know, 40 languages. So this is something that is just part of our math tools is making math more accessible. The last thing I'll show is at the bottom here, there's generate a practice quiz. And so let's say that as part of my uh, independent math, I wanna generate a practice quiz and get more practice on that equation there. So if I click generate a practice quiz, it asks me how many questions would you like? And I'm just gonna say three here. And what it's gonna do is go and look at the equation that was up top. So the five X squared plus three X minus seven and it generates an entirely new quiz of similar math questions that are different than the original equation. So I can get independent math practice at home. And I can solve the equation, I'm just gonna guess here, but I submit and it'll actually give me the results. So I can get, I got them all wrong. But the idea here is independent math practice and with remote learning and the ability to access many of these math tools and problems and it's all free, this can make math much more accessible than maybe it's ever been.
Now, the last thing in the show, I'm going to skip ahead here. Um, we're going to go down to communication. And we talked a little bit about captions. For an example, I'm just going to turn on at the bottom in my PowerPoint. I'm going to turn on uh, some live captions at the bottom. And it will be uh, captioning as I'm talking along here. And I've got it going uh, in Spanish. So student and parent communication. PowerPoint has built-in captioning, and it also can translate in over 70 languages. Now, the thing that is brand new that I want to show here today that people might not have seen, I'm going to play, it's like a one-minute video, but it's taking captioning and translation to the next level in terms of inclusion. And we've just launched something in PowerPoint in the web, and this is free, and it just came out recently. Uh, not as many people know about it yet, but I'm going to play a short video that shows exactly how PowerPoint Live works and how it captions and translates in all these languages. So I'm just going to hit play. Present more inclusively and engage your audience. So I'm going to switch to the slideshow tab right here, and there's this new button, Present Live. And by the way, I can present either to people in my organization or school district, just for those folks, or I can choose anyone and make this available to anyone in the world. And I'll click Present Live to start. Now this is the join screen. And what I can do is up in the right, there's a PowerPoint link. And this is the join link I can give to anyone. There's also a QR code. So if you're in a Teams meeting, people can just hold their device up and join into the presentation automatically. Now you can see here the numbers of people who have joined is going up and we'll get going. Okay, now I'm in PowerPoint for the web and my live session is started. Also note that the link to follow along is right here up at the top where I'm highlighting. So first off, we can have students or participants join this session and choose their own captions and their language. That means we could have multiple people join and each person chooses one of 67 languages and it captions to them in real time on their device. And as the teacher or the presenter, when I move my slide, the participant slides moves, but the captions come through in their own language. So here I have someone with English, with Chinese, and another device with Spanish. So as I'm talking, it's captioning to them in the language they choose. So that's a demo of the brand new PowerPoint Live that is available today. And that is out and available right now. And so what we're trying to do with captions and translation is just make that part of the oxygen and ecosystem of as many places as we can. This is also part of Microsoft Teams and you can caption in meetings now. And we're bringing more and more languages to Teams in the near future. The other one we have is Microsoft Translator, which is similar, but allows two-way conversations. So think about deaf and hard of hearing students. Microsoft Translator is free. It's available in the web, you know, iPhone and Android. And it allows someone to start a session, like an educator, and then a student to follow along and communicate back in their language or in a different language. So what that means is a educator in this case could be captioning to this student who's deaf and the student could type back and they can communicate, but it also does different languages. And so that takes it to the next level in terms of inclusion. This also works for multilingual classes or working with parents. So in this case, you have an educator up front who's communicating with nine different parents who speak nine, sorry, nine different languages of parents in real time. So think about a remote learning conference where you're having an IEP discussion with a parent who doesn't speak the same language. It's a really important scenario that a lot of schools, uh, you know, I, I saw Lisa Nielsen on the call, New York City has many languages spoken. And so being able to communicate with the parents of your special education students is really important. So this allows that. And Microsoft Translator, they can speak back in their native language and it translates back to English, but this can happen in many, many languages at the same time. So it's bi-directional translation of multiple languages. It takes a little bit to think about that, but it, it's pretty incredible. And having remote parent-teacher conferences uh, using a device and captioning and translating back and forth. And so this is a really impactful app, and especially with special education and accessibility tools, I think it's even more important to be able to communicate with the parents. The, the last thing that I'm gonna talk about before we uh, wrap up, something that's coming soon that I won't demo, but we've just launched a beta of pulling translator live captions into Microsoft OneNote. 
So that allows note taking with real time captions and translation. So I can have the educator speaking and as a student have my notes connected uh, in real time and choose the language I want and have those captions stream right into OneNote. So I automatically capture a transcript and save that into OneNote. We think that's especially powerful for higher education and remote learning. So that's rolling out in beta right now. So to wrap up, no one should have to ask for access. It should be there. That's, that's how we think about these things that are built in mainstream, non-stigmatizing and free. And this entire presentation is available. Uh, feel free to reach out to my email directly or ping me on Twitter. Uh, we always are open to feedback and we love to hear from the community. So we're definitely interested in hearing from you. And again, everything I just showed today is captured in those interactive guides. So don't worry if you missed it. Uh, all those interactive guides are available and they're part of the deck. Mike, so thank amazing. You very much. Mike amazing. Thank you, Deborah. Please, a quick question. Yes, and, and I want to say to everybody also that Mike, you had a lot of questions. There were a lot of questions that were I'll, asking I'll about some of those data things. Well, what we're going to do is we're going to make sure for the audience, we're going to make sure that any question that does not get answered, we're going to have the presenters answer it and we're going to send it back. People are also asking about presentations and the presentations are going to be made available after we're sure they're fully accessible and things like that. But so the, I would, the, there were so many good questions, but I would, the, I'm going to ask you this question from um, two of the audience members, Nicole, Nicola, and Connie both ask similar, can these apps like Dictate be used offline? And then there are other questions that Talia and David Baines were asking about the symbols, but I know that we're not going to have enough time to do all the questions. But so maybe we start with that and also applause for everything you're doing. But at the same time, I wonder there's a lot of this stuff that I know I'm hearing for the first time and others are, and it's great that Access Israel is doing this, but how do we stay on top of what you're doing without having, you know, you know, having to always um, see it at a conference? And also Catherine Ott, she made some great points too about whether somebody, whenever they are changing the settings, does it follow with the ID like they, like Google said it, they did with theirs. So. I gave you a few things, but we'll capture sure. everything later. Yeah. I'll, uh, so for the dictation, so the dictation, it works with Windows. The old, we have older dictation on Windows that is decent. It is not state of the art. The state of the art dictation speech to text does talk to our cloud service. So you do need to be online to get some of those new ones that I just showed today. In terms of keeping up with the latest and the greatest, yeah, I would say the we've got the microsoft education blog is a great place uh, if you're on twitter or linkedin i post our inclusive updates on linkedin and twitter you know, all the time and i mean i even actually i should show this um i've put together even an inclusive classroom youtube uh, playlist channel that i'm always uploading the latest and greatest videos to so that's a great place as soon as we have new features coming out we're always posting uh, our videos up there. So those are some great places. Um, last one, during remote learning, we put together an accessibility site that is dedicated to uh, all of these topics, special education and remote learning resources. So that is uh, another one. I think the last question was about settings. So on the settings, on immersive reader, for example, those settings will travel with you wherever you go. They will roam. Uh, in terms of the settings on, like if you have settings for visual impairments on your Windows device or JAWS or Magnifier, those settings on your Windows machine don't yet roam, but we're looking to add that in the future. So right now, all of our online web settings for all the apps that I show do roam. Uh, the Windows settings do not roam at this point. And hopefully that okay. answered them. Okay. Uh, wow, Mike, thanks a lot. Uh, so many new things inspiring and uh, it's great to know them. You should think Thank you. about how to advertise uh, the new things better around the world because... Yeah, we are working on it, trust me. Uh, that's one of our biggest challenges. <laughs> yeah, I, so thanks a lot and it's great to, to have you with us and looking forward Thank you. to new stuff. So we go next. Thank you. And uh, before we go next, I just want to say that Able Docs is uh, sponsoring this uh, event and all presentations 
are being uh, being uh, in accessible formats and will be uh, be there for you for your use. So thank you very much for Able Docs, and we're going to go to our next keynote speaker, uh, which is um, from all the way from the British Islands, uh, England, uh, Robin Spinks, for uh, the, which is a, an amazing guy that I'm uh, following for many years, and I just lately uh, had the um, the chance to talk to him and meet with him, and he has so much to to, to say for us. So we just going to give you the 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 mic to start and talk about embarrassing the challenge, staying positive. So, Robin, please take Thank it. You. Thank you, Yuval, Thank you. and Thank uh, you. very good to be with you all. I hope everyone can hear well. So I'm Robin Spinks, and I want to talk to you today about specifically embracing the challenge and staying positive. So I have lived all my life as someone with low vision, and that has initially taken me as far away from the disability community as possible, because I didn't believe that there was anything special about me being visually impaired and I wanted to do a normal job, in quotes, that everyone else does. But my career path brought me into the disability realm and it's been a really interesting and, and engaging um, career to date. And I wanted to just share some things with you in terms of RNIB, but also in terms of some of what's happened most recently, um, not just in Scotland where I'm from, but also right across the UK and, and further afield and what we've picked up and learned and how we've adapted. So I'll tell you a little bit about RNIB. RNIB is uh, over 150 years old as an organization. Um, and when we became 150 years old, we projected forward into the future to try and work out when would be the day that we would no longer be needed. And we reckoned it would be another 150 years at the current rate of progress before we could completely achieve our mission. Um, I'm not sure whether it will take quite that long, but we are very convinced that there's a huge amount still to be done to make life more accessible for blind and partially sighted people. So we're about embracing technological change and partnering with tech companies. And we're about, we're in, in, innovating and enabling to greater inclusion for blind and partially sighted people. Um, we're often referred to as the Victorian charity in Silicon Valley. And that's because we do a lot of work internationally not least in Silicon Valley and, and also in places like Korea, with manufacturers, uh, with developers of hardware, software services. And we have a world-class team of user experience people who've worked on everything from showers to elevators to airport kiosks to smart televisions to mobiles and wearables and, and banking apps and everything in between. So, Really, I guess in terms of our engagement with technology companies, there are no real boundaries in the sense that we will, you know, we will engage in a project if there's an opportunity to bring about positive change and bring about greater inclusion. So we have a vision. I mentioned that 150 year uh, birthday and our vision really is of a world where there are no barriers to people with sight loss. Just imagine for a moment, if you will, getting up from where you're sat right now and navigating around your local town or city, maybe going to the supermarket, using public transit, um, perhaps going to visit a friend. And imagine doing that without useful vision, either with your eyes closed, or perhaps more accurately with a very significant amount of visual impairment, where you can see something, but actually not enough to enable you to get around independently. So most blind and partially sighted people can see something, the challenge is in communicating what you can see to other people and enabling them to be aware. And I'll talk a bit later on about a tool that we've built that might help you to communicate vision loss much more, um, much more kind of uh, easily to people who are new to it. So um, we have this purpose and that really is to act as a catalyst for change. We do that by collaborating. So we, we can't solve any of the technological challenges that face blind and partially sighted people on our own. We can only do that 
through partnering with tech companies. And that's where my team really engages with the Samsungs, with the Amazons, with the Miles, with the Googles, with a whole bunch of companies to really begin to build apps and services and devices that enable people to have that, not that moment where they feel that they have equal access, but what we really want to do is to enable people to thrive because it's not just about surviving, it's about enabling people to, to thrive and to feel that they can achieve their potential. And that, that comes about when we can create great accessibility across a range of experiences. And we, we reckon there's a good way to go before we're even close to that. So some of the current customers we've been working with, we work with the Bank of England to make sure that banknotes are accessible to blind and partially sighted people. Yes, banknotes contain tactile features that enable blind and partially sighted people to differentiate banknotes. We've been working with Samsung on their smart TVs for a number of years now, and each year there's a new iteration of that platform um, and greater accessibility for not just for blind and partially sighted people, but for anyone with a disability, anyone who finds a television experience difficult to use. We've also worked with a company called Storm Interface to build fully accessible kiosks for airport check-in terminals. Interestingly, you won't see any of them in the UK right now because the legislation we have here doesn't mandate it, but you will find them in US airports. Um, we've worked with Apple as well, most recently on their uh, Swift playgrounds and the support materials for that. Transport's a massive area for us. We've been working with Gatwick Airport and Heathrow Airport to enable a smoother and a more swift transition through the airport for blind and partially sighted people. A huge mix of training, technology, understanding, and enabling the whole experience end to end to become smoother and more manageable for people. We've also uh, done a piece of work very recently with Lego that people may have read about, and this is really making Lego bricks, which are uh, featuring Braille, that are encouraging young children to think about Braille as a literacy mechanism for, for blind children, and recognizing that Braille's got a fabulous future ahead of it. So lots of people might be aware of hard copy Braille, but Braille in its hard copy forms becoming a little bit less used, and electronic Braille is taking its place. So a small device that's about the size of a large smartphone, which will Bluetooth to a smartphone or tablet or laptop, and it will enable someone to read through a tactile form and in Braille what appears on the screen of that device. It's fantastic. Um, RNIB and a number of other partners have really changed the market globally on this issue because it was an incredibly expensive medium to work in, and really our ambition there through the Transforming Braille Group was to make that much more affordable to more people, to encourage more people to use Braille and to encourage people to see it as a viable part of the digital communication continuum going forward. We've been working with Sky and the Royal Bank of Scotland and Microsoft. We've had a long history of working with Microsoft, um, being part of their, their advisory group around accessibility. And, and just you know, listening to, to Mike's presentation there, helping to input into some of those fantastic products and innovations that have come about recently, um, specifically thinking about things like dictation and seeing AI, um, and then also tools from other companies like Google, for example, talking most recently about Google Lookout as a tool for blind and partially sighted people. We heard a lot from the blind and partially sighted community about how difficult people find it to choose domestic appliances particularly things like washing machines and tumble dryers. And we were delighted to have partnered recently with Miele, who are a premium producer of washing machines and household appliances. And we've brought to market a product in the UK and in Germany, which is a washing machine, which is using the standard uh, modules, if you like, for the most popular best-selling Miele washing machine but essentially marrying that with an interface that's much more blind friendly. So it includes really good quality tactile interface along with a schema of acoustic beeps that would enable someone to control the device independently using audio beeps at different tones and using tactile controls. Now you might be thinking, 
it's possible to do that using uh, smart speakers like Alexa and Google Now. And of course it is. But what we want to do is ensure that the market offers a continuum of products for people who want the latest, greatest smart controlled innovations to people who want a really simple, tactile, more traditional experience. We believe that both of those things have a place going forward. I want to think about embracing the challenge. And, you know, in terms of RNIB over the past few months during the COVID pandemic, it's been about extending the delivery of all of our services. So every one of our services has grown and extended um, to meet more need and to answer more inquiries. So our helpline is open for longer than it's ever been. It's taken a larger number of calls and inquiries than it's ever had month on month. Every single staff member has moved to home. So no offices have been open. Everyone's been working from home remotely over the internet. Uh, we've been offering technology grants to blind and partially sighted people to enable them to benefit from the kind of technology that you've heard about with a strong focus on school and learning and, and educational inputs, but also supporting local societies and groups of visually impaired people and enabling them to understand what it's possible to do with the kind of technology we've spoken about. And very often I've had a chance to input into that, just to talk to parents, to talk to teachers. Did you know that it's possible to do X and Y with your, your iPad or your Kindle device or your Google phone, for example? And you know, some fantastic stuff that we've all got in our pockets right now, we need to just go away after this event and tell people about. I was thinking about Google Translate, you know, and how much of a breakthrough that really offers. It's also on the Apple platform as of possibly later this week, iOS 14, we've been looking at Translate as well. Um, Ruben, we partnered with Amazon. Ruben, let, let, me, let me interrupt you one second, because we want to fo focus on education. And you know, we know RNIB doing amazing stuff uh, all over for people with vision disabilities. But share with us specifically your, your work these days in the corona crisis, especially when you work on your, on your education. Sure, so um, I mentioned our inquiry line there. We've had a very large number of inquiries from teachers and that would really range everything from what kind of device, what sort of software could children be using? Or, you know, they've often found themselves learning from home as school has closed. In some cases, without even the equipment that they might be used to on a day-to-day -day basis in school. So um, we've partnered with Amazon to make some tablets available to kids and, and to adults to make sure that people have got the opportunity to use devices with magnification with speech so that they can access their, their classroom materials in a way that works for them. We've also launched a campaign called World Upside Down and that focuses on blind and partially sighted children and adults. And it's really trying to communicate the kind of changes that people have had to deal with. So visual indicators, outdoors, social distancing. What does that mean if you can't see where someone else is and you're a young person out and about? How can we enable people to be more uh, vocal advocates, how can we enable people to can tell other people about their needs, whether that's in a learning context, whether it's young people meeting friends or gathering in a, in a location. We've also been delivering training and consultancy online. Sometimes that's been to educators, to schools, to groups of teachers. We've also been inputting into a university teaching course for teachers who are training children with visual impairment. And this is really to make sure that the considerations around social distancing, around technology, um, around access to books. So RNIB has a fantastic resource, if I may say so, called RNIB Bookshare, which makes books and other academic materials available online to blind and partially sighted students. And that has grown enormously during this period because I think people who weren't aware of it previously, as a result of COVID and the situation they've found themselves in, they've had to, to find look, materials that I can get online, that I can access from home to aid my studies. Right. Um, we've also, found, we've also found our talk and support service has increased hugely. We've had a lot of inquiries in relation to mental health and mental well-being. We've been doing quite a lot of work directly to try and promote good mental health, um, using Ask RNIB 
um, on the Amazon platform, well, and also then, promoting self care and positive mental health. Well, ben, we have one more, one more, uh, we have one more question uh, when we have to finish, unfortunately. Okay. So, uh, Deborah, it's your question, the closing caption. I know you can say so many things and we love to hear it, but we will save it for our next webinar. Uh, so, Deborah, please, your question for Ruben. Yes, and, and Robin, excellent presentation. And we're big, big fans of RNIB. I know a lot of the US corporations have worked with RNIB with great results. And that would be my question too. My question would be, how is RNIB working with other major corporations like a lot represented on here to make sure that our education systems are more accessible to students that are blind and have vision impairment and other disabilities as well? That's a great question. Thank you, Deborah. And really, the answer to that is that we are collaborating with pretty much all of the names that have been mentioned today, the major tech companies. And we've reached out really to say, look, we recognize children and young people have found themselves in difficult situations. What can we do collectively? What can we collaborate on that actually breaks down barriers. So if we're aware, for example, of a software barrier or perhaps compatibility with screen readers or magnification, we've made those companies aware of that. Um, but we've also said, look, how can we bring this new world of virtual and blended learning? How can we bring it to children and young people in a positive way? And I think the real trick, Deborah, with this is how can we do that and simultaneously enable people to maintain good mental health? It's a massive challenge. It's a yeah. worry that I have personally, and I think it's something that we want to really get behind mm -hmm. to push as hard as we can and try and do as much as we can to support young people. Right. And I just will also want to make sure that I think that I'm correct on this, but if you'll just valid, verify that I am correct, and then we'll go to the next speaker. But RNIB is not just about supporting people that are blind and have vision impairment. RNIB also supports all of the disabilities when you're working with uh, these other organizations. I mean, that's what I pulled, but I want to verify that. Yeah, great question again. Thank you. So I think the legislative environment and the good practice guidance that we would be guided by and that we often co-create, that has to be pan-disability. What we would say is that we bring a particular specialism around eyes and vision loss and, and low vision. And that's something that we can we can talk with on a with a great deal of expertise, hopefully. But we absolutely have to remember that we we live and we we prosper in a, in a pan disability environment, and that that has to be a central consideration when it comes to working with any corporation or any learning provider. Thank you right. very much. Thank you very much, Rubin. Rubin from RNIB. See you next time. Looking forward. And we have to jump for our next speaker uh, from Dell Company. We're going to hear about inclusion through voice and choice from Snow White, the senior education strategist in Dell. So it's your stage, Snow White. Thank you. Hello, everyone. How are you doing today? Thank you very much. We can see the presentation and hear you well. Excellent. Um, let me go ahead and we'll go full screen here. So um, what I'm talking about today uh, through talking about voice and choice and, and some people have asked, you know, why, what do you mean about inclusion through voice and choice or what is voice and choice? And when we're thinking about education, it's talking about how students are learning and giving them voice on how they want to learn and then also giving them choice on how to show mastery. And what I find a lot of times when I'm working with schools, um, you know, all across the United States is I see the adults making the decisions for the, uh, for the students instead of asking the, uh, the students about, you know, what do you want to see? What do you want to see in a device? What would help you become a better learner? And at Dell, we actually use that same methodology. And when we think about inclusion and diversity is also um, asking the employees. And, you know, what do you want to see and, um, you know, at, at work or what do you want to see for our customers? And so where I wanted to start is just even talking about the resource groups that we have available to us um, at Dell. And what's, what's great about this is that 
these are groups where employees feel like uh, they have a sense of inclusion and it's backgrounds or interests that they all have in common. Um, now, what's, what's great about these groups is that um, for Women in Action, it's something that I'm a part of, but we also have males that wanna be a part of it. Uh, Gen Next, that's actually for 35 and under, but, and obviously I'm not, but I could be a part of that group. So all of the groups are open to anyone who wants to join. It's just, it's really around the interest. And so we have different groups and each one uh, grows as different needs arise. But what I love about these groups is that not only are you able to join and learn from each other and have professional development, but we also use the voices from these groups to work together and think about our design for what our products may look like, what our services may look like, and also gives us information that when we are working with students in education, how can we take these learnings from these groups and apply it um, to these schools? And so one that we have is True Ability, and this is a group of where you may be a parent that has a child of special needs, or maybe um, there is some, you know, you've had loss of sight. So it, it could be a variety of different needs and they're part of True Ability. And, and they've been a wonderful group as we think about what kind of um, developments do we need to see? They've been a great voice for us uh, in developing that product. So I'll go to the next slide that shows some of the things that have come from um, our employees giving voice or even our customers giving voice of what would help them become a better, uh, better at productivity or a better student, um, a better instructor. And some of these things um, are rugged lines. Uh, these were actually, this is uh, created for the military, but we actually see this in a lot of our uh, classes with students that have limited mobility. And so if, the, if it does drop, it does have that rugged case or it was built rugged enough that it's not going to uh, crack or break um, and it can withstand uh, quite a bit of pressure on it. And then we also created design, um, devices designed for students and we have the Chromebooks and the Windows 10 and so they're not as rugged as the ones that we created from the, uh, for the military, but it is still something that if it, uh, if it drops to the ground, we, it, we, get, we do something called a, a torture test where we spray water at it and we put it in refrigerators and we put it in freezers, we put it in fire. Um, we do all kinds of fun things to it just to see how it will handle the elements and how will it handle a student in K through 12. Uh, because we know that a lot of times, uh, you know, we, we see our students dropping it. And even as, as teachers, as educators, we, we drop those. Um, and the wonderful thing is everything that you heard from Google and Microsoft earlier um, is available on these machines. And a lot of times I just tell students and teachers, if they're not sure if that uh, capability is on there, is just do a search for it. So like the other day, someone was asking me about eye tracking software, you know, would this Win 10 uh, device work? And you just go to the search and just type in eye tracker and you can see what comes up. So I always encourage you that if you think that your device may not have a capability, just do a search and you might be surprised what's all uh, included in those devices. Uh, fingerprint readers for folks that do have limited mobility, but they want to sign on to their machine, they can just put their finger on it. Um, the tricolor bat look keyboards um, has large print on it. And so um, this was another one that actually came from someone who's uh, her, her vision, um, she had low vision and so she needed large print. And then adjustable desks. Um, when I first started at Dell, we actually had to do a work order for our desk to be lowered or, or um, raised. And uh, it was a, a really big event. And now we said, you know, we want employees to feel like they have that flexibility and not feel like they need to do this major work order to have uh, their desk lowered or, or uh, raised. And you see smaller ones that we see in a lot of the schools there on the right. And then we have the, the larger ones that we use actually at Dell that's just automatic with a lever. You can uh, lift it up and, and lower it. Um, so for me, I'm four foot 11, so I'm usually lowering the desk. Um, if you're in a wheelchair, it's just very easy to lower. But if you're tall and you like to stand, you can also raise it um, without any major um, pranks or anything like that. And then the other one um, that if you're not familiar with is uh, Toby. 
and they create eye tracking devices and software. And we're start, starting to see them become more integrated into the devices. So you don't need an extra piece of software. I mean, a, an extra device is actually within the device. Our Alienware line, um, it's also used in gaming, but we're integrating that Toby software that can track the eye movement. I'll kind of pause, making sure that, make sure I don't have any questions. Oh, I, I guess we'll, uh, we'll, we'll answer them at the very end. Um, the other uh, piece, oh, and then I just wanted to show you too, as far as the uh, receiving the award. So this is something that Dell is very proud of um, as we build in these um, ERGs and listening to the voice of our employees is, um, is having these uh, awards for, as far as like best technology companies for female professionals. Um, and also we had the human rights campaign, best place to work for LGBTQ equality, um, disability, um, best place to work for disability inclusion, and then also flex jobs, being able to work from your home. If you um, have a setting that is uh, best for you, you can work from your home. Obviously during COVID, we all did, but we've always had that flexibility that if you wanted to work from the house, you, you had that capability. Now, the switch that I wanted to make um, is into esports, And so, um, the reason I, um, if you're not familiar with esports, there is a huge rise of esports in K-12 and high ed. And if you're not familiar, what is esports? It is um, multiplayer video games, and it's played competitively for spectators. And in, in the past, it's been by professional gamers, uh, but now we're starting to see high ed and K-12 uh, start participating into esports. And I know some of you may be thinking, what are you, what are you talking about? This, are these just kids playing games? There's a lot more to it. And we'll unpack some of that uh, about uh, why esports is, is so popular in K-12. Um, but if you're not familiar with esports and how popular it is, here's a statistic for you. This is United States um, football, NFL, um, is a um, very popular um, sport to watch. But esports is right under it. Um, globally, we see these numbers even larger, um, but esports right now, even in the United States, is higher than our baseball. It's um, higher, you know, hockey, soccer. So it is something that is um, extremely popular um, with with a um, you know a, a younger generation. I would I would say most of them are going to be 30 and below, as far as when we look at your pro gamers. So why esports in education? Um, well, one is that it's 70% of the students are already identifying themselves as gamers. Sometimes they're even higher when we talk to schools. Um, we'll see almost 90% of, of a class will identify themselves as a gamer. So it's actually meeting them where they're interest. And what I'm finding is that they're already creating their own clubs. So there was a lot of schools that I talked to and I said, you know, are you, are you looking at esports? I'm like, no, no, we're, we're not going to do that. And then I, when I start asking the students about esports, I find out there's actually organically grown clubs that are happening um, in, in the schools. And then I'm also seeing some schools take the, just like what they see with traditional sports as far as the minimum GPA standards or um, to be um, our attendance to participate um, in sports, they're applying that to uh, esports. Um, another piece is offsetting tuition. So a lot of colleges now are giving scholarships. Uh, you can get full ride scholarships and partial scholarships around esports. And I do want to clarify, it's not just being a player, but it's all the other surrounding ecosystem too. So such as like being a coach or being a, a, a um, physical therapist and other areas around esports. If you're familiar with STEAM, science, technology, engineering, arts, and mathematics, and esports actually have a great fit. So when you start really looking at all the components of esports, you'll find that it does uh, align well with STEAM topics. And then the one, the reason why I'm talking about it today is that it's engaging students who felt like they couldn't participate in other activities, such as traditional sports, um, or they just didn't feel like they belonged in, in other areas. And so what we're seeing now is that this is actually becoming an, an um, equalizer for students that do have disabilities. So 
what's great about esports is that and you, don't, you don't have to be the tallest, and uh, you don't have to be the strongest, um, genders don't matter. And what we're seeing now is that more and more uh, capabilities are coming for um, if you have lost your sight, loss of hearing, um, limited movement, you can still participate in esports. And so just doing quick Googles, you can see all the, or Google searches, you can see all the different uh, articles around esports and uh, folks that may have had some kind of um, loss of sight or, or limited mobility. And it, it's really inspiring to see how they're excelling. And in fact, quite a few have become pro gamers because of the adaptations that are available um, and, and that these can be in schools, um, just like they're using in, in pro. Um, and if, you, if it's something that you are interested in, I would encourage you to look at Able Gamers and they specialize in different um, adapters so that you have, um, it, it levels the playing field when you're playing. And so what we're starting to see now is if you have loss of hearing, there's some vests that you can wear so you can feel the sound. Um, there's an adapter that you can pl plug into the joystick of a wheelchair so that it will plug into an Xbox. Um, there's also uh, different uh, types of um, keyboards, obviously, that you can use as far as the, the colors and the lights. So um, it's something that I would encourage. It's, uh, we're seeing an incredible interest uh, in, in esports um, in, in high ed and K-12. And I just love that it, there's no limits to who can participate um, in this activity. And then if someone is not particularly just wants to be um, a player, what's wonderful about esports is there's all these other areas available. Um, so you may be passionate about esports, but not want to be a player. You could be an analyst with statistics. You could be a shoutcaster. So cool. Have, yeah, so it's all, all kinds of different things. Journalist, web developer, uh, nutritionist. Um, when you think about a pro um, player in sports, when you think, oh, they have an account and they have a social media manager, esports pro players also have these same uh, folks surrounding them and supporting them. And so um, if there's something is uh, that you're interested in, if, um, and I'll give you our website in just a second, but we do have a lot of resources available um, at, at no charge for, uh, for folks that want to get started. So there's an infograph. Uh, there is a playbook. So if you wanted to, how do you get community buy-in? What kind of hardware should you be thinking about? Um, there's testimonials from other K-12 institutions that are implementing esports and how they got started. Um, and then some uh, learning guides for, for coaches. And this is the, the website. So you will be getting these presentations, but this just kind of gives you a snapshot of, of what you'll see uh, when you go there and just kind of expands a little bit more about um, why we're seeing esports uh, in education. And, and something I want to leave you with is that it's not just about playing the game, but when you really start thinking about, about esports, there's the social emotional learning component. There's the digital citizenship component. There's the communication and collaboration component. So all these things that we want to embrace in K-12 already come naturally in, in esports and being the, uh, the best player possible, you know, building that team culture um, and, and working as a team. And all the sports, when we saw COVID happen, when we saw um, all the sports stop, the one sport that continued was esports. So it was, it was really inspiring to see folks continue with that and really excel. And again, it did, and there wasn't the limitations of, of who could play. So I'll end with this. Um, I know our, my time's limited and we're trying to catch everyone up, but um, this was from Michael Dell is that, you know, he, he always says that the inclusion is, it's not um, what we do, but who we are and that it's in our DNA and um, talks about, you know, that it's his goal to make sure we're building a culture that's designed to support every team member and reaching their full potential. And so when folks have a voice, when they are able to express that in ERGs, we bring that to the workplace and uh, so that everyone feels included in, in being a part of our community. Wow, Snow White, uh, it's amazing, Angel, for this uh, webinar. 
you know, say, uh, understanding, you know, in a totally different angle. And um, so it was exciting and we're looking forward for the innovation of accessibility in sports. But Deborah, for your golden uh, question. <laughs> well, I, I agree. I, I'm a big fan of Dale's and I have been for a long time. And I like the gamification because we, that's how people learn now. We're all doing gamification when we're on social media, when we're communicating. And, and so, and the, the digital natives, the younger people in education now, you know, they're being educated they learn from this gamification. So I think it's very exciting um, that you are doing this. And I'm wondering, Snow White, my question is, are you, is Dell finding that as you're trying to support educators as we go back to school, as everybody's going back to school, uh, how, what are some ways that Dell is helping right now with the COVID-19? Because I know you are doing a lot. I know you're supporting refugees too, but I was just wondering what you're doing right now in the middle of the crisis. Yeah, so a lot of our work, so we actually have an education strategy team that I'm a part of, and a lot of our work is just helping schools think about, well, for, or for a while, it's just reopening. What is that going to look like? And again, and thinking through all the constituents, everyone who is coming back, and what, would, what is that going to look like for them? And uh, so that's, that's where we're doing a lot of work. We also have a website, and I'll make sure that I include that, of um, for schools to log in and we had these webinars where other school districts were talking about what they're doing around students with special needs. How do we do formative assessment online? Um, how do we have authentic um, assessments? Um, and uh, really connecting other schools with each other because we feel like even though our team were all former educators, whenever you get to learn from each other is some of the best uh, collaborations possible. So that's where we've been spending a lot of our work and then, and just keep listening. You know, we've been, that's what we've seen a lot with COVID is just listening to each other. And we're doing that too. And, and uh, as you know, Google said earlier, give us that feedback. Dell is the same way. We want to hear the feedback from you all and we build that into our design. So the, the, um, the, you know, the laptops that I was telling you about the windows and Chrome, we built them exactly the same. The OS is a different, but something we heard from schools is like, our kids keep picking off the keys or they keep spilling things on the keyboard. How can you make this so it will be durable for our kids? And when it's at home, now they're using them at home. And so that's what we built that design. And so now you can pour 12 ounces of that drink on your, uh, on your keyboard and, and it's just gonna go right through. So, but that's, that's what we're doing a lot right now is just listening to our customers and our employees, how we can make um, learning better. This is a great message. Listen to people with disabilities, work with them together. Amazing. Thank you very much uh, for this uh, great, looking forward for working together. So thank you, Snow White and Dell. And we're going to another uh, uh, unique angle uh, that you, will surprise you. And now we're going to talk with Donald Morrissey from Huawei, okay? So tapping into abilities. So we're gonna get another unique angle about education by Huawei. So, uh, and I want, before you start, just to remember, remind everyone, all uh, presentations are accessible by Able Docs. We have closed captions by, um, by um, Verbit. And we have sign language by uh, language people. Thank you. So while we, Donald, it's your stage. Go ahead, thank you. You've all, thank you. I'm Don Morrissey from Huawei in Washington and good morning, good afternoon and good evening to everyone wherever you are. Uh, I'm in Washington and it's still morning here. Um, we're very honored, we're very excited and uh, uh, about you've all and Miguel allowing us to participate in this movement to empower and to connect everyone. Um, you may have heard about Huawei in some of the political headlines recently, but to tell you a little about the company, we are close to 200,000 employees. We're the leading ICT infrastructure and smart devices provider globally. I think what the signature about the company is half of our employees do nothing but R&D, and we're active in 170 markets uh, and countries across the world. 
what I'd like to talk about is what is what affects what what this movement is doing in terms of connectivity, where the world is going, where the world is, and where the world is going. You've heard today from very good companies who are actually working in this what we call an intelligent world, and they're moving they're moving their technology, and we're moving our technology forward, which has all sorts of possibilities for connection and for inclusion. We call it all things sensing, all things connecting, and all things intelligent. And that's where the globe is moving, even to, even to the, some of the most impoverished areas of the world. This is, this is the movement that's going. You have, you have set, sensors combined with AI, combined with rapid connectivity, are allowing platforms and capabilities of a scale unheard of, and allows an inclusion unheard of, uh, in the past, and this is this is where we're fo where we're focused. Excuse me, I'm trying to move a slide. Um, Huawei believes, and, and so we look at if you look at a basic belief for the company that everyone has a right to grow, develop, and transform. And our role is is the connectivity that enables this. We call it sort of a learning, uh, you know, a journey of learning. We used to say. Uh, Huawei built the pipes, but we're learning as we have built and been on the cutting edge of technology, the smart pipes, the smart sensors, the intelligent platforms, which we build and provide to customers who provide to their communities. We've learned that we have to do more to identify not just what our business interests or our customers' business interests are, but what their community's interests are, are and what that total community interests are, so not just the business community. You look at the world today, you have nearly 260 million people have no access to schooling in 2018. This affects obviously women, girls, disabled, immigrant ethnic communities. They're usually at a very distinct educational advantage. And if you start at a low bar, COVID-19 has brought some of that crisis to everyone in the sense that 90% of global students were affected by the coronavirus and being schooled at home. And you've heard a lot of previous presentations about how, we're, how technology companies in partners with their communities and schools are dealing with that. If you look at the sustainable goals set forth by the UN, there are 17 goals set by the UN in 2015 to transform our world. In the ICT industry, which is where our business is, there are three critical ways. Increasing access to of information, increasing connectivity between organizations and people, which increases productivity and resources. That's where we work. But to apply this, and I said it was a learning, a journey of learning, Huawei used to say it built the pipes, but we found the pipes have gotten smarter and we helped build the smart part of those pipes. The platforms, the AI platforms, the servers, as well as the terminals at the end, the phones, the laptops, and so we've broken this down meth methodically as a company will do. So how do we help make the connection? How do we help better connectivity, not just with our customers, in their communities? Because as we work to monetize and help our businesses that we serve do connection to their communities, we become more deeply involved in the total community in which they work. So as engineers, we've obviously broken this down into very concrete areas. First, the technology, which is what we do, okay, to make connectivity affordable um, through innovation, through AI, cloud, and mobile, to create digital ecosystems that help developers build applications for different communities, industries, but also more importantly, the, including as many communities as possible from the local communities where these brought, where our customers serve. Then find these skills. We work with local governments, community organizations to enhance the digital skills of everyone in the society. And so, and you've seen some examples of that from these other great companies talking about what they're doing. Um, and so we look at it as technology application skills coming from the basis of the technology where we provide to customers, but we provide to the communities in which these customers work. That brings in the inclusivity to bring everyone connected and at the same time, <clears throat> everyone getting greater opportunity for their own advancement. We focus on we're focusing on education today, and our belief is making you know, the best way we can do that with the business we're in, technology that we develop, is to make education more accessible and more efficient and provide greater resources for, for children or adults, okay, so that you have every individual can achieve their own potential potential. That is the ultimate goal for providing greater connectivity. And I'll give some examples of that. 
in, <clears throat> excuse me, in certain areas, we've created what we call the DigiTruck. And these are essentially shipping containers that are equipped as mobile classrooms for very rural areas. And we work with partners like Close the Glass, Safari.com, UNESCO East Africa, the Kenyan ICT industry. And what these, what these trucks do are for new areas that have new connection, which we have a hand in providing. You know, we, we, we have these mobile classrooms go to where the classrooms are not there now. And this allows teaching digital schools to everyone in, say, a remote area. In addition, there are specific projects like the Women Training Bus in Bangladesh. The key partner there is Bangladesh's ICT ministry, Robia Axiata. Okay, you have buses that are specifically aimed at training, giving training and digital skills to women in rural areas across 60, 64 districts in Bangladesh. Bus? So this a lot. This at to date, our record is that you have about sixty thousand women have been trained with plans to train about a hundred thousand more. The smart bus in Europe is teaching young children in a, in a, bringing a mobile mobile platform that goes through different areas and some training you may not get at home or you may not get in the schoolroom to prevent cyberbullying to teach children how to properly use the internet, this connectivity that's so wonderful that, that they're using to help themselves learn, but also has some fraught with dangers. And so that program is ongoing. One of the other specific programs we, we have developed is called StorySign. And what this does is it takes our AI technology it takes selected children's books and allows you to teach sign language using your mobile phone. Uh, we have about 69 books and it's growing in 14 languages. Um, and to use the app so that parents and teachers and students who are, who are hearing impaired uh, can use this. And are, again, we partner with people in the community. How this works, you get the selected reading book you open your app, you have your app open on your phone, you show, you put the page on the app on your phone, and the avatar we designed signs the story while the app highlights each word that's being signed. This helps children and parents share the magic of the story, but also learn to read and sign together. We think that's an important feature for parents and children. Another project we have which relates to healthcare, but is also related to education in, 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 in terms of preventable diseases that relate to education, specifically with uh, eye diseases. We've developed an easy to use portable AI device that takes non-trained professionals, particularly for areas that lack a high degree, a high density of medical care, to look at very young children, particularly babies, to be able to test them quickly for visual disorders. We have found most medical journals will tell you that there are a lot of visual disorders that impair education, particularly in later life, that if diagnosed very early on um, uh, can, be, can be addressed relatively inexpensively and avoid, those, uh, avoid the impairment of that learning later on in life. We have a big partner there with Dive Medical. One of the key things that Huawei, as I said, we have a journey of learning. One of the key things that Huawei has learned is that as I said, we used to build the pipes, and now we evolved to say we build the connectivity. And part of that connectivity is institutionalizing our relationships, not just with our customers that serve those communities, but directly with those communities. And so what we work together on is we have sort of three models we work with. We join partners projects. If a local provider or a local partner in any part of the world has a project for inclusivity, um, you know, we will join it. We've started our own general program called Tech for All. It ranges from the apps that I just demonstrated to you to actually using our AI projects with our phones to go after illegal logging in the rainforest. Okay, so you have all sorts of applications of this technology that's projects that we run, but also we ask people to join us and then we co-create uh, coalitions and initiatives for digital inclusion for everyone. So we've set structurally with the company and our commitment to the community and our commitment to connectivity and inclusion so that we don't just say, well, we have a corporate social responsibility project and that's just what we're gonna do. No, 
What we say is, what part of the umbrella of technology that we develop, that we develop for customers, can be used to enable and include the community? And we have three or four models where we can both reach out or people reach out to us so that we institutionalize this, this growth of innovation to include all. But I want to emphasize also that Huawei's role, particularly in this whole inclusivity area and connectivity, is still at the backbone. And one of the key areas of our technology is creating connection where it doesn't exist now, particularly in rural areas. One view of this is the rural star, our rural star <clears throat> sort of base station that allows you go to go into very rural areas where there's no connectivity, has its own powering unit, uses, uses the consumption of energy of about five light bulbs and allows you to connect like, like, oil, like oil spots in a river. You know, where you have connectivity where it wasn't connected before and you don't require initially a huge heavy infrastructure that can take years to move out. But you have ink, ink spots or oil spots in the river that allow connectivity where people are gathered, particularly where there is no connectivity. Right now you have 50 countries using Rural Star with about 40 million people globally are connected by that. So we pay attention not only to the most advanced applications of the advanced technology we provide, but still our core mission is to make sure you, you can get there by connecting those people there. And our motto is leave no one behind. Great. Uh, it was very great to be part of this. Great, so uh, as you know already that uh, now is a Deborah time, Deborah's question. Um, so Deborah, please. Yes, and I will answer your question first, Yuval. Uh, I looked it up um, behind the scenes, but Story Sign is in 14 different languages. So, and, and they have, it's, it's free, which I appreciate corporations like Huawei making this free to us. And also it's been downloaded hundreds of thousands. I mean, I, it's like, 50 million it was at one point, I think is higher than that. So, uh, and 90% of parents that have a child born deaf, uh, well, I should 90% 90, 90 of the parents do not speak sign language that have a baby born that's deaf or have severe hard of hearing. So tools like this are very, very powerful for our community. But Donald, one thing that I've learned working with Huawei is how important digital inclusion is. And of course, I know this because I've been working, you know, we, we're trying to support refugees with a lot of the work we're doing as well. And we're going to talk about the next session. But, you know, tell us a little bit more about why Huawei, you know, is so committed to making sure that we have rural connectivity and why that's so important to education. It, well, I think three reasons. One is, one is, if you look at Huawei as a technology company, let's look at self-interest. Huawei is a technology company, is a global company. Um, half, our, half of our employees do nothing but R&D. That's, that's a very highly educated base of workers. Um, you, have to, you have, you know, the self-interest there is to have a highly educated base of workers globally. Global. So you have, to, you have to give every company a, li a little bit of self-interest. But it starts from what we know, and all human beings start from what they know. And what we know is education. What we know is we're able to provide this kind of technology because of the education and the education we prize in our employees. So that's a natural extension. We want to see that in the communities where we are. That you know, it's a natural fit to say, this is what we do and we know the value of the education. The, the, the existence of the company is proof of that. So we want to foster that in every community we can. So it's a very natural fit. And I also want to just congratulate Donald Morrissey because he actually earlier in his career was one of the people that advocated and lobbied to make sure that we passed the Americans with Disabilities Act 30 years ago. So I just have to say thank you. We appreciate you doing that. My family certainly has been a, a very, I had a very small part. It, it, it oh. takes all of us. We're all stronger together, which they, they yeah. prove that at Access Israel, but excellent presentation. Thank you. Thank you, you very much. Uh, Looking forward again for working with you together. I already am going to challenge you to have a presentation on the technical side of this uh, sign language avatar. I know many people are very interested about it. We will do that. We'd be happy to do that. So that's great. And prepare today, but be ha I don't have that, but I'll be, I'll be prepared to do that. Nick, anytime you want, we'll do that.
Yeah, and start sending this bus, the school bus, a uh, training bus to Israel. So we're looking forward okay. to what the <laughs> ship uh, having it. <laughs> I, I, will send a, I will send a rocket to HQ and make sure they get, they get that notice. Okay, thank you very much, Wawi, and looking forward for our next work together. And we're gonna go uh, straight to our next uh, presentation. And uh, this from a, um, a great friend, also uh, helping us this, on this webinar, uh, Lisa Wrench, the CEO of Language People. And we, we're gonna emphasize Language People is doing a lot uh, and is very famous around the world in the States, but Language People, we got, is doing some special work, specifically solution for remote studying for students with hearing disabilities. So uh, Lisa, your stage for the next 10 minutes. So please go ahead. Well, it's not Lisa, it's going to be Fred, Fred Augustine, um, and he's uh, up and ready. Thank you. Thank Sorry, you though, Yuval. Thank you. Thank you. Fred, go ahead. Hello, everyone. Thank you for having us. Greetings of the day. Uh, shalom. I, uh, I'm not really sure uh, everybody's situation in terms of how uh, you got to be on this meeting today. But one thing I think we can all agree on is the world can be a pretty harsh place. Um, you know, in light of COVID, in light of the civil unrest and financial turmoil that we're facing around the world, the population that tends to get left behind the most is those who are disabled, those who have accessibility needs. And so we have a, an international group of uh, professional business owners, um, entrepreneurs, people who have worked in NGOs um, and benefit or, or help to contribute to companies that benefit social good. Uh, and our goal really is to make the world a kinder place, okay? And so I give you kinder education, and that's K-I-I-N-D-E-R. Kinder education, uh, we have a whole suite of projects actually that are under the kinder umbrella from healthcare to um, prison systems, et cetera. I'm, I wanna shed a light right now on the education side of things, uh, especially for the accessible community. A little bit of background though, uh, we talked about language people. Language people is uh, headed and founded by Lisa Wrench and she owns uh, a few patents when it comes to video technology. And I'll, I'll get into that in a, in a moment, but we're leveraging that technology into bringing a kinder environment to how we educate our young and old alike. So we do need kinder learning options for the accessible community. And in light of everyone's time here, I know um, that it takes a lot to, to stay in, in, in the presentation. I'm gonna be as respectful of your time as possible. So I'm gonna try to zip through these slides and hope I can get my point across. So we shine a light, a kinder light, into the overlooked communities, such as the deaf, the blind, um, and also those who are not native speakers of whatever uh, language is being communicated in the content that they're looking at. And so we do have technology when it comes to teleconference software, video conferencing. Anytime you have communication such as this, where you are transferring data, uh, over a video software that actually falls within the confines of our patents. So what we're looking to do is, as you can see on this video call right now, um, just to give you an example, what the deaf, for instance, are seeing is they're having to look for a small block as far as who is the interpreter, where's the ASL, where's the international, and they're having to focus on the information being interpreted to them. Meanwhile, there's all this I don't want to say distraction, but it's not easy to focus on the message. So those are the current problems that we're facing right now, um, especially for the deaf. There's either no closed captioning option, or if there is, it's very small. Um, the interpreter screen, as we covered before, is a little bit smaller. Our solution is a kinder solution to where if you are 
um, deaf, you are actually um, automatically set to view a larger presentation screen of the interpreter. So instead of seeing all the clutter of what everyone else is seeing with all the videos and being able to hear what's going on, you focus only on the information that's being shared with you. Now, of course, you are still included in the conversation and you'll still have the smaller tiles of all the attendees and presenters there uh, on top, but the main focus of how you are able to communicate is going to be front and center for you. Now, this is not going to be the same for everyone, uh, of course. We do have implemented workflows. So what that means is as a user on the portal, you signify that you are deaf. Automatically, the workflow knows that you need to have a front and center interpreter for your experience. If your uh, designation of language was Spanish, then you would have Spanish translation live for every single session that you would have for uh, whatever learning environment that you are a part of. Same thing goes for the blind. You know, some of the current problems, you know, I've got people who um, are blind in my family and, and I know some of the struggles that they have to go through, having to feel everything. Um, and if you're going through a website, you know, obviously we, there are special um, tools and things of that nature that you can maneuver on, online. But if you find yourself um, on a computer that doesn't have those facilitations, instead of having to go to a site and, and having to strain, if you are fortunate enough to, to be able to do that, um, you, you want to have something that actually speaks out to you to let you know what's on the page, to let you know what the controls are. So it's going to have speech to text capability for the blind. You also have uh, interactive voice controls to where you can speak into a microphone or speak into your laptop um, microphone or even your handheld device and tell the, the website or the, the, the portal what you want to have done. And it will facilitate just as your cell phone does for you right now when you're doing automated calling or um, Google Voice, things of that nature. And of course, for non-native speakers, this is a, a, a big issue as well. Um, a lot of times you have smaller class sizes, if any, for people who are not native speakers when it comes to the subject matter being taught. Obviously, a biggie here in the United States is the Spanish language. There are some Chinese dialects as well, uh, Mandarin, Cantonese, that there are uh, second language programs that, that are able to help the students along. When you're talking about remote learning, it's almost non-existent. So we will have real-time translation um, that's actually built in to the software. So just as we have right now um, on Zoom, for instance, we have small tiles of interpreters who are trying to communicate for the deaf and things of that nature, we will have uh, communication for non-native speakers as well. So it'll be translated from Farsi or Italian or whatever the case is from one language to the next. Um, there's many instances where even, you know, when you're talking about face-to-face -face transactions to where you want to set a, a doctor's appointment and that appointment has to cancel because they weren't able to get an interpreter for you. And so now you've got to reschedule and hope that they'll have one next time. That is no longer the case when you're talking about a kinder way to interact. You will not even have your appointment scheduled if there is no interpreter available for you. So it puts the customer first. It puts the end user first. It puts the student first in every single situation. It's a kinder way to transact. So kinder, our motto is one conversation at a time because we're making the world a kinder place one conversation at a time. What makes us different um, is we actually offer live interpreting for every single session. And again, it's within the workflow confines that uh, you set up as, as part of your sign up process. So you're gonna pick your location as far as where you want to have uh, interaction from, where you wanna get a tutor from. We're, we're gonna be offering tutor services. We're gonna be offering um, education platforms. We are uh, working with other uh, classroom management software as well, like Google Classroom, like uh, Big Blue Button is one of them. Moodle is another. So we're gonna have integration with a lot of these platforms that are already in play to help facilitate um, how learning interactive uh, environments are, are facilitated with um, for the accessible community. 
Okay. Now this is kind of a, a screenshot of uh, some, uh, just the, a wireframe as far as how we have our software set up. It's still in development for the most part, um, but uh, we're slowly bringing it to market and, and hopefully within the next uh, two, to, uh, two to three months, we should have a working rendition to where everyone can take part in a kinder learning environment. So as you can see here, we'll have the ability to have uh, the location as far as, and this is an example, for instance, for the tutoring platform that we'll have. You'll get to select your subject, your location. Um, if you have a special need, you can signify whether you're blind or deaf or whatever the case is. You can choose your language. If you're not a language, uh, a, a native language speaker of, of who you're reaching out to. Once you select your items here, uh, you'll, you'll have a list of tutors in the area or available um, facilitators for that subject matter. It'll be alphabetized and of course you'll be able to see them through their ranking system. Everybody has ratings now, it's a big thing. Um, and we don't want to deprive them of that experience. So you can see who's ranked the highest. You can see the number of students that they've tutored in the past. You can see their schedule, their available schedule, their credentials, um, and, and help you to select the best tutor for, for, for you at that point. Now, of course, once you select somebody, you can choose an available slot in terms of time slot, what's, what's best for your schedule. So on the flip side, as far as the tutor or the educator on their side, they're gonna have an administration portal. So you can see the call schedule of what classes you have when, who has signed up for those classes. Um, right now, um, there, there's not very much in the way of integrating with scheduling software in terms of some of the education software that's, that's being used through remote access. Ours is gonna have it already built in and it is going to integrate with um, Google Calendar, with Outlook and things of that nature. So it can all be one merged view. The nice thing also is our platform is going to allow for multi-role logins. What does that mean? Well, if you have a teacher who works at a school um, and that's kind of their full-time gig, you'll have uh, the ability to log in and see that environment for that school and see what's happening in terms of the students you have, the curriculum, et cetera. If you want to volunteer some of your time and, and tutor um, for maybe another organization, you can log in under that role and it's gonna show you a separate environment. So even though you are the same meta user, it's gonna allow you to log in and be able to manipulate different environments so you can essentially keep things in neat little boxes and you can set up your, your, your workflows for that as well. So this helps to uh, mitigate some of the chaos associated with remote learning right now that we're all going through. Um, so, um, you know, we don't have all the answers, but we do find that if we find a kinder approach, that if we put the student front and center, if we address the, the issues that are being faced by teachers all around the world of how to get the interaction they're looking for, how to better get an assessment of if a student is getting the subject matter, if there's something else that is a barrier, this will help to find out what those issues are so that we can um, get together with more um, plausible solutions, okay? Fred, Fred it's uh, amazing to, uh, to hear about Kinder, your mission, your strategic approach, your community approach, and especially emphasizing uh, on full accessibility and, uh, person, and personalization, which is a unique approach. So we're looking forward for this uh, amazing approach, amazing, amazing project. So I'm, I'm wondering, leave enough time for you to answer the Deb questions of today. So um, uh, Deborah, please. Yes, and, and I'm just making sure the audience gets to um, ask questions. And so uh, I know that Catherine Ott asked a really good question, but Talia did as well. So Talia was asking you, um, where do you find the settings that you were mentioning You were mentioning, and are they easy to find? Um, she said, also, I don't have to be blind. I can have dyslexia and use these settings. Are they organized by disability? 
And then uh, Catherine has a few questions. Once again, we can't get to them all because we're, we're behind already. So, um, but she did ask, so I'm going to just see if you want to answer both of these at once, Fred. Um, do they have, what's the vetting clearance process for the interpreters you use? Do they have security clearances for sessions that require it? Once again, we're going to get to all the questions, even if we can't do it right now online, but um, there, there's two for you, Fred. That's th those are great questions. And the answer is everybody's going to have their own login as far as the user portal is concerned. So right now you've got different links. Every time there's a new meeting for Zoom, you've got to go to a different link. I didn't get the meeting for this. I didn't get the meeting for that. With our platform, you're going to have one login and you're going to see every single interaction, every single meeting that's there. So there's never a, a concern of what meeting you have to be in, first of all. Second of all, when you go into the portal, when you sign up for the first time, you're going to choose um, your preference of language. You're going to choose the disability that you've got. Um, you're going to choose the controls. So it's going to, you're going to be able to facilitate meetings based on the selections that you have. And yes, it is very easy to find. Um, it, it's a very user-friendly interface that, uh, that shows you only the information that you need to see. So you'll be able to choose if you have dyslexia, for instance, um, and, and the system will know based on the workflows of how to orientate your screen. Um, if you're gonna need speak to text um, functionality, things of that nature. So it's going to know um, the best learning environment for, for you based on how you fill out that user profile information. Now, as far as the, um, the provider, the educator, there is some vetting process, but we don't take the onus of of doing the vetting process ourselves or the credentialing, for instance. Um, when you have an organization, the organization administrator will have the responsibility, of course, of vetting all the, the, the providers or the, the educators that, uh, that are associated with them. Now, that being said, there will be um, a section that shows the credentials, that shows the circling of the tie, et cetera. Um, so, that will be set up in the profile for each of the educators. In fact, they will not be able to even uh, initiate the education part or to start teaching until their profile is properly filled out. And it will give them a, uh, it'll give them a, a gauge in terms of how much of their profile they have left to go before they can start teaching. So we wanna make sure that we're having people who have some type of standard when it comes to teaching, especially for a subject. There's a, a few platforms out there for freelance software, things of that nature to, to volunteer like Fiverr and things like that. You have to take an assessment test to, um, to see where you are in a certain subject matter, to see your proficiency of a language, things of that nature. So we're gonna have something similar for this platform when it comes to the educators that are coming to you, educators that are available. Thank um, you. I hope that answers the question. Thank you very much. Uh... A great presentation. Looking forward for Kinder, the new uh, accessible remote learning. Uh, so looking forward to your two or three months uh, uh, launching it. And uh, thank you again also for Lisa and language people. And we have to go fast to our next speaker, uh, which um, is an amazing one too. Uh, I don't know uh, how many have heard of uh, uh, Brad Turner, who is a vice president and general manager of global education and uh, literacy at Benetech, which is also Bookshare for those who don't know. And we're going to hear from him amazingly about using software. Uh, or accessible content, key to inclusive education. And so I'm gonna jump right through, and Brad, please uh, go ahead and take the, take ahead. It's That's great, thank you very much. Um, and good morning from California, and that means it's good afternoon or good evening in other parts of the world. Um, thank you for, thank you for inviting me here, this is a, a really stellar lineup of speakers and and um, a, a, a nice a nice group of folks that are watching. Uh, Benetech is um, a, a different type of technology company. We we are a nonprofit tech company 
to serve uh, social good with technology, scaling, scaling solutions for social good. And, and my group is the Global Education Literacy Group, where we believe that access to information is a fundamental human right. And, and I know Don from Huawei had, had some, um, some human rights as well, including education. Um, we use technology to, to drive lasting social change so that everyone can learn through education, but, but education not for education's sake, but education to also help them find a job and pursue their dreams. Um, and and when, I, when I start thinking about this, I really wanna start with the end user. And, and here's a few realities. 75% of the children with disabilities in India and over 35% in Africa do not attend any educational institution in their lifetime in their lifetime. For students with a print disability, 95% of all content is unavailable to them because it's locked in printed form. Um, and, and then you, you add things like a pandemic on top of that, um, where of course you recognize that people with disabilities are among the most marginalized globally. But I saw just the other day, UNICEF put out a number that said 463 million students around the world do not have access to remote learning. And, and, and so, of course, a, a, a big portion of that are students with disabilities. So, you know, there, there, are, there are many, many challenges to remote education. And, and the speakers that, that you heard today really can address a lot of those challenges and, and really are working to help educate these, these students. Bookshare is our most known program um, it's, it's the world's largest library of accessible books for people with reading barriers. Uh, we've talked a lot about blindness um, today, but, but we support people who are blind, who are low vision, who have a learning disability, most likely like dyslexia, um, or a mobility impairment. If it prevents you from operating a normal book, meaning you can't see the book, you can't hold the book, or you can't decode the book, you can qualify for for Bookshare. We partner with libraries around the world. Um, hello to Robin from RNIB, that's one of our great partners. Um, we partner in Australia, we partner in um, uh, Canada, in Ireland, uh, and, and we have members in 94 different countries. Our books are produced in audio, in what I like to call ebook karaoke, synchronized text and audio. Um, where the word highlights as it's read to you. We also generate books in eBraille uh, so that they can go into a specialized accessible technology device, assistive technology device called a refreshable Braille display or even put into a Braille embosser uh, for hard copy Braille. Uh, Microsoft Word because it's a fantastic screen reader format, especially if you're trying to annotate um, a document or annotate a book for taking notes. And then, of course, in EPUB format, which is the industry standard publishing format. Um, we also allow people to read on any commonly used device, a phone, a tablet, a computer, uh, assistive technology device, um, a, a, an MP3 player for, for low resource environments. So really our goal, and it's this last bullet on the slide, we want to provide any book, any time, anywhere in the format that you want on the device that's in your pocket. It's, it's, it, there's, there's no reason that someone with a disability should have any different access than someone without a disability should. Um, and, and in a lot of places, what's interesting is that we are exceeding the access for people without disabilities. So Bookshare offers about 600,000 books in Africa. Um, where sometimes those books are, sometimes that number of books is not available to people without disabilities. So, so let me shift over to a couple numbers. We've delivered over 17 million accessible eBooks over the last 20 years. We have over 800,000, now pushing closer to 900,000 Bookshare users in over 90 countries. And one of the ways we build our collection is that we work with over 900 publisher partners who, who give us content and then we take that industry standard um, publishing format and we convert it into other multiple formats. So our, um, you know, 
800,000, almost 900,000 books are now available in five different formats. So it's really close to 5 million reading options, uh, depending on which book you want and which format you want it on. And we have books in 47 different languages. We don't translate, but we, we get books from all around the world. And so we have books in 47 different languages in, in the collection and growing. Um, and then, as I mentioned, we partner um, with folks and, and we power 15 national libraries around the world. Um, and that number is growing as well. So we're really trying to build a global network of accessible material for people who uh, need help accessing that information. Now, I would submit that 20 years ago, um, converting a book like uh, let's Harry Potter or The Little Prince was kind of a challenge. The, the uh, optical character recognition was uh, accurate, but not super accurate. I would also say that that challenge has largely been solved. If you, if you hand us a book that has chapter titles, page numbers, and a table of contents, um, and a lot of text, that book is, is essentially 100% accurate in Bookshare. Uh, and especially since we get so many of those types of books from publishers, leisure books, um, uh, trade books, um, we, we, but we also get STEM textbooks. And, um, and, and so while text is easy, STEM, or I like to call it STEAM because it's science, technology, engineering, art, and math, that's challenging. Um, you have, you know, math equations, you have chemistry formulas, you have charts and graphs, you have drawings and art in, in, on the right side of the screen, you see a picture of the Mona Lisa. If you are blind that you, you don't know when people start talking about the Mona Lisa, if it's a cartoon character or if it's the most famous, uh, work by one of the most famous painters in all of history. Um, you have chemistry formulas and and, um, and, um, and diagrams. Like on the top right, you see the chemical formula for caffeine. Um, so all of those those um, non-text items are are very challenging, including math. And and I know uh, Mike earlier in the session today talked about a lot of the things that Microsoft is doing for math. And in fact, the roots of this next project that I want to talk about. Um, are, are based on some work that we did very, very early in a hackathon with Microsoft. Um, so that, that when, when we look at, when we get a book in from a publisher that has a lot of these types of elements, um, the, the quadratic equation um, or you know, charts and graphs, a lot of times those things come in as images. And so let me shift over to this and say, Here's something that we just pulled out of a, a math book where um, on, the, on the top left of my screen here, for each of the following linear equations, sketch a graph and label the y-intercept. And then there's a couple different uh, equations there and then determine the degree of each of the following polynomials. Well, when we get that book from a publisher or even when that book is um, scanned under, under a copyright exception, this is what the reader experience is. Heading level two, determine the degree of each of the following polynomials. List two items, image, image. Heading level two, determine the degree of each of the following polynomials. List two items, image, image. I played that twice so you could hear. The second part of this page is, is asking, asking you to determine the degree of each of the following polynomials, and yet it doesn't tell you what the equations are. It says image. Image. Those equations come in as images. Up in the top right of the screen, there's something that says uh, T parentheses E equals S parentheses T. As a, as a um, standard book reader, that would read that as test. But if it's a math equation, it should say T open parentheses E close parentheses equals S open parentheses T close parentheses because it's a math equation. How about the thing below? It's a date depending on if you're in the United States, that's March 9th. If you're in the rest of the world, that's September 3rd. But either way, it's 03 slash 09 2020. Is that a math equation or is that a date? So what we've done is we've embarked upon a project to use artificial intelligence to really lean into math. 
if text is easy, let's make math easy as well. And so um, we're using AI to, number one, find the math in math books. And remember, not every image in a math book is actually math. There's a picture of a man standing on a diving board with T equals zero at his feet and a dotted line to T equals question mark in the water. And the, and the word problem is, how long does it take the man to reach the water? That's not something that we can describe using math equations, but it's an important uh, part of the math book. So if I come over to this, again, the same part of the uh, second page, what we've done is we've identified that there's math in that page, and then we have, we have taken that math and we've transcribed that automatically into accessible math. Take a listen to this one. Heading level two, determine the degree of each of the following polynomials, list two items. F left parenthesis x right parenthesis equals fraction start, x to the four over x squared, and of fraction minus 3.5 x to the 1.5 plus 0 0.85, math one of two. F left. Okay, so, so, if I had 5,000 equations in a math book and I had to manually transcribe that, my student wouldn't get that book for probably two to three months. With the automation that we've built now, and, and with, it's in test, and so you'll see this start to roll out, roll out over the next few months, but I can convert that book in probably a day. And so all of a sudden, what that does is open up the world of math to students who in, and in many cases, especially in developing worlds, aren't allowed to learn math past eighth grade because the materials aren't there. So, that, so they're not allowed to take math classes. All of a sudden, we can convert math in many, many, many different um, um, uh, um, aspects of math, whether it's uh, algebra, whether it's calculus, whatever it might be. We can convert these books uh, in real time into accessible formats using technology. So in, in my book, accessibility is the great equalizer. Of course, uh, you know, we all use technology, screen readers or this ebook karaoke or audio is certainly technology. Um, you know, braille, uh, smart speakers, so, you know, the voice user interface, optical character recognition also uses some form of artificial intelligence. But but then you go into a little bit more um, advanced things like, of course, recommendation engines, which we're all used to for from Netflix and from uh, Amazon, places like that. But but let's go into non-text transformation, uh, math expressions, using artificial intelligence, computer vision to convert graphs into accessible. I, it gives me a description of a graph. Um, natural language processing. So our, our goal is to have technology make information accessible for all. Um, you know, there are many other things that I could talk about, but I kind of wanted to lean into the, to the math piece because it's really groundbreaking what we're doing here. And, um, and it's a critical, critical portion of education, especially um, in, you know, 2020 and beyond as, as technology becomes such a big part of our educational system. So again, thank you very much for your time. Brad, amazing, amazing this, uh, what we heard before from Microsoft and now from you about being able to make a Steam with an A a more accessible and automatic, automatically accessible. It's amazing, amazing news. And we would love to you know, do another webinar more, t more for tech guys, more for to, to deep down to learn how it's really done uh, behind the scenes. So Deborah, uh, please, uh, your golden uh, question. <laughs> Thank well, you, Brad, thanks. <laughs> Thank you, and Brad, great presentation. And you did mention math, but we were told, us parents and people, people advocating for people with disabilities, we were told we can't make math accessible. We can't make maps accessible, and yet, now we are doing that. So I was just wondering if you could elaborate just a little bit more, especially because once again, society was thinking we could not make these things accessible and then we did. So um, I was just wondering if you would explore that a little bit more. Yeah, ab absolutely. It's so 20 years ago, you know, 25 years ago, we said, hey, we can't make text accessible. Um, and now Bookshare, if, if you hand Bookshare and, and 
an e-text book, a, a book with, with just text in it, it's accessible in, it's, it's in the collection within an hour. Um, and so we're starting to push the boundaries of other, um, of other aspects of that. And so math, of course, is the first one because that's sort of the universal next, the universal STEM topic, if you will. Not everybody takes physics. Not everybody takes art history. Almost everybody takes math. And so, and so that's the first piece. But, but, but with, our, with this conversion engine and using machine learning and neural networks, some of, some of these advanced artificial intelligence technologies, what, what we believe is we can start to extend this into um, other aspects of STEM. So math and then into chemistry and into physics and into some of the art topics. Um, and, and in fact, we believe that within the next few years, the technology will be available to add alt text or long descriptions to all of the images in a book. Now, let me, let me pause before people get too excited. I believe that context is incredibly important there, that the author knows why they put that picture in. If I'm showing you a picture of a pen, is it that um, it's because I wanna talk about the pen as a writing implement, or I wanna talk about the pen as a tool that I fidget with? Context is super important. If we can get authors and publishers, and we have a program that we're working with publishers to build books accessibly in the first place, we call it our Born Accessible Initiative. If a book can be born digital, it should be born accessible. And that way it's the same book for everybody. But until that is a reality for every single book published, libraries like Bookshare will be around converting. And, and, and that means we need technology to continue to advance the art of the conversion so that more than text, all of the steam topics are available as well. Thank you very much. Uh, amazing. We have so many questions to ask, but I'm sure we're going to do a tech, uh, more tech webinar specifically. I'd love to do it. Thank you. Because uh, it's amazing, both of the, fun the functional way and the usability of it, but also how it's really done behind the scenes. So Brad, keep on the, the great work that Benetech is doing. And it's uh, great to have you with us. So thank you very much. And we will jump to our last uh, uh, speaker for the technical for, for the technology technolo technology part. Sorry, and is uh, also our sponsor. Um, it's Able Docs, and Adam Spencer, uh, also is a global leader. And if, if you don't know, is uh, the leading company in the world of uh, making accessible documents. And uh, so Adam is gonna talk about preparing inclusive classroom for accessible boardrooms through document accessibility. And so uh, we're looking forward for this uh, presentation. So Adam, thank you again for both sponsoring the webinars and also uh, sharing with us your knowledge, uh, your great 20 years knowledge about making documents accessible. So your, your speaker is on. Thank you, Val. Uh, really appreciate it. You can hear me okay? Perfect. Super. I actually, when I signed on to this webinar, I was actually in a car and I, I'm hoping I didn't make anyone motion sickness as I was going along our tremendous highways here in Toronto. Uh, great to have uh, everyone on board and, and pleasure to meet all of you. Um, one of the things, as, as you've all mentioned, I've, I've been in PDF accessibility for a, a very long time and AbleDocs was founded to really push the boundaries of what we can do with PDF accessibility and, and you know, hearing all of these great speakers talking about a push for technology is such an important part of what we do and understanding the transition from education into the real world and recognizing that accommodation not, is not necessarily always available. So getting people and authors to understand how to make content more accessible from the start is really a big part of what we're doing in higher education. Um, I've been working with probably over a thousand higher educational institutions over the years and, and getting them to understand where the gaps are in, in producing accessible content. You know, we still see challenges with publishers producing accessible or even digital uh, access to text. Uh, which makes the job that much harder. You know, we get stuck in things like 
uh, copyright requirements where we've got educational institutions scanning in textbooks, debounding textbooks, trying to then accommodate a student on a short turnaround, which really isn't a sustainable approach. It can be done, but it's not the best way forward. I know we don't have a lot of time today, and if you ever have any document accessibility questions, please feel free to reach out. Oh, let's go slide transition. There we go. So a typical approach is a reactive one. Uh, organizations will have an accessibility or an accommodations office recognizing that students need to uh, have barrier free access to technology or to content without really understanding what's involved. And we've seen a varied approach uh, across the world uh, in well, we've worked in 48 languages from do we do this in advance? Do we have everyone creating, you know, in, in our case, tagged PDF um, to make that that content more accessible? Or do we skin that down to a plain text document so that it's readable out of a, a piece of adaptive technology? Where I come from, it's either PDF UA or the universal accessibility for PDF. It is an ISO standard. It's been ratified by over 50 countries. Uh, and it's really the, the mark of whether that file is accessible or not. And this isn't just for screen readers. And, and one thing that you have to remember is PDF isn't dying anytime soon. Over 2 billion PDFs were added to the internet last year alone. Uh, and that's the public facing internet. That's not including files that were either internal to organizations or behind firewall or behind password protection. So when we talk about preparing people for the real world, it's really important to me as a as kind of a personal mission and for us at AbleDocs, to get PDF technology to be as accessible as possible. And there's a, there's a lot of great work that's going on. Um, I, I still can't believe that I'm fighting for a format and there's still format wars and I'm not just pro PDF. I believe that every format has a place. Um, it, we really need to look at how that content is presented, how it's going to be distributed and how someone is going to better interact with it. I think that, that last presentation from Brad was great talking about math. Uh, we work in MathML constantly to try and push the limits of what it means to be accessible and moving away from checklist accessibility. Oh, look, I passed all my testing tools versus is this actually usable? So we see a, a whole bunch of, of curves when it comes to accessibility and higher education is often in, in the US in particular initially sued for physical accessibility access ramps and elevators. Then we move into an OCR complaint or the Office of Civil Rights where a student is being discriminated against for their disability. Obviously in Canada and Europe and other parts of the world, the disability um, or accessibility legislation is there to be proactive. And, and so where I live in Ontario, Canada, we have some of the most uh, stringent accessibility laws in the world. Any organization employing more than 50 people must post all content to be fully accessible and compliant at the time of publishing. Otherwise, they're, they're contravening the law. Then we see organizations push into website accessibility. Great, let's make sure our website's accessible. But we forget that a huge amount of content is locked into PDF files. And converting that into HTML makes no sense whatsoever. I once got yelled at uh, and was accused of being a liar when I said at a conference that we had tagged a, a thousand page textbook and the, this person yelled at me saying, there's no such thing as a thousand page PDF. And I said, well, that, that's just not true. In fact, we've tagged a document that was over 250,000 pages and the concept of a 250,000 page document being converted into one long scrolling web page just made my head spin as bad as the PDF was. But we're dealing with a reality of what these documents are. And we talk about author intent and expectation of how content is going to be navigated. And EPUB is a great format, except no organization outside of education is publishing EPUB on a regular basis. They just aren't. It doesn't fit into the workflow. And that's not knocking one format over another, but we've got to be re recognizing that strict accommodation in lower education helps learning early on, but we're not preparing students for the real world. Telling a bank that you need to provide me my bank statement as an EPUB form is not going to happen. It just won't. Um, the, the amount of time that it's going to take versus the investment that's being made into making document formats accessible like Word, PowerPoint, Excel, uh, PDF 
is a much more sustainable approach because that's how most authors are creating content. So why is document accessibility so hard? I always get told uh, HTML is just easier. Um, and the answer is it can be, but most professors, for example, have no idea how to write a web page. Um, most professors barely can get to a computer and type up a quiz. We see so many handwritten quizzes that are coming in or, or tests that are being requested at a last minute, trying to make sure that they get through their material. And how do we accommodate that for a student with a print disability? When we're able to start looking at that document cycle, publishers are, are providing more and more access to at least a digital textbook where we can add document accessibility after the fact. Do you have a center of excellence internally? You know, we train our staff internally for six weeks before we put someone on a basic public facing file. And so many people are running around because accessibility really is now seen as kind of the Y2K for those of us who are old enough to remember. Um, everyone was all of a sudden an, an, uh, a Y2K consultant and we're seeing that in accessibility. Uh, unfortunately, the, the way that, that accessibility lawsuits have proliferated Everyone's popping up saying, I'll train you in a day. And you just can't learn accessibility in the same way. And document accessibility in particular, great website accessibility comes from great website design. Nobody goes to school to learn how to, pe how to be a PDF engineer. I've looked, there are no classes for this. Uh, it's really an extension of, of an additional code set. So we expect companies like Adobe or Microsoft or Google to be better at, at creating a PDF. And the reality is, that's not their business model. And, and what I often find is we live in an accessibility bubble and that's not a bad thing, but we have to be aware that we are a small minority. The majority of the world doesn't think about document accessibility or website accessibility on a daily basis. That's not a good thing, but that's our reality. So trying to get people to change their mentality overnight into making all of their content accessible can be a challenge. So while you bridge that gap, Rely on the expertise of others. Rely on what tools can make content more accessible. Today, there is not one authoring environment that can generate a fully compliant file. It can't be done. It doesn't matter what you do in a Word file, PowerPoint, Google Docs, um, or InDesign, you will not be able to generate a fully compliant file to work across the board using different adaptive technologies. So often in North America and Europe, we hear that people want it to be JAWS accessible or NVDA accessible, or will it work with voiceover? And just hearing content, making it convert into speech is not generating a true accessible experience. You have to understand how people are going to consume the content, not just can I hear it? When you look at a textbook, for example, and we talk about a thousand page textbook, which is obviously commonplace, if you have to read from beginning to end through that document, you're going to be lost. If, if a professor tells me that I need to start reading at chapter 17, which is in 400 pages deep of a textbook, I'm not going to start at page one. And without having true accessibility, I'm going to have to, I, I can't have the ability to skip to that section. The semantics, you know, we talk about tags in PDF or the buckets of content that help people understand section breaks and the, the uh, implied meaning of content. This is a heading, this is a list, this is a table. We've seen guidance trying to strip out complexity from documents, which was really a hack. It was trying to make an export from Word into being something more accessible. But the reality is Word can't even export a table with row headers. We have these limitations and that's not a knock at Microsoft at all. It's just, that's not their business. And so we have to look at tools that can do it. And there are tools and I'm not, this is not a product pitch at all, but there are tools that can generate fully compliant content and recognizing where the shortcomings are from the big software brands, recognizing that we want to have a completely inclusive uh, experience with our reading and without building in that semantic markup, a user will just get lost and confused without even getting into complex content like, uh, as Brad recommended, Steam, which I love adding in the arts. So what are my options? We've got to look at how content's being authored, who's responsible for the accessibility. We've seen uh, schools put that onus on the professor or on the teacher and it has fallen flat on its face, unfortunately. 
And that's okay. Don't blame the teacher for not understanding accessibility. Make sure they're aware of it. Are you going to have a center of excellence within your organization? We've seen schools do it with great success. Arizona State, for example, has an amazing document accessibility center, but they have their limits. You know, people are finite. Um, we have the largest remediation team in the world. We still have our limits. You know, if you sent me a million pages of content, probably not going to be able to finish that this week. But you've got to understand where are your capabilities in-house versus external. And there's no pro or con for either. There are just limits and, and you've got to understand what they are. Budgetary limits are a huge one. Unfortunately, we haven't found that money tree where uh, we have unlimited money to make everything accessible from the word go. But finding that balance between creating accessible content, using tools that can do it, validating that content, are you sure that that's accessible? In the United States, for example, it is common practice to have uh, lawsuits brought against schools costing millions upon millions of dollars. Do you have any idea how many pages of content can be made for the same amount of money of one lawsuit, let alone all of the suits on the school? Understanding and having the conversation with experts at least puts you with a foot forward that helps you understand where are you exposed, where can you be successful? Where can you be sustainable? And that's a big part about accessibility. And I've really uh, tried to impress upon people that need for sustainable approaches for accessibility is what will get us to be truly barrier free in the world. So knowing where that, that line in the sand is, am I doing this internally? Am I doing this externally? Two minutes. And the pros and cons. Oh, sorry, Yvonne. Uh, two minutes. Thank you. Good, th good thing I, I'm trying to find that balance between talking too fast versus uh, not killing the interpreters and, and the, uh, the closed captioning. It's always that gap. You're doing so again, <laughs> thank you. knowing that balance, do you have capacity? Do you have budget? Is this something that you can sustain over a long time? What we see internally is organizations obviously have turnover. Schools that are using students, students graduate. So you can, you've got to start from the beginning to get those people trained up again. So just remember that when you're thinking about building your document accessibility strategy. The circle of life for document authoring, and I love Lion King, I will admit it publicly around the world apparently on this webinar, um, but recognizing that we have this transition of content. How often is content being refreshed? Can you reuse textbooks that have already been made accessible? There's a great uh, organization in, out of Georgia that's trying to leverage that, but so many requests we see coming in from multiple schools because the publishers aren't sharing accessible content across the board, we have to re-remediate it. Otherwise, we would be stuck in an accessibility lawsuit. It's, it's a really frustrating thing. Understanding how students are going to interact with the content and how often they're going to do it. Keeping a repository internally to the Office of Accommodation or Accessibility is really important as well. Remember, not all documents are created equal. You know, the old apples and oranges. Is this a simple memo? Is this a simple test? Is it an interactive form? Is this complex content? What authoring environment is it coming out of? Is it built in Word, PowerPoint, InDesign, Google Docs, uh, Sheets, and self? Or is it coming out of InDesign? And your, does your graphic designer really understand what accessibility is? The number of times we see documents, don't worry, our designers have gone through this and they say it passes every checker. I can spoof a checker in an instant. I can tag every single page as, a, as an image, put my alt text as quote space quote, and it will pass. But do you actually have an accessible experience for that user? And the answer is no. If we're truly considering accessibility, we need to make sure that that content can be used by a multitude of, of different print disabilities and reading experiences. And it's not just, does it work with a screen reader? Screen reflow is incredibly important across multiple devices. And a fully accessible PDF is just as accessible as a fully accessible web page. When we see these posts saying PDF isn't, isn't uh, accessible, that's from people who don't really understand it and don't understand how to interact with it or don't understand how to create that content. Ask the experts, we're here to help. And it's not something that we even charge for, just ask. Using the right tool for the job, make sure you've got the right software generating the right content or the right people on the job. And don't forget, ask for help. The cool thing about this industry and accessibility, we're all here to help each other. Uh, and I am always happy to answer. You've all done. No, it's, it's, it's such an important... Did I get it? 
<laughs> yeah, it's great and great presentation and such an important message to all to understand that it's a win-win situation. Do it right. Uh, accessible information is important. Do it in advance. And uh, uh, so uh, great tip, great path you suggested to our listeners. And uh, Deborah, your, your final question for this lecture. Yes, and, and I will just give a shout out to Adam because um, my my company is actually partnered with Adam and um, and this Richard uh, was reminding me on text of the time when we sent him an emergency, you know, one night and um, which you shouldn't respond to emergencies, but he did and he was so good. And, and I think that what's really important and with the points that Adam was making is that I hear all the time in the States because we do sue each other and we're gonna to continue to sue each other because people are not taking this seriously. Education, we've seen great corporations today, but you know we're still not seeing accessibility and disability inclusion taken as seriously as I would like it to. So I thought it was a good point where you were talking about how all the stakeholders need to work together. But I often see signs that say we're fully accessible, we're using US language, section 508 compliant, when all that they're doing is maybe doing an overlay and ignoring the rest of this complication. I mean, the PDFs have to be accessible, all the documents, all the different moving parts. And I was just wondering, and of course, I know your answer, you talked about it, but do you continue to see that as well, that people think all they have to do is put an overlay on their website and they're done and everything's fully accessible for us? You know, it, it's something that has been um, kind of a, a stake in the heart of those of us who truly care about accessibility and, and seeing the, this overlay approach, look, people looking for the easy button. And the reality is accessibility isn't easy. That doesn't mean it's impossible. But we have to recognize that trying to overcome something like a, a, a Section 508 complaint or an EU complaint that we're seeing uh, starting to happen now with the deadline coming in, in the end of September, this, this approach of, yeah, yeah, don't worry, we've taken care of it, we got this little button and we only pay, you know, 50 bucks a year or something, that is not accessibility in anyone's definition of the book other than those organizations. And it, it really gives a disservice to the people with print disabilities trying to interact with that content. It, if you make a, a website accessible, it really shouldn't cost any more than building a great website. It shouldn't take any longer, but you have to know who you're requesting that work to be done by. And, and asking the questions in advance really help us overcome it. We see so many organizations, and I cannot tell you, there is going to be a wave of back against organizations that are looking for that easy button with the overlay, or we've seen it in, in documents with a QR code that has no structure. How do you read a bank statement without any structure? How do you understand the relationship of content between uh, blocks of text without structure? You can't. And, and I think that the companies that are trying to take that, um, that broad brush of, of oversimplifying simplifying accessibility. Just give me a plain text document. I can read it. That may work for one person's reading experience, but it doesn't work for all. And we need to start with the most accessible approach possible, fully accessible websites, fully accessible documents, and recognizing that we can export to 28 different formats in one click. If you have a, a preference, it's one click because we're starting from an accessible place. Thank you very much. Uh, and I just want to say that uh, it's not about only accessible documents in websites. Uh, people with disabilities can ask any uh, a service giver for accessible documents. And we're talking about schools today, about education, we have uh, exams, we have uh, working materials, we have a lot of things that should be accessible. And again, I want to thank uh, this part for Adam again for uh, being a partner, sponsoring all the uh, presentations are being uh, accessibly by Able Docs uh, for you to see and uh, watch. So thank you again. And I'm closing this session, this part and going to the third uh, uh, part, saying two things. One, thank you, when, uh, thank you very much for Deborah Rue uh, for Global Impact that uh, worked with me in this session and all their help. I think we, we had a good time and hopefully we had some good questions. 
And the second thing that I want to, uh, you know, to say that you keep thinking about it. Imagine a world where all things will be done accessibly in advance, okay? Think about this. This is the main goal of ours to the future, being making the future tech era accessible in advance. It's smarter, it's, uh, 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 it's less expensive, and it's a, a, a more accessible for all. So thank you very much, Deborah, Adam, all the speakers, and uh, Michal, I'm passing it to you. Michal? I'm here, ready. Thank and you. Very, very happy. First of all, again, thank you, everybody. And I, and, and I must say, guys, I want to first of all thank Richard, our sign language interpreter, uh, for doing really an amazing job. Um, and uh, um, uh, we are really appreciating uh, your assistant, Pam. Uh, I, I think she's not here now, but really, thank you very much. Um, uh, now, in the schedule, I was supposed to talk now about uh, uh, this ecosystem that we have. Um, but I'll tell you the truth, because we really want to uh, be on time. I think that what we just viewed, what we uh, just witnessed in the last four hours, four hours, guys, and I've been receiving texts saying, uh, oh my God, I can't go to the toilets. I'm afraid to miss something. Are you sure you're going to send me a recording? So this is the best uh, response that I'm having. And what I want uh, uh, to tell you guys, really, for those of you who are with us for uh, 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 several uh, years already, and for those who just joined, this is what it's all about. To hear amazing things. We are doing, you can, you can take into account that people are doing great stuff all over. But if we don't share the information, if we don't bring it together, if we don't correspond, if we don't connect, the fact that we're doing great things all around the globe just means that people are going to waste energy in trying to repeat the same great things that you are already doing. And we can just you know, fast forward it and have everybody on the same spot, or at least close to the same spot. So this is what the network is all about. And uh, I'm urging you again, I know that some already uh, signed up to the website, really sign on to the websites, answering uh, all the questions that uh, uh, were asked about, about the recording of the presentation. Sign up to the website. We are going to post the recording for uh, this webinar and the previous webinars uh, on the website uh, and everybody will receive a message saying that it is on there. And all the presentations from uh, those uh, uh, speakers who are sharing the presentations will be, of course, accessible by AbleDocs and then uh, uh, uploaded. So we will have it and then we can start the ripple effect. This is the network. This is what it's all about. So again, thank you very much. And now the third part, we handpicked and chose amazing um, uh, speakers that are not necessarily technologies and are not from governmental uh, officials. They are just amazing practices, innovating practices, uh, um, uh, great speakers that are going to share with us again case studies that are worth repeating are worth learning from. And the first one um, uh, that I would like uh, uh, to introduce here is actually four speakers from New York City. They assured me that they, even though there are four speakers, they are going to uh, um, uh, be on time and we are trying to uh, stick to timetable. And I know they're going to be very interesting after talking to them. New York experts sharing innovative practices on teacher and parents training and encouraging inclusive remote social meetings with students. I'm happy to introduce Lisa Nielsen, uh, a senior director for digital literacy and inclusion at the New York Department of Education. Laura Ogando is the project manager for digital literacy and inclusion. Ruchika uh, Chopra, I hope I'm uh, not mispronouncing terribly. Um, uh, he uh, serves as the director of the Office of Inclusive Education of District 75. That's the same district that um, uh, we were introduced before that brings together uh, kids with disability special needs uh, in New York City. Uh, I saw them in action in an amazing yoga session in a, in a stadium in Staten Island, and it was really uh, a great inspiration. 
and Jose Rios Lua, the Director of Family Empowerment and Communications for the Division of Specialized Instruction and Student Support. New York gang, go for it. And I think, Jose, you are going to start us off. <laughs> yeah, sorry. Uh, it's always the, the, the issue with the mute button, right? The, the epic <laughs> fight with the mute button. Thank you so much, Michael, and thank you so much for everyone for having us. And yes, we're excited to share some of the things that Deputy Chief Academic Officer Fodi shared with you all this morning. Um, I'm going to go very briefly uh, with, with the beginning section of this. Uh, give me one second while I hit the start button. All right, because I have a timer and we promise that we'll, we'll spend the next 20 minutes with you all uh, as, as efficiently as possible. So today, here's a quick breakdown. We've even broken it down by the minute, Michael, so we'll, we'll, uh, we'll stay with it. But just a quick breakdown to reiterate some of the things that DCAO Fodi said this morning. In New York City, we have 1.1 million students, of which three, over 300,000 are students with disabilities and uh, 25,000 are in District 75, which is our district of special schools. Um, and it serves, uh, it serves students with um, severe needs. Um, I've added some links here, and when you all have access to the presentation afterwards, you'll be able to click on these just to give a more um, uh, overview of, of the landscape of education uh, in, in New York and in, in uh, the U.S. So part of this is the uh, our, our, our website, schools.nyc.gov, the special education section, uh, the section on the website that the DOE has around accessibility, and then of course, just some general uh, United States uh, common terms, uh, the Individualized Education Program, uh, the IDEA, the Individuals with Disabilities Education Act, and then the, the big one, uh, FAPE, uh, a free and appropriate public education for students. But I really wanna set the tone off today with, with one of our students, Josh Stern, uh, who is one of my buds. Uh, in the summer, I host an internship with students with disabilities in the special education office. Um, and they get to come and share their insights and work on policies. And, and so one of the things that Josh was particularly uh, passionate about this last summer was accessibility. And so he created a video to talk about why accessibility is important. And while uh, Josh is talking about physical accessibility in his, in his video, I think it translates so well to digital accessibility as well. So I wanna just set that tone and let me know if you cannot hear the audio so I can figure something out. We, we don't hear the audio. Ha, ah, I, knew, I knew something would be, would be going on. Um, let me- But there are captions, which is helpful. <laughs> um, let me switch to, let me take my headset off and see if that will help because I don't see on a Mac computer how to share my audio. Um, we, hear, we hear some, yes who has attended, is attending, or will be attending a school has an enormous amount of potential. However, when a student's basic needs are not met, like entering a building, using an elevator, or having access to an accessible restroom, there is no way to fully focus on education. These things become distractions, and students become focused on how they will get to class, use a restroom, or even how they will enter a school building. Accessibility benefits everyone. By putting an accessible restroom in a school, not only are you improving a student's educational environment, you are also improving the community around the school. By having that accessible restroom or a ramp, you are also empowering parents with strollers, elderly people with walkers, and small children that have difficulty with stairs. The bottom line is that accessibility doesn't just make schools better, it makes education possible. And so now you all see why I needed to share that video to start off our presentation. Uh, Josh, is, Josh says it so beautifully. He wrote the script himself with very minimal help from us, but he says, it, he says it really important. And it's really important for all of us to understand that accessibility doesn't make education better. It makes it possible. Um, so 
And so that is that is the the framing that we go into today's presentation around digital accessibility. It's not if we make accessible uh, remote learning possible for students with disabilities. It's how we make it possible uh, for students with disabilities. So I'm going to kick it over to my colleagues in the Office of Digital Inclusion, Lisa Nielsen and Laura Ogando. Thank you so much. Um, I want to start with a little background and also just share that our office also works with Josh Stern as well, and he's been a great student voice and advocate for creating accessible content. Um, so if you could move to the next slide where the whole mission of the Department of Education is equity and excellence for all. And in order to do that, we have to create content that is digitally accessible. So if you can move to the next slide and um, the reason it's important is not only because it's our mission at the Department of Education, but it's also important because it's the law. Now there's a critical deadline this year imposed by an agreement between the NYC DOE and the US Office of Civil Rights. And our previous speaker was talking about these sort of um, agreements and settlements, and we are in one at the department. And because of this, it's actually a great thing because we are um, in the largest accessibility initiative in the United States right now. And creating accessible content is absolutely the right thing to do. But if we don't, there's a lot at stake, um, which you'll see on the next slide. If we don't comply, as you heard with our previous speaker, can result in the loss of billions of dollars in federal funding. A formal complaint can be made uh, not only against the New York State Department of Education, but any individual school. It also would result in negative publicity and more. And for New York City Department of Ed, sites that are not accessible by December 2020 will need to be taken down. And this is really important because as you'll see on our next slide, 20% of our population has a disability. So accessible content helps everyone with a range of disabilities access that content that's important to them. And also, as you'll see on the next slide, 50% of the families in New York City speak a language other than English at home. So not only do we help uh, people create content that's accessible to people with disabilities, but we also help them create content that is accessible to people for whom English is not their first language or who are gaining their literacy skills. So to address this concern, if you'll move to the next slide, our office was created and it was established in 2019 and it's, our office is called the Office of Digital Inclusion and our work is to educate, empower, and evaluate. We educate staff on the importance of making digital content accessible to everyone. We empower staff to create, use, and provide inclusive content and we evaluate Department of Education websites and other digital content. I spearhead that work serving as a senior director of this office. And with me today is Laura Ogando. She is our program manager. And one of her primary responsibilities in this role is training and support. And we believe that all staff must know how to make accessible content, just like they must know how to create content that does not have grammar or spelling errors. So with that, I will turn it over to Laura. Hello. So as Lisa said, um, I've been providing many training sessions to our over 150,000 staff members and educators on how they can make their content accessible. So um, we've created more than a dozen classes on website accessibility, and that includes offerings like Introduction to Digital Accessibility, which is a basic understanding of accessibility, and then leading into more specific topics like testing website accessibility, writing for effective translation, and video captioning. Um, these classes were available face-to-face, -face, and now we're offering them via live webinar or even on demand. Uh, and now that we're utilizing so much remote learning, it's not just websites that have to be accessible. That's kind of where our work started. Uh, but now we're realizing it's obviously all content. So we have a learning path with classes like Word, PowerPoint, uh, PDFs, and more. And once participants complete the path, they receive a certificate, which you'll see on the next slide. Um, this is an example of what they get and you know it allows them to proudly display that they have achieved a level of mastery of some of these accessibility skills which we really champion. 
Um, but when the class ends, the support does not. As you'll see on our next slide, uh, we have numerous online communities where we and our colleagues support each other, and that's really, really key. So among them are a community for school webmasters, a community to support all staff with digital inclusion, and a community where staff can connect directly with our education partners like Microsoft, Google, and Wix. Um, but it's not just about creating, you know, accessible content. We also need to measure that. We, we need to have a set system for how to assess this. So the NYC DOE follows the Web Content Accessibility Guidelines for websites, also known as WCAG. We have nearly 2,000 sites that we need to ensure are compliant. And that means that they're perceivable, operable, understandable, and robust. Um, so what we've done is we've also shown uh, on the next slide uh, how schools can use tools like the WAVE Web Accessibility Evaluation Tool to measure their website. Um, you can also use the built-in tool on a website such as eChalk. Uh, the guide shows folks, again, how to make sure that their content is actually accessible. Uh, but we can't do this work without uh, the principal's compliance checklist. So we ensure that schools meet the compliance requirement by putting this as an item on that compliance checklist. This is a list that all school principals must comply with and compliance officers check to ensure that they actually do. So our checklist item has principals attesting to the fact that they've one, assigned a webmaster, two, that the webmaster attends at least three hours of training annually, and that the webmaster will remediate their website to make it fully accessible. In January, we launched report cards, which scan six pages of each website using that WAVE tool from WebAIM. A score of five means the site is fully accessible, and a score of one means it is inaccessible. The average NYC DOE school website is scoring a three, which is right in the middle. Um, you can see a sample report card on this slide. Now our work uh, is <laughs> before we get to December of 2020, we need to move all schools over to that five, which is that fully accessible rating. Um, but as I mentioned before, it's not just websites. So we're also measuring how to do this with our other digital content. So we teach staff to use each platform's built-in checkers. On the screen here, you'll see Microsoft, one of the most accessible platforms, as you've heard earlier from Mike Tolson. Um, we tell them that checking for accessibility is just as important as checking for grammar and spelling issues. So we teach them how to fix those errors so that all of their digital content is accessible. Now I'm gonna turn it back over to Lisa to wrap up this portion of our presentation. Thank you so much. So that leads us to our partnerships with technology companies and we partner with what we call the big three, Apple, Google, and Microsoft. Um, if you can move to the next slide, the, there's their logos. We, we don't partner, as was brought up earlier, with Adobe, but that's not our choice. We would love to be partnering with them, but they have not been a, a great accessibility partner, unfortunately. Microsoft has been absolutely amazing. And I, Apple, Google, and Microsoft provide accessibility training to our staff. And um, also, as was mentioned earlier, what we're really looking for with Google is to push them to get an accessibility checker built into G Suite, just like it's built into Microsoft. So I really hope that comes up on their roadmap. And then we also partner with a variety of the website platforms that are used at the New York City Department of Education. And uh, the way we develop these partnerships is I just wrote to each company individually. And if they did not respond, I tweeted to the companies asking them if they cared about accessibility. That did get uh, the attention of all of the partners that you see here. And we kind of put them into three groups, super partners, partners, and non-partners. So our super partners go above and beyond in providing training, partnering with us, with us on our projects. They participate heavily in our online communities and they have or are in the process of creating built-in accessibility checkers. And then our partners also are great. They provide training. They generally participate in the online communities and hopefully they are on their way to develop built-in accessibility checkers. And then we have two website platforms that 
uh, intentionally and explicitly did not want to partner with us. And those are Squarespace and Weebly. So we do um, ask schools to pick a platform other than that because they will not provide um, support or training in helping to create accessible content. Um, so I think, I hope that we've given you a good idea of the landscape of New York City, background on how we came to be, how we're training and supporting staff, how we measure and evaluate success, and how we partner with companies. Now you'll learn a bit more about students and inclusion, as well as tools to learn from home. So I'll turn it over to Rachika um, from the Division of Specialized Instruction and Student Support. Thank you. Hi, thank you, Laura and um, Lisa. Um, Jose and I will speak briefly about um, how our students during this remote time have been accessing um, social networks to be able to speak to some of the work that they've been doing over the years. So one of the exciting things that we do in the New York, in New York City Department of Education for the last 10 years is that we partnered with Parents for Inclusive Education to do uh, what we call the Inclusive Education Student Summit. And um, over the years, we've kind of brought these students together to talk talk about um, why they think uh, inclusion is important, why do they think that all learners should be part of classrooms and why and how they can build these communities. Um, next slide, Jose. I just want to say before we move on to the next slide that the, the, it's important to note that this event is a partnership with a nonprofit a, yeah. a parent advocacy group. And I think that when we're talking about inclusion, um, those, those built in communications, we, the DOE doesn't do these, we don't do these things in a vacuum by ourselves, we bring in community partners to build in relationships. Uh, so I just wanted to share that. No, that's great. And, and those partnerships have been extremely powerful in letting us guide us through these times of COVID. And one of the things that came from it was um, instead of doing it um, in person, of course, this uh, spring, we met with these students again after they came back after doing the work that they did last uh, during the 2019 20. 20 school year when they came back um, and we did a virtual event with them, um, which brought together so many more families and staff than we had ever been able to access. And um, during this remote learning time, we were able to hear from students across the, across the city as to why uh, being in an inclusive environment uh, during this time of, of being by yourself, how inclusivity was so much so much important and so uh, necessary. So here's an example of what the what the expo looked like. This is, it's just a screenshot from our team's meeting. And here I put a, a, an arrow to Josh, who you saw earlier in the presentation, and he was presenting to us about prayer professionals. And so you can see the captions, you can see his, his deck, and you can see his camera in the team's meeting. Uh, the important thing, and I'll move on to the next slide, and Richard can talk a little bit more about this, but the important thing to know is that the Inclusion Summit is an opportunity for students to come and learn about inclusion. And then the Inclusion Expo is an opportunity for students to come back and teach us what they did, share with us what they did in schools to advance inclusion. And, and they so that's where this. Go ahead. Yeah, and they good. continued. No, no, and they continued that conversation even after both the summit as well as the expo. And we used Flipgrip to help us through that, um, where students posted their uh, their presentations other students commented on it um and we continue to oh, and this is a learning from this year that we've had that we hope to continue over the years now is to build this virtual environment because we were because there were so many voices that we weren't able to reach before that this particular environment actually was able was able to guide us through and so here are some of the past topics we won't read them all you all you'll all have access to this presentation afterwards um, but the other thing that's amazing is uh, we also did our uh, Disability Pride Parade uh, visual art contest virtually this year. And so this is something that Ruch and I, Ruch and I also worked together on. And um, in 2015, New York City uh, started having a Disability Pride Parade. And so we then decided to launch the visual arts contest to create uh, uh, a poster for the, do, for, the, for the DOE's involvement in the parade. Um, so I'm just going to click through these really quickly. But and our theme this year has been nothing about us without us, which has been a common uh, uh, phrase for the disability rights community. But so in the effort of we moved into uh, remote learning, the parade was canceled and our reception was canceled. So what we ended up being able to do, which was actually kind of amazing, is we had a virtual gallery uh, for students that had that not only students can click through, but also had audio descriptions of the arts. 
Um, and so if, so you could listen to what's on the art. You can, you can feel like you're going through a gallery space. Um, anything you want to share on this, Ruchika? Yeah, I think this, just, this I just, is my favorite part. I know. And I think it was, it was, it was one of the highlights of the, of remote learning um, were the, these virtual events because we got to get to hear from the students in the middle of, um, of a pandemic um, about what they thought was important. And in this particular, in, in the gallery, they were able to represent how they thought of the theme, nothing about us without us, and how uh, pivotal it was in, in their understanding of just life in general, um, and the way how they saw the world and how they see schooling um, as a whole. And so in this particular social gathering of the gallery, when we, they were listening and watching the, the student artists, other students were able to pose their comments and and their thoughts around this very important topic and i know we're running up uh, up on time but i want to spend just one or two more minutes um on one of the things that has been super crucial for remote learning and that's providing families and parents at home with the tools that they need to facilitate education and so um i've added a link and you'll have access to these links as well of some of the resources that we quickly pulled together christina shared in the morning that overnight we mobilized to, to create resources and so that is that is absolutely accurate so we had resources for different therapeutic services so to support physical therapy speech therapy occupational therapy we uh we built a partnership with a get ready project to create a yoga based uh curriculum to get uh, students uh with and without disabilities uh to uh get ready for the day and uh, transition the mind into a learning mode and get ready to learn is actually uh, uh, in uh, many of our district 75 schools um, so it's it's built and it created with students with disabilities in mind um, so so there's that we also created the beyond access series which is a YouTube channel now um, where we we record our one-hour webinars um, around topics around special ed, uh, special education, and share those directly with families. Uh, we actually have the next Beyond Access series tomorrow, and we're going to be talking about uh, what families can expect in September, going back to school, um, and, uh, around the provision of services with special educate around special education. So, with that, I know that was a lot of information very quickly. Um, but I want to thank you all and thank uh, my colleagues, Lisa, Laura, Ruchika, uh, for joining and uh, sharing some information about what we're doing. Very top level information about what's going yes. on in New York City. Okay, listen, I, this is the part of my job that I hate because <laughs> I could just sit here and hear more and, and ask more questions. Um, uh, it was fascinating and we definitely want to see more on, on the website and connect you and ask the questions. Uh, I wrote in the comments here that uh, the whole idea of the network is duplicating um, amazing ideas is okay to do. And, uh, and, and I definitely uh, uh, see maybe a collaboration of uh, not just a, a banner choice design from kids in New York City, but maybe we'll extend it and have from various countries and, and choose like the best top or, or most amazing top with 20 uh, um, uh, uh, designs from all around the world. Let, let's hear the kids, let's see what they create. So great idea, I'm writing it down and uh, uh, really, really uh, inspiring. Uh, now, I must tell you that first of all, I witnessed the yoga uh, thing, as I said, in uh, Staten Island, amazing, amazing. Uh, it's still on my checklist to start yoga after that. Didn't get to that yet, but, but it's really, uh, it was inspiring to see the kids there. Um, uh, and I'm totally with you on the training. I mean, Israel in general and Access Israel specifically, um, uh, training is a very, very important part of the Israeli accessibility laws. Uh, in, here in Israel, it's mandatory for every service provider and teachers also to have an annual training. Uh, so definitely a lot of corporations can come about from this. And I'd love to learn more from you and share with you what is done here. Um, uh, and I think that one of the things that we saw throughout the day in various uh, uh, lectures here and in webinars from the past is that the COVID took out something very interesting. You were talking about community partnerships. Um, um, and, I, and I think community and governmental partnerships have flourished in a way in many countries during this time. And I think this is something we definitely have to encourage. Uh, great. So our next speaker, uh, have I thanked her enough? Uh, well, Deborah, there, were, uh, there was a list of interesting uh, uh, things that Deborah could talk about. 
We chose one of them, uh, but I'm sure that we can include you in the next couple of webinars on the other uh, uh, exciting topics. This time, Deborah Rue is going to speak about supporting of refugees with disabilities to receive accessible digital education during COVID-19. Deborah Rue, thank you very much. Thank you, Mikhail. So I'm going to share my screen. And first of all, I want to thank my, oh gosh, okay, there it is. I want to thank Nabil Eid on my team for helping me with this presentation. He, um, he has spent a lot of time supporting uh, refugees with disabilities and there's so much work. I also want to say that I know that we're over time, so I'm going to really do good. I'm going to do really hard to stick to my time, but my slide presentation is way too long. So what I did, what we did, so I'm not going to talk about that, but one thing that we did, we always like to make sure that if we're going to do a presentation that it's helpful for you later on. So even though there's 19 slides and I'm not going to cover all of the data, we did it so that it's helpful for you to take back and maybe use the information. So I'm not going to cover every single thing. I'm just going to give you the highlights so we can get to the points. But the numbers continue to grow with our refugees. We know there's 79.5 million people that are forced to leave their home. They are identified as 45.7 internally displaced, which means they're displaced within their own country. And then 26 million are refugees. They had to leave their country. There's estimated 30 to 34 million children um, below 18 years of age. Every day it's growing by about 44,000 people every two seconds, a man, a woman, a child are forced to flee from their home. It's really, really scary. It's also very important to note that before when people were refugees, hopefully they were only refugees for a few months, a few years, but we're finding that on average, people spend 17 years in refugee camps. So we have to educate people. They are living their entire, their entire childhood, in some cases, in refugee camps. So we still have, because of this crisis situation, we don't always have as much good official data about disabilities as other um, thoughts. But of course, as you're fleeing from a really bad situation, it is going to cause more mental health problems. It's going to cause, um, you know, we're finding girls are vulnerable being dropped out due to sexual harassment, child marriage, gender discrimination. Um, children with disabilities are frequently overlooked, denied school, hidden sometimes, discounted. Um, the migration journey, that this horrible journey causes more people to become disabled, have things, mental health issues like post-traumatic stress disorder, and PTSD shows up years and years later. So we, the, the best estimates are that 1.9 million of these people are living with severe disabilities. Um, today, there's around 3.7 million refugees that are um, not in school. And in the United States, we were told that 40% of children were denied, were not able to access the virtual, um, the digital schools when we first went home with the pandemic. And so it, this, the, being a refugee just makes this crisis more and more uh, difficult. So I'm not going to cover all of the statistics only because I want to be conscious of our time, but we provided it because we thought it would be helpful for you if this is a topic that you're interested in. So there's international conventions that provide for the rights of refugees, including our CRPD, the Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities, and each country's laws. But despite this, we see the research that the educational experience of refugees, it all varies depending upon which country, wh what your host country is. Um, we also know that education is the best way to protect and empower these people and to make sure they live their best life and they're able to, um, to really contribute to society. But we have to close this educational gap. We have to make sure that we're doing a better job. And I'm not just going to tell you the negatives. I'm actually going to tell you some hopeful things towards the back of the this. But 
there is a lack of education for children with def, um, with disabilities in refugee camps. Um, once again, there's cultural barriers. There are families that are reluctant to report um, a pre-existing disability because they're afraid that they're going to, you know, they're going to lose their immigration status or other things will happen to the family. Uh, they are very worried about stigmatization. Um, there's lots of language barriers. Um, and once again, different cultural beliefs um, about disabilities, depending on where your host country is as well. So what these people are are dealing with, it, it's just chilling. It's, it's really, really terrible. And once again, we as society need to do a better job. We need to do a better job of adopting human rights models instead of only looking at it from the medical model, which we still see happening all over the world. Um, the discrimination, the isolations, the low expectations, the prejudice, the cultural misunderstandings, all the stuff that we see with people with disabilities are only exasperated by um, being a refugee. And then once again, the lack of knowledge. So we've talked all during this, um, this wonderful, you know, day that um, Access Israel has given us about how important it is for us to work together, come together, include all the stakeholders, look at this at every single level, because this is very complicated. But we do have a lack of uh, inclusive, basic infrastructural, we are not in infrastructure, um, providing reasonable accommodations or adaptions to make sure that they can continue their education. Um, I believe in some cases it's a lack of political will of really wanting to do the right thing by these people, um, including um, making sure our teachers are prepared, they have the right resources, the right, you know, funding. So there's a lot of work to do. Um, the UN is doing great job. Of to continue to remind them what the key, the key principles are for inclusive education, social protection, consciousness raising, control and capacity building, participatory, participatory decision making, accessibility, and two-way accountability. Um, and to promote education inclusion and make sure that we are, once again, the intersectionality of disabilities so important. Uh, looking at a student's gender, their skin color, their ethnicity, their sexual orientation, their language, their religion, all these different things continue to be to cause widespread discrimination, but then you go into the refugee camps and it's even worse. So very, very important that we work hard, to make sure that these children have um, access to education because this is how we change the world. If we educate these people, they can really make a big difference in the world because of the experiences they've had. Um, many of the refugees with disabilities are already facing um, additional challenges and um, they don't have the, the, just the basic needs. Um, it, you know, so in a lot of this stuff we know. So once again, I will make sure I'm gonna get to the, um, some of the solutions we're seeing. So of course, COVID-19 is just making things worse. We all know that. Um, the pandemic has exposed all kinds of gaps from connectivity, clean water, sanitation, housing, transportation, employment opportunities, and they all, all of the stress has a direct impact on these children, children with and without disabilities and their ability to learn. So we need to make sure that we are following the things that we already know, that we have to make sure things are reasonable. Braille and textbooks, materials, um, accessible products. Um, we, we need to focus on some of the biggest barriers we're seeing, connectivity, portability, language barriers, cultural barriers, and then situational disabilities. Because in these situations, if you have a disability, it's going to be exasperated. Um, and I believe Adam said that it started with physical disabilities first and then moved into digital accessibility issues. And that's what we're seeing. We're seeing, you know, they, they don't have ramps, entrances, it, you know, not following laws. But education for all, we really need to have a call for action. Support policy planning, data collection, access to inclusive education, support our teachers and strengthening partnerships and elaboration, and engaging with the host countries. 
but let's talk for a moment about some of the things that we're seeing. So we talked about, uh, while we talked about their digi truck and the digital truck bringing ICT skills on refugee camps. Dell mentioned having solar powered labs. Those are incredible. Um, Dell also has four AI powered tools that help with free legal aid as you're trying to figure out how to adjust to your new life. If you, uh, you know, if, you want to at some point move out of these refugee camps, mental health support, employment support, what do you wanna do? How do you get there? And once again, connectivity. Um, one thing that we found with the United Nations, the United Nations found before when they would say, what can we do to help you as refugees? People would say, we need clean water. We need, um, you know, we need to food. We need clothes. The first thing they ask for now is Wi-Fi. We need good Wi-Fi because most of them, even when they fled, they might have some, even it's older technology, but they know that if they have access to the internet, they can actually work themselves out of some of these problems. Uh, for a few other things, and I apologize to the interpreters for speaking so fast, but um, Google has helped, um, they, they have spent $1.4 million helping re refugees with um, helping over 800,000 of them with access to the internet, virtual information, education resources. Microsoft has artificial intelligence for humanitarian aid, which is $40 million being used to support uh, the teachers and the students with um, free resources, education, um, and classes on digital literacy, digital acting, the digital act, on coding um, and the UN agencies like the UN HCR is collaborating with a lot of these large, large corporations. I also wanted to make a note of one Sesame Street. Sesame Street is 50 years old in the United States. And you know, we've been learning many, many, uh, we've been learning a lot. My children learn from Sesame Street. So they started working um, with refugees around the world. Um, it, began, it began as an experiment in television and became a global world uh, model for early childhood education. The project was launched um, in Syria, Iraq, Jordan, and Lebanon. Um, really rethinking how do we train children with and without disabilities? How do we make sure they have the education they need so that they, they can thrive and they have a hope for a better, um, a better life in the future? I think there's a lot that we need to do and um, corporations are stepping up, but organizations like Access Area Israel is also supporting it. It's gonna take all of us to change these things, but um, there is some promising things happening, including recognizing what these people are walking. So I know I talked really fast and I apologize. Deborah, thank you so much. It was fascinating. Again, I would give this a whole hour uh, and I'd love to learn more. And more importantly, I'd love to see how we can help and how we can uh, cooperate to, to assist in this matter. Um, uh, but amazing, amazing. Okay, guys, we are, thank you for- Mikkel, I always say one I would say one more thing. I'm so sorry. Uh, there are some real experts in this, like including one that already left, David Baines and Nabil Eid, they, and many, many, many more. But there's a lot of work being done. But gosh, there's a lot more to do. So, okay, Mikkel, I'm going on mute. Perfect. Uh, thank you very much, Deborah. Um, and now we're off to our next speaker, all the way from Brazil. And I must say that we have a lot of Brazilians uh, joining in today. Um, um, and we're very proud to have Mr. Pedro Prata. Uh, he's going to talk about inclusive hyperconnection, accessible information in the forefront. He is the coordinator of Escola de Gente, Masters in Communication at the State University of Rio de Janeiro. Um, there's more, more, more uh, amazing uh, titles and, and things, but I'll allow you to uh, see him directly. Uh, thank you very much, Pedro. Looking forward to what you have to say. Hello, everyone. First of all, I'm going to share my screen. Is that okay for you? Not yet. And now? Is that okay? Can you see that? No, we can't <clears throat> see. Try again. Um, While you're doing it, I'll say hello to Claudia. I see her joining. Hello, Claudia. <laughs> Great seeing you. 
Mm. Here you go. Now we see it. Perfect. Well, I'm very grateful, grateful to Access Israel for an invitation. And I would like to thank Zero Project to our partner for years and everyone who is with me in this panel, especially my friend from Brazil, Rodrigo Mendes. First of all, I feel the need to describe what's on, this, uh, on the screen. I am a white and light man with a short brown and gray hair, black glasses, a bird and a black shirt. Behind me, a white wall and a painting. I am using now a presentation. And the first slide, there is a very colorful globe with a background on the, and the title, Inclusive Hyperconnection, September 2019. The next slides have a frame on the same colorful style. In the white center, there are expressions and phrases. Describing what is on the screen is a measure of accessibility that costs no money and that can be used by anyone. Well, first of all, let me introduce the, the organization that I run. Escola de Gente is a non-profit organization based in Rio, Brazil. We carry out projects across the country and we have already been to 19 countries. We have two major fields of work. The first one is the implementation of training projects. We use different strategies such as workshops, tutor shows, webinars, seminars, books, and other kinds of activities to train young people for an inclusive society. The other field of work is the advocacy work. It is very important. These two work areas feedback daily. They are fundamental for our work. Our actions are always for everyone since we were created 18 years ago. No one can be left out. Everything we do, absolutely everything is with total accessibility. Our seminars, for example, always count with total physical accessibility, sign language, live subtitles, audio description, even with tactile, tactile sign language for persons that are blind and uh, deaf at the same time. We have books in nine accessible formats. The shows of our theater groups are the first in Brazil and probably in the world fully presented with all accessibility. We have sign language interpreters from the entrance of the theater. Our videos are always produced with sign language, audio description, and closed captioning. Every activity at Escola de Gente is a complete experience of how the places and all the products in the world should be. That means accessible to everyone. And it is because this experience that we managed to arrive at this solution that I'm going to present here today. Well, um, everything we do is based in two rights. They're basic, very basic rights, but they are violated every day and almost nobody cares about them. These two rights are the right to communication, to communicate, and the right to be communicated. Simple, isn't it? But how many times have you seen these rights disrespected? And for these two rights to really happen, we need to practice communication under two ways accessible communication and inclusive communication. And they are different things. Accessible communication is that communication made with all the necessary resource for all people to be able to, to communicate. They are, as you know, the accessible features. They are urgent and fundamental. Inclusive communication goes beyond that. In addition to be fully accessible, it is a communication that respects human diversity. 
It is a communication that knows that every human being has the same human value. Last year, we immersed ourselves in a fully digital project for the first time. Based on our experience, Brazil has a growth of accessible culture projects in recent years. But this created a new challenge. Culture producers started to offer more accessible culture activities, but persons with disabilities do not know how to research these activities. There was a frustration in both sides. That's why we, that's why we created Venka, an application that is a platform on which culture producers can register and publicize their activities. And on the other hand, persons with disabilities or anyone can search and find activities. We researched a lot, including the product at Zero Project Awards, and we did not find a similar product in the world. And this learning, and this learning made us think and create the concept of inclusive hyperconnection. The world is increasingly hyperconnected, but is this hyperconnection for and with everyone? Do, we do not want to, with, I'm sorry, we do not want a hyperconnected world that includes, that excludes people. We want a world with inclusive hyperconnection. When the pandemic arrived in Brazil, we all had a great a great scare. We are countries of crowds. Everything here in Brazil always brings a lot of people together. We are the country with the best, the biggest part in the world, the carnival. We are the country of football. We are, we have beaches. Uh, our beaches are always crowded of, of people. We have the largest music festival in the world. Even our political protests are immense. It is not uncommon to have 3 million people in the same avenue in Sao Paulo. This need to bring people together happened even during the pandemic. Brazil became the country with the biggest live and virtual transmission in the world. Of the 10 biggest lives in the world, eight of them are Brazilian. A Brazilian singer gathered at the same time three and a half million Brazilian on YouTube at the same time. Last week, a Brazilian congressman did the biggest live on Facebook. Brazilian communicates through lives more than any other place in the world. As soon as we realized the explosion of lives in Brazil, even use it in education, we asked ourselves a key question. How is the participation of persons with disabilities? How can persons with disabilities be informed and communicate if there is no accessibility on lives? How can persons with disabilities know how to prevent coronavirus if even the World Health Organization communication is not accessible? That was a moment that we felt lost, but we realized it, that it was our task to seek solutions. So we decided to do our first live, and we chose to do it on Facebook. The theme would be mental health, and we would offer the three accessible features used on audiovisual content, sign language, subtitles, and audio description but we got completely surprised. How, uh, how are we going to include the sign language interpreters window in the Facebook stream? How can we insert subtitles live produced by a company that we trust and not the automatic subtitles? And how we can do audio description on a second audio channel? Our fright was that Facebook does not offer any of these tools so users can insert the accessible features. And we take more scares. No other platforms of lives offers these features. It was then 
when we decided to look for a method so that our lives could be accessible and even more that any person or organization in the world could also make their lives accessible too. That's how the Inclusive Hyperconnection project came out. The project is not a platform, a software or a product. That, and that is, that is why exactly we consider it so relevant. It is a solution that brings together platforms and softwares that are for free or very cheap and that combined and allows everyone to make a life with accessibility. An important point to understand the project is that it's not a product. We don't want to sell our solution. We want to teach, to share, and to encourage people to use the solution. So finally, let's go to the solution. The first, the first steps to choose the online meeting platform. We mainly use Zoom, but any other platform can be used. And how do we solve, and how do we solve each of the three accessible features? The sign language interpreter must be one of the participants of the online meetings. When there are two interpreters, the two ones must always be on the meeting, okay? For captioning, you need a person or a company that do it in live captioning. There's a, this is a job that can be more expensive, but it's fundamental. To date, we still don't fully rely on automatic captions. They don't say, for example, who's, who the person that is talking. This, the third accessible, accessible feature, that is audio description, has been the most challenging for us. From what I see, it is the least used because people don't know how to implement it. It is a feature that needs a second audio channel. For example, if I move my hands like this, he or she needs to describe for blind persons. It, this is equity in communication. For the second audio channel, here in Brazil, we use a tool called Bplay. But you guys can use it, for example, Zoom translation tool. Instead of using this feature for Portuguese to English translator, for example, it is possible to use these mechanisms to the audio description. And how we organize all these resources in a live on Facebook, on YouTube, or for example, in an online class. For this, we use online broadcast programs. Our favorite is OBS Studio, it is a for free software but there are other pro pro programs or softwares with the same function it brings it all together and allows one minute please thank you okay okay um like everything we do in terms of accessibility it is important to take special cares for example it is very important for speakers to be well in places because of people with low vision and other things. And how we implemented these actions in practice. We have had six lives like this to date. We had 600 people at the same time on our lives and with a lot of things, mental health, work, basic income benefits, education. We did a live to teach how to make accessible lives. And my favorite one, a fully accessible life for children, bringing together children with and without disability. It was amazing. Our next steps, first one, a tutorial on how to do accessible lives in many languages. We will do the first virtual theater show with total accessibility this month, it will be on September 19th, that is the National Day of Accessible Theater in Brazil. We believe this is the first virtual theater accessible in the world. 
and we want to put pressure on social media platform. Well, this is a long way and a fight for everyone because we believe that uh, everyone should have the right to do your meetings, your lives, or your online transmission with uh, total accessibility, okay? So right. thank you very much. Thank you, thank you, Pedro. Um, uh, very, very interesting, and I know, and I've been following for years, the amazing job your organization uh, is doing, um, and I have no doubt that there will be corporations between our organizations, because it's definitely there. Uh, so thank you very much. And again, Claudia, thank you. Um, uh, I know about your involvement and your uh, um, uh, contributions there. So, so thank you very much. Um, and uh, in order to make short timing, uh, Yuval, I'm turning to you. You are already introduced. So please, uh, uh, your presentation on preparing your accessible lesson. Tactical, go for it. You're on mute, Yuval. I'm just sharing the presentation. Can you see? Yes, we can. Just make it a screen of the uh, yeah. screen. Okay. Yes. Okay. Okay, so uh, thank you again. Um, I will uh, use my quick time about a specific guide that we have made, a, a, a very practical guide, a very basic one, the one that is more detailed, but we'll show the basic one on actually aiming to teaching and helping teachers to be successful in making a actual lesson accessible, inclusive, and when they uh, engaging this, uh, this task. So um, as, you all, as we all know, uh, we, we started a few months ago uh, dealing with this COVID-19 and uh, many, many countries like in Israel immediately changes the way of teaching to remote learning and starting understand and dealing with all the challenges. And in coming to this uh, present uh, uh, school year, we are uh, calling it and hearing learning or even teaching, which is both a couple of days the kids are coming to school and the other days are being teaching uh, taught remotely. And I'm gonna focus on the uh, remote part. And you know, when you do remote learning, you have to understand that the basics is to have technologies. You have to make sure you have, a, you are teaching digital orientation for both <clears throat> the teachers and the students, and sometimes to other staffs and the parents, you have to make sure your materials for the kids, for, the, for your students are accessible. And of course you have to learn how to run through an accessible uh, class or accessible lesson. And this is again what I'm gonna emphasize on that. Uh, the must do's in order to succeed in this uh, very new mission is, first of all, my first thing is saying, always saying, know and learn the disabilities of your students from your class and their accessibility needs. It's very important that you know, each teacher have his unique and his students, make sure you know them and understand their disabilities and accessibility. The ministries of the, of the education are choosing for you the, the best remote teaching, teaching technologies. And as we saw, we saw uh, various technologies with various abilities. In any, in any way, whatever they choose for you, you have to be a professional one and learn how to use it. 
You can't skip this stage. You have to learn deeply all the features of the uh, technology itself and specifically learn the accessibility features. It's a different thing learning how to uh, uh, manual Google or Microsoft, and it's a, a different thing manualing the accessibility features. So be professional about it. Sorry. Also produce accessible materials. You have to learn how to make your materials accessible. We heard about New York City that they're teaching all their staff and teachers. You have to learn it. Now, no other way, you can't pass it around. You have to engage it, learn it. The basics are simple. And then learn how to teach and in an inclusive class. Again, this is my emphasis in this lecture. Also make sure you have a good home technologies. Without good technologies, you cannot, you wouldn't, you wouldn't be able to run the class, the kid wouldn't be able to hear you and it will be a disaster. So make sure your home technologies are good enough. Teach the kids with disabilities the accessibility of the remote technology that you are using. It's not enough that you know, you have to teach your students about uh, uh, what they have to know in order to make the most out of the technology that you are using. And lastly, raise accessibility and inclusive awareness to all the students in the class because it's a big challenge, not only for you as a teacher and for your kids in the class, with, that are with disabilities, the way to success, if you all partner around this, and in order to do that, you have to make sure uh, you are uh, making awareness and everyone is on board for this mission. So now this is the teacher's guide. It's the 24 steps that you have to uh, uh, do in order to succeed. Of course, this is the basic guide. We have a more uh, comprehensive one, but for the 10 minutes that I have, we go only on this one. So new challenge, you have to study it. No other shortcuts. Experience yourself, the disabilities, so you'll know how it feels. You know, wear headsets, put, cover your eyes, and participate in another teacher's class and feel what it means to be a kid with a disability that now with either a kind of the disability. It will be very effective for you to later know, to later, uh, to later know and be a better teacher understanding your students. Meet your students that need accessibility and decide together. I emphasize the word together which adjustments, which accessibility needs uh, they need. Be sure to have a quiet, noise-free teaching environment for those with hearing disabilities. It's very important you teach from home, make sure your room and your environment is ready. Be sure to have a solid background for those with visual disabilities, solid background in contrast color, colors, relative to the lecture and is closing. Be sure to have a high quality camera, camera, microphone and speakers. Again, it's very important. Adjust the mouse cursor size and choose contrasting colors which sticks out. Again, see if I use my cursors, it's important, if I use a regular cursor, you wouldn't be able to see it. Note, avoid a microphone that hides your lips and face. People with hearing disabilities read lips. Nine, before class, prepare and deliver presentations and materials in an accessible format to your students according to their disabilities. Remember, each accessibility format is relevant to each disability. Make sure you have the right accessibility to your, to your 
according to your kids in your class. When your automatic closed captioning is not good enough, like in Hebrew, make sure to coordinate manual CC closed captioning in advance. When sign language interpretation is needed, coordinate in advance. Try to look directly at the camera all the time for those with hearing disabilities who read lips. Be sure to speak at a normal pace, not too quick, to help the closed captioning translator and sign language interpreter. Tell students to stay in a muted state until they have something to say or ask in order to reduce background noise. Keep in mind that as an administrator, as a teacher, in setting you can control muting everyone or individuals. Set class management rules. We don't speak together. When you don't talk, mute mode, be on mute mode. Use chat for questions and remarks. The camera must be always active. Clearly repeat any question asked by each student during class before you reply. It's important to mention the name of the student asking questions for those with visual disabilities. During the lecture, describe in words the writing on the board or presentation or any picture to make it accessible, to make it accessible for those who, with visual disabilities. When giving a lecture, if there audio included, be sure to share and describe what is heard in writing for those with hearing disabilities in class. Writing on the whiteboard, write in dark color and large letters, write bold. Be sure to read what you write for those with visual disabilities. Prepare in advance accessible materials, presentation, documents, videos, any materials that you use, and make sure to send it prior to the class to the use of all students and especially for the student, the kid with disabilities. Information generated during the lesson should be accessed, should be accessed and passed after class to all participants. Be sure to include in remote teaching a level of flexibility and fun activities, but make sure it is all done in an accessible and integrated way. And the last point, also plan fun, social, inclusive acti activities that go beyond learning duties. This is just a basic guide for teachers to accessible remote teaching. As I said, we had much more, more comprehensive guides for more advanced teachers that want to deep down their uh, abilities in succeeding in such classes. It's a new challenge for all of us. You must study it. You must be a professional about it. You must know the technologies. You must be a, with knowledge of accessible websites and accessible materials. You must learn new teaching methods for remote learning and especially for remote learning when you have uh, kids with disabilities in your, uh, in your class. And you also must widen your abilities and know about, about assistive, assistive software that is around there helping you uh, run the class and be successful in teaching your subject. In Israel, we are working on various guides, both for teachers and students so we believe very much on the knowledge of the teachers and kids in order to succeed in uh, 
in accessible classes. So finally, I have the message, together, we can make sure that children with disabilities can participate in the educational system during, during COVID-19 in an accessible and inclusive way, leaving no one behind. Thank you very much. Amazing, amazing, amazing. And uh, Yuval, I would really want you to go over the chats while you were speaking, because this was the whole idea of practical um, and really uh, easy to use um, uh, guidelines. Uh, and I, I want to answer so everybody can hear. One, the presentation will be uploaded to the website, as I said. Two, um, um, I was asked privately um, uh, on this and I will say we give lectures, full uh, length lectures on uh, uh, the elaborated guidelines that Yuval mentioned and we'll be more than happy to do it and cooperate with organizations all over the world uh, to give those lectures and then have it translated uh, uh, to your languages. Uh, I think this is the whole idea. Um, and um, um, uh, I think that, that uh, what you gave now is really tools that we can take tomorrow, read it thoroughly, and make our teaching, remote teaching, more accessible. Thank you very much. Um, uh, another uh, thing that came up in the chat is how applicable it is to the workforce. The inclusive workforce, especially during these times and uh, that we're all moving to Zoom meetings, etc. So here I will say that our next webinar in October is going to focus on um, the inclusive workplace during and post COVID-19. So um, uh, again, anybody here with projects, with ideas, with questions, with uh, 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 recommendations for great speakers, um, uh, now is the time, next week is the time because we're going to round up again, an amazing uh, um, uh, gang of speakers from all over the world. Our next speaker is Joel Snyder. He's going to present to us audio description and aid to literacy. Uh, Joan, Joel is a, a, a longtime friend of uh, Access Israel, participated in our conference, and he is internationally known as uh, one of the world's first audio describers, uh, a pioneer in the field. So, Joel, please, thank you. Joel, you have to unmute yourself. We still cannot hear you. Joe? Unfortunately, we cannot hear you. Let's give it another try. Here. Now I think I hear you. Can you talk now? Unfortunately, do you have headphones uh, connected? Nope. Um, Mute, unmute, can you uh, mute him and then unmute him? Maybe it's stuck on the, and now unmute. Let's give it a try, Joel. See? Yuval, can you unmute yourself? Oh, you're unmuted. Joel, unfortunately, we cannot hear you. Oh. Um, and what I suggest is if you can disconnect and connect again, and we will move to our next speaker and then see if we can connect you to the end. And our last, at last or now it's not going to be last, but definitely not least uh, uh, speaker uh, for the day is um, uh, Mr. Rodrigo Hubner Mendes. Mendes. I must say that uh, I met Rodrigo last year. Uh, we were uh, in a panel together at Zero Project. Uh, I heard so much about you before we met and uh, you uh, were exactly as described. It was an inspiration to meet you and I'm very, very excited 
uh, uh, to hear, uh, hear you here in our uh, webinar. And for me, it was great to have you as the closing remarks. Uh, I really want to hear how you, um, uh, uh, what you are doing and really let everybody go out with a bang. So please, Rodrigo, uh, let's hear you. So hello, everyone. It's a great pleasure to be with you. Uh, so I, I would like to say thanks to my friends from Zero Project, Martin Esso and Michael Feinbeck, through whom I had the opportunity to meet uh, Michal uh, at the beginning of the year, as she said, in, in Vienna. So, so thank you, Michal, and all the friends uh, from Access uh, Israel. Uh, it's, it's an honor to participate, and congratulations for, for this relevant initiative. And, and also say hello to my friends in Rio de Janeiro, Claudia and Pedro. Well, uh, I will organize my presentations uh, into two topics. First, I will share some experiences we have been following uh, and I believe can contribute to the field of best practices. And then uh, I will share the results of our research about protocols for inclusive education in pandemic, which we had recently published. So talking about best uh, practice, uh, it is obvious that the challenge of leaving a one behind gains uh, a wider dimension in view of the limitation uh, implicit uh, on the distance learning model in terms of social interaction and in the construction of effective bonds. So simply offering a series of video classes on the internet and expecting that everyone will learn, uh, I think it's, it's the right way to exclude many students. In, in several regions of Brazil, we have seen an exemplary capacity of the educators, leaders, to mobilize the territories. In the city of Sao Paulo, for example, the education secretary promoted an enormous operation. First, they printed uh, activity books designed for the isolation period. Second, they uh, made a huge task force in order to update the students' database, which involved a call for action to all the parents. And third, they sent the books to each student through mail uh, in order to, to guarantee that no one would be excluded. The school principals did a double check contacting each family to ensure that everyone had received the material. In, in some regions, even sound cares were uh, used to engage the families uh, and some teachers had the initiative to, to film the empty classrooms and to send it to the students so that they realize they were not uh, the only ones staying at home, that, uh, that they were not excluded and that they should continue doing the activities asked by the teachers in general by WhatsApp. The, the second example refers to uh, traditional private school in Brazil that has been investing in inclusion over the last years. In this sense, they have a team of nine educators, especially dedicated on supporting the other teachers in terms of identifying barriers and eliminating them. They, they also support the students with disabilities to uh, complementary activities uh, that are planned based on their singularities. Uh, it is very important to mention that those activities do not substitute the activities developed in the mainstream classes, but uh, as I said, they act as a complement. In the case of Jonas, for example, a 12 years uh, old student that has an autism spectrum disorder. Since last year, the teachers have been planning the classes considering the flexibilization 
of some activities. So wh what, does, what, what does that mean for joints? Here, flexibilization means exploring different strategies, different formats of the content, and different dynamics to approach the same curriculum. In this sense, Jonas is allowed to work on the same curriculum through different ways. Right after uh, the school was closed, the teachers migrated all the activities to the remote model. And for students with disabilities like Jonas, they kept that strategy of com complementary support and flexibilization. So when Jonas access the web platform of the school, he can see the activities plan for each day, as well as these alternatives offered by a specific tab created for that flexibilization. At the same, same time, the teachers monitor and evaluate their classes every day. So it is part of this process to maintain frequent dialogue with the students and their families. Remembering that this needs to be done carefully in terms of orienting the parents about how to support their children so that they can build their autonomy. In addition, the remote interaction among the students is also constantly encouraged. So uh, sometimes Jonas and his friends work together in groups. And as a third story, uh, I think it is worth to mention, mention the inspiring initiative of Serra Grande do Norte. It's, it's a tiny city in the rural region uh, in the north of Brazil. The majority of the families in that region do not uh, have access to the internet, so they decided to use the local radio station to allow the continuity of the contact between the teachers and the students. And therefore, they created a program called uh, Education in Quarantine, which is broadcast every day, making the radio rele a relevant technology in the field of education again. Of course, we have a, a huge challenge of how to offer access to the deaf students uh, but even though I think it's uh, an initial uh, idea that needs to be improved. So besides the, the amazing co collaborative work and the capacity to preserve the bonds between the schools and the students illustrated by those actions, I, I would like to highlight the notorious acceleration uh, of the use of technology by the pedagogical team. So, According to a survey published last year, only 14% of schools had distance learning platforms. So I'm talking about last year. 24% of teachers still did not use technology as an education tool. And 79% of teachers were facing difficulties in using technology in learning activities. So I can say that all the experiences that we have been registered during the isolation period show heavy use, heavy use of technology. Uh, the most common resources are, as many colleagues mentioned today, Facebook, Instagram, Google Classroom, and here in Brazil, the most popular tool was the WhatsApp. In fact, it seems that the, the teams have significantly expanded their knowledge and creativity uh, in the use of those tools. Now, uh, I would like to conclude my, my presentation sharing the, the global research that the Rodrigo Mendes Institute produced uh, over the first semester. Uh, regarding protocols, as I said, for inclusive education during the pandemic. The, the study explored three sources of references. Uh, firstly, a network of uh, 50 specialists in inclusive education around the world. 
Secondly, uh, international organization with emphasis on the UN agencies, uh, the World Health Organization and the OECD. And finally, the ministries of education from 23 countries, which were already opening the schools at that time. So the, the survey considered Australia, Austria, Canada, China, Denmark, England, France, Germany, Italy, Japan, Jordan, Norway, New Zealand, Ireland, Portugal, Scotland, Spain, Singapore, South Korea, Taiwan, United States, uh, Uruguay, and Wales. So we ended up finding a lot of material and the research is already available for, uh, for download on our website. Uh, I, I, I just share with you in, in the, the Zoom chat right at the beginning of my, my speech, you can find the link for the download. So due, the, due our time constraints, I will focus uh, on the content related to reopening of schools, uh, which are organizing three axes. Uh, the, the criteria for returning the school to the schools, health issues, and uh, the third, social distance. So talking about the first axis, who can and who cannot return to the classroom? Uh, the research points out that there, were, there was a diversity of positions on this subject. In New Zealand, for example, everyone should return at the same time, while in Denmark and in Singapore, students with disabilities should be uh, the last to leave isolation. Well, uh, the net of experts consulted, uh, and I myself agree, uh, considered that although certain children and teenagers with disabilities belong to the COVID risk groups, the medical report of disability by itself should not be accepted as a justification for those students to be left behind. In other words, it is critical to clarify that there is no automatic correlation between disability and risk. Uh, the decision must be taken based on a case-by-case -case perspective and, and the decision must involve the schools, the medical staffs, the families and the students. And, and if the student uh, with disability need a caregiver, a sign language interpreter or any other professional support, that person should also be considered on the return. Moving to, to the health issues axis, uh, the research presents the main uh, hygiene measures that have been adopted around the world. So uh, in addition to frequent hand washing, procedures for cleaning surfaces, equipments and toys should be introduced. Uh, the same applies to the respiratory etiquette and safe food preparation practices. In this regard, students should not be served directly at the buffets and students with disabilities who have difficulties or, or are unable to clean their hands uh, need to get support. In addition, wheelchairs, canes, implants and other equipment should be on the list of items that undergo uh, hygiene procedures. As for the use uh, of masks, these... One minute, uh, one minute uh, please. <laughs> Rodrigo, thank you. Okay. Uh, so, so, considering masks, it is important that the, uh, this, this equipment, equipment harms the socialization of students with hearing impairments. Uh, either those who practice lip reading or those who communicate using sign language. Uh, in such cases, a possible solution is to adopt the use of transparent masks preferable throughout the school. So just to finish, Mihal, my, my, 
my participation, uh, I would like to uh, reinforce that it is very important for those who are planning public policies regarding the uh, reopening of, of schools to, uh, to keep this right uh, in mind. Students with disability, disabilities should have the same opportunity to go back to school and uh, to continue their development. And we should not accept any kind of discrimin discrimination. This is a very uh, important moment. And uh, we, we don't want to subestimate the profound challenges that, that the COVID created, but it's, it is our job uh, to talk to the pub public managers and to uh, uh, work together so that when it is safe, it is safe for everyone. So thank you, Michal. Thank you, thank you, Rodrigo. And, 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 and because I was so excited to move on to the next uh, speaker, I, I, I uh, forgot to give the whole uh, uh, description of, uh, of what you do and, and where you're from. Uh, but uh, I know from the chat that people already got into your uh, website. Um, and, and what I neglected to mention is um, uh, Rodrigo is the founder and CEO of the Rodrigo Mendes uh, Institute. Um, uh, from Brazil, and he has a lot of credits and a lot of amazing uh, uh, things in his background. Uh, I was uh, uh, astonished when I heard that he is the first uh, uh, person um, um, sitting in a wheelchair and he uh, drove a race car using his mind. Now that is very uh, uh, intriguing and I really urge you to look him up um, uh, and, uh, and hear about it. But as we heard now, what you're doing is so much bigger and, and, and amazing. And I'm very happy to be in contact with you and uh, look to the future and do great things together. So Rodrigo, thank you very, very much. And uh, people were uh, asking in the, in the um, uh, chat, uh, yes, we are looking for speakers for the next webinar. Uh, the next webinar is going to be about uh, employment and the one after that about tourism and higher education. And we are looking always for great uh, partners from uh, everywhere else. Um, uh, Joe, we'll give it another try. And, uh, and uh, <laughs> can you hear me? Yes. Can you, oh, good. Can you see the screen? Yes, we can. Wonderful. That's where I'll begin. Making it accessible. <laughs> yes, to, yes. Uh, thank you, Nicole making it accessible to people who are blind or have no vision. Audio Description Associates, LLC, the Visual Made Verbal presents Audio Description and Aid to Literacy. Joel Snyder, PhD, President, Audio Description no, Associates. No, I'm afraid um, you're with echo and it's not... It's oh, not, no. Yeah, yeah, it's difficult to hear. One last try. And if not, I promise it's we'll better. have you for the next time. Is that better? Is that better? Is that better? Is that better? All right, good. I was reading the text on the screen there. Uh, I introduced myself. Access Israel 2020, Tuesday, September 8th, 2020, 1655, 1705 GMT. And at the bottom, the audio American audio description symbol. The logo there, a white square within which are two letters in bold black type, an A and a D. The left side of that A is tilted just a bit to the right, and to the right of the curve in the D, three curved lines, period. Why do I say that? Because most beginning describers will go on and say they represent sound waves. Well, true enough, but there's nothing there on the screen that says that to sighted people. Why would you say that to an audience of people who are blind? Uh, at best, it's unnecessary. At worst, it could seem condescending. Uh, or patronizing even. So going on, audio description is principally an access technique, as so many of you know, designed for the benefit of folks, all folks, all people, including children who are blind or have low vision. I think of it as a literary art form. It provides a verbal version of the visual. The visual is made verbal and aural, A-U-R-A-L, he points to his ear, and oral, O-R-A-L, he points to his mouth. 
using words that are succinct, vivid, and imaginative to convey the visual image that is not accessible, not fully accessible, to a segment of the population. The American Foundation for the Blind says there are over 26 million Americans alone who are either blind or have trouble seeing even with correction. And of course, the visual image is not fully realized by the rest of us, right? The rest of us sighted folks who see but don't really observe. And you know about sighted folks like me, right? Uh, we are light dependent, right? Who's disabled? Anyway, we translate images, visual images into words, objective, vivid, specific, and imaginatively drawn words and phrases. For instance, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to see if you can, uh, hopefully you'll have access to this next image here. Uh, there we go. There you are, the Washington Monument. The Washington Monument here in Washington, D.C., where I am. Is it 555 feet tall? Or is it as high as 50 elements, elephants, stacked one on top of the other? Well, both, of course. But which characterization conjures the most vivid mental image? Uh, for instance, how many different words can you use to describe somebody walking, someone moving along a sidewalk? Yes, why say walk when you can more evocatively describe the action with sachet, stroll, skip, stumble, ston saunter, march, whatever. And good describers strive for simplicity, succinctness. Less is more. You know, in writing to a, a friend, the 17th century philosopher Blaise Pascal wrote, noted, he said, I've only made this letter longer because I've not had the time to make it shorter. We have to take time to come up with the right words. At the same time, a describer has to use language that helps folks see vividly. Uh, Jonathan Swift said, he said, vision is the art of seeing things invisible. There are no elephants there right? Mark Twain said it even better. He said, you can't depend on your eyes when your imagination is out of focus. So using words, we all deal with that. And children or people with learning disabilities have particular needs that might be addressed effectively through description. I once did a workshop with a group of daycare teachers and children on what I think represents a relatively new application for description, literacy, we experimented with developing more descriptive language to use when working with kids and picture books. Think of it, picture books, they rely on the pictures to tell the story. But the teacher who's trained in audio description technique would never simply hold up a picture of a red ball and read the text, see the ball. No, I think he or she might add, that ball's red, just like a fire engine. Yeah, that ball is as large as one of you. It's as round as the sun, a bright red circle or sphere. Well, what's the teacher done now? Introduced new vocabulary, invited comparisons, and used a simile with toddlers. So audio description, obviously you make the book accessible to children who have low vision or are blind, and you, but you help develop more sophisticated literary skills, language skills for all kids. So, you know, a picture's worth a thousand words, right? Well, a describer might say that a few well-chosen words conjure vivid and lasting images. You know, for, for six years, I led a team of describers who provided the description for the American television show, it was mentioned earlier, Sesame Street. Um, so let me share a brief excerpt of what we did with a Sesame Street episode with audio description. Elmo stands beside Dorothy's fishbowl. Hi, this is Elmo's world. Oh, Elmo's so very happy to see you. Oh, and so is Dorothy. Say hello, Dorothy. An orange goldfish. <laughs> oh, guess what Elmo's thinking about today? <laughs> Elmo glances around himself. Hear that? Yeah. Elmo dances to a purple door and opens it. Outside, people and puppets sit on steps on Sesame Street. <laughs> The doorway stretches wide. Oh, thank you. The people and puppets wave at Elmo. Elmo turns around. Oh, Sesame Street! 
Oscar pops up. Hey, get lost. <laughs> Oscar. You know Sesame Street. Elmo and the others dance. <laughs> now a bird puppet flies over Sesame Street. Alan dances with a broom. A man in ballet tights jumps up and down with letters. People and puppets bounce. Four cartoon baby dragons appear. A man dressed in a big letter M dances on a beach. A bat puppet follows the count. Maria kisses Luis on the cheek. A blonde woman plays piano. A cartoon orange wears sunglasses. Grover the waiter drops dishes. Big Bird plays with children. Rosita dances with sheep puppets. A boy wears a red mask and yellow cape. Alpha Boy. Bird struts. Cartoon men dance. A bearded man dances with a cane. A woman plays guitar. Ernie holds a banana in his ear. Telly does an Egyptian dance. A woman claps while puppets sway. Zoe dances with a boy and girl. A man sits at a piano and squeezes a rubber ducky. A man plays an electric guitar. Gordon waves from a window. Cookie Monster hugs a doll. Now Dorothy swims by a small green lamppost in her bowl. A sign, Sesame Street. Look, Dorothy's been thinking about Sesame Street, too. <laughs> oh, I don't want to do that again. <laughs> and, and to illustrate, further illustrate how description can nurture literacy, I'm going to play just a little bit of an excerpt from the feature film, The Color of Paradise. Uh, because I, okay, okay. Well, I'll tell you, just to give you a taste of it, just a no quick taste. No problem. Uh, here it is. And, uh, and then I'll give you some notes real quickly and we'll end. Oh, no, no, no. There we go. Here we go. Muhammad kneels and taps his hands through the thick round cover of brown curled leaves. A scrawny nestling struggles on the ground near Muhammad's hand. His palm hovers above the baby bird. He lays his hand lightly over the tiny creature. Smiling, Muhammad curls his fingers around the chick and scoops it into his hands. He stands. There you go, a blind boy. And just quickly, a couple of notes about the description. You didn't get to hear the whole two and a half minutes. Color. Color has been shown to be important to people with low vision, even people who are congenitally blind. Timing is critical in description because we weave the descriptive language around the film's sound elements. Vivid verbs, he scoops the bird. He doesn't just pick it up, you know? Description is written to be heard, you know? So we talk about he taps, he tips, he, that kind of thing. Alliteration adds variety and helps to maintain interest. What to include? Uh, well, this bird flies by, you can't include everything, but that's important because the bird returns in the next scene. Be specific, it's his index finger, not his pinky, you know, and similes paint pictures. He wig wiggles his finger like a worm, even though the worm's not there. So um, just to end, I want you to be aware of uh, two websites, uh, the Audio Description Project of the American Council of the Blind that I direct, and found at acb.org slash ADP, all kinds of information there. And in America, we're fortunate to have the described and captioned media program where they're funded to provide description and captions for just about every educational media that's shown in a school. So I'll end there. Uh, and I've got my contact information, my website and uh, uh, email address, jsnyder at audiodescribe.com. Thank you so much. Perfect. And of course, you will upload your information and presentation yes. to our website so people can see it again. Absolutely. And I tell you, uh, ending with uh, Elmo, <laughs> that's a blast. Um, uh, I, I am just um, thinking. Michal, probably yes. one telephone is on because they have a big echo coming from you. It's from Joel. Joel, put on mute. Thank you. I think it's okay now. Okay, um, um, uh, again, because I'm thinking of our dear, dear Richard, I will stop here. I, I just want to ask one thing from you. If everybody can just put yourself on video, whoever can, raise your hands like this, and let's give a round of applause to everyone.
And that would be a great picture for the Facebook to show, share, everybody like this. And Shalini, you're taking care of the picture? Perfect. And you know what, whoever cannot raise their hands, because we are inclusive here, do something with your head or smile. Big smile will be just as welcome. Um, and, and guys, really, it was amazing. Uh, thank you for everybody. Remember, for your newbies, uh, if Mundo uh, um, just joined us, and Mundo, you want the, the picture with the hands? You're joining in or you're, you're zooming out? Well, he's off. So, guys, um, uh, we will send your information about the web next, next webinar. Please fill up the survey so we can always get better and better. And really, thank you again for everyone. And I'm looking forward to seeing you all in October. Bye-bye, guys. And thank you, Richard, again. Bye. Thank you. Great job. Great job. Bravo, bravo. Bye-bye. Thank you all. It was wonderful. Excellent. Great. Brilliant. My favorite part, by the way. Great job, Dan. Great job. Thank you. Great job. Thank you. Thank you. That was a great job. Good to see you. Take care. Great job. Thank Great you, job. Access Israel. Thank you. Thank you, Access Israel. Thank Great you. Bye-bye. Bye. 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 Thank you. From the Caribbean, Nevis Island, West Indies. Thank you. Thank you for my shirt. Thank you for my shirt. Yeah. 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 Great shirt. <laughs> Thank you from Ghana. Thank you for being here. You too. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Miko um, Ramen, for this opportunity Thank to be on this Thank you from the Bahamas. Thank you very much, guys. I really appreciate Thank it. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, bye bye. God bless everyone. Thank you. Leave for Leave. Thank you, Yuval and Michal again, as always. Thank you amazing. For, thank you for amazing, Richard. Amazing. <laughs> Please, a massage. That's what he deserves. Yes, he does. Oh, my God. Oh, my God. You are spectacular. He, he is an amazing interpreter. We're, we're just so fortunate. And he, um, Richard, I'm talking for you. You could probably talk now if you wanted to. But <laughs> he so enjoys doing this. And as you can see, he's got the flag behind Absolutely. him. He was yep. very well uh, prepared. I saw that. Again, <laughs> again. Thank you. Yes, I see the yarmulke, the, the flag. Yep. Guys, He's on point. So much. And Jamie, bye-bye. And Our I'll pleasure. See you in October, guys. Thank you very much. Yes. Good. Richard, you can train me for my next marathon. Five hours? Wow. Oh. Amazing. Bye-bye, guys. Goodbye. Shalom.